When I was 16, I would sneak out of the house at night to get high and read a book. There was an empty foreclosed home next door, and I would get inside via a basement window. I'd smoke in that basement's bar area. One night, it was raining pretty heavily, and I'd forgotten to bring my lighter. I went to get it, and it was still pouring when I got back. I set up a comfy place at the bar and turned on my camping lamp that I kept there. I started hearing these weird noises upstairs, though. I turned off the light and sat still for a moment to listen in a bit closer. That's when I realized the sound was not coming from upstairs. It was actually coming from a doorless room right next to me. I grabbed everything I could and made for the window. With half my body through, I heard someone running and shouting behind me. I felt someone grab my foot from behind just as I managed to crawl outside. I got out of their grip and ran to my house, where I snuck in as quietly as possible. I heard sirens soon after I made it into my house, worried it was law enforcement that had caught me in the home. The sirens went on for a while into the night, and I could barely sleep at all. I learned the next morning that someone on the next block over had burned their mother's home down with her in it. He had been found breaking into a home later that night that was occupied, several doors past the house I had been in. It was likely that was him in the basement with me trying to hide, and he switched spots after I got away. I still get scared whenever I think about it. Growing up, my parents added on to our house, and this left my bedroom as the only one upstairs. My sister and I had a shared room at one point, and are still to this day extraordinarily close. It wasn't uncommon for her to just wander into my room and sleep in my bed in the middle of the night, or vice versa. I woke up in the middle of the night one time to see a hand scrambling around between the edge of my bed and the wall. I immediately assumed that my sister had slept in my bed and fallen off the edge or something, then grasped the side of the bed and was reaching out like that to try and grab something desperately in a blind panic. Thinking my sister might need help, I looked over the edge of the bed, but I didn't see anything on the floor. I scurried down the stairs and slept in my sister's room that night, where I found she was sleeping peacefully. There was no further incident. When I went to look under my bed the next day, I didn't find anything either. When I was in college, I made some money by modeling. Sometimes, I would just let photography students take pictures of me for practice. Other times, I'd work with professionals on fetish shoots. One day, I saw an ad on Craigslist. Standard, creepy Craigslist deal. Amateur male photographer seeking woman willing to pose nude for him to practice his art. And also add to his private collection. It was summer and my jobs on campus had dwindled down to nearly nothing. I needed money really bad, so I replied to this very sketchy ad. The guy wanted me to take a bus to the big city, several hours away from the small town where I went to college. Then I would meet him at his studio, and I would be paid $200 to model for him. He said I could bring a male friend for safety if I wanted. He was not expecting anything more than modeling. He promised it would be okay. He was a normal man in his 40s with a professional job as a doctor, and he just wanted more practice at his hobby. I was desperate to make rent, so I said sure. We set a day. The day of, he emails me to make sure I'm coming alone. I said no, I'm bringing my friend as we'd previously agreed. At this point, the emails started getting a bit weird. I got this feeling in the pit of my stomach that things were not all okay with this guy. I stopped replying to the emails and obviously did not go to the gig. Life went on as usual. Two years later, I'm living in another state, 
but just so happened to see a news story on Facebook. It was about the trial of a professional man, a doctor in his 40s, who was on trial in the big city for murdering a woman who had answered his ad for a nude model. He'd murdered her in quite a horrible way based on the details from the news story. I'm certain it was that exact same ad I had seen. The same man I had emailed for the gig I had almost taken. That murdered girl was almost me. My mother's family lived on the second floor of a larger duplex. The front doors to the second floor apartments were located on the side of the buildings and faced each other from one duplex to the other. They rarely locked the front door and everyone knew their neighbors quite well. One morning, one of my uncles, who must have been about 13 at the time, says he woke up very early. This was summertime, and although it was kind of light out, the sun hadn't actually risen yet. It was still practically in the middle of the night. He was half awake in his bed, and a bit groggy, when he realized what had awoken him. It was the sound of someone creeping along the corridor. For some reason, something didn't feel right to him. It didn't sound like someone from the family was going to the bathroom during the night. It was much slower and careful. He called out, Hey, who's there? He then heard whoever was in the corridor walk back to the top of the stairs, down the other side, and then out the front door. That's creepy enough in my opinion, but it gets much worse. Within six months of this event happening, a teenage girl was found dead in the duplex next door to my family's home. She had been killed in the middle of the night with a hammer by a 15-year-old boy that lived nearby. He was known by all the other kids of the neighborhood, and my mother remembers him as being very quiet and always kind of looking down or away whenever you would look at him. He was kind of an outcast, certainly because of his personality, but also perhaps a bit because he went to a posh school thanks to his father being the janitor there. He was a bit of a snob to the other kids in the duplex where my family lived. On the first floor, there was a family with three teenage girls. In my family, there were two teenage girls. I guess he knew what he was looking for, because he had been lurking around for a good while, deciding which one of us he wanted to take out with his hammer. After he was caught, he killed himself while in the hospital. He was still a very young man. When my friend was about 11 or 12 years old, she went to an all-inclusive resort with her family. This was one of those big places with several pools, restaurants, kids' areas, etc. Her dad bought her walkie-talkies, one for her, one for her brother, and one for the adults. This was before cell phones were a big thing so they wanted to be able to stay in touch just in case the kids wanted to go off and do their own thing or something. One night, her parents and her brother go down to the restaurant for dinner. My friend wasn't feeling very well, though, so she asked to stay back in the hotel room and watch a movie on her own. They agreed and gave her the walkie-talkie for emergencies. She was up there for about an hour or so, checking in periodically with her dad, just to say hello or ask what they were doing or whatever. She started to feel really sick at one point, though, and asked her dad, Hey, when do you think you'll be back to the room? Her dad answered back, We're coming up right now, sweetie. I forgot the room number. Could you tell me what it is again? As soon as she was about to answer, her dad's voice cut in. Hey, we're coming back up right now. We got you some cake because you weren't feeling good. We'll see you in about five minutes. She knew that the second voice was her dad. She locked the door until her parents got back, and when they did, they said they hadn't talked to her on the walkie-talkie all night long.
So back sometime in January of 2013, I was up late suffering from insomnia and watching Moonrise Kingdom. I live in Canada, and this particular night, the temperature was holding steady in the single digits. It was probably around two or three degrees out. The roads were like sheets of ice. The only thing I had to eat in my home were oyster crackers and ketchup, so I decided to pause the movie for a while, bundle myself up tight, and brave the frigid wastelands outside to go and grab some snacks from the mini-mart a few miles away. After putting on several layers of clothing, I stepped outside and locked the door to my townhouse behind me. I walked over to my car. It was so cold out, it was actually kind of hard to breathe. For a moment, I reconsidered going at all, but my hunger overpowered my discomfort. I chiseled the ice off my windshield and climbed inside my car. I put the key in the ignition and started the car. I also immediately turned on the heater, but not the headlights just yet. As I was waiting in the inside for the car to warm up, I noticed a red cavalier drive past me down the street and pull into the driveway of the townhouse that was just around the corner from my own. Not having much to occupy my time as the car slowly heated up, I watched as three people exited the cavalier. My heart immediately began to race as I noticed that one of the people in this car had his hands tied behind him. The man who had been in the back seat with this bound man immediately smacked him with what looked like a tire iron, and the defenseless man collapsed into the snow. The tire iron man kept beating him, striking at his legs and back. I could see red patches of blood starting to stain the snow around the fallen man. For some context, this was sometime after midnight, so there was no traffic or anyone else around outside. The only light illuminating the street was coming from about three or four surrounding street lights. I didn't recognize any of the men, but I could faintly hear them shouting at each other. I couldn't catch their exact words, though. The man who had been in the driver's seat came around the side of the car and pulled out a handgun from his jacket. I remember actually shouting, Oh, fuck! before clamping my hands over my mouth. I was convinced I was about to witness a murder here, and I was terrified. There was no sense of excitement or grim fascination. This was not a movie. This was a violent, unscripted reality. I was suddenly feeling very traumatized. I hadn't set out tonight wanting to be a witness for what was possibly about to be a murder. My car was on and running, but so was theirs, which was probably why they hadn't noticed me. I didn't dare to try and sprint back inside, but I also didn't want to try my luck driving down the icy street, where they could have easily chased after me if they chose to. The driver bent down and put his gun to the head of the bleeding man. He remained in that position for a while. I assumed he must have been saying something to him. I began to let myself breathe easier, daring to hope they were just going to get back into the car and drive away without killing the man. Then I could call him an ambulance. I had my cell phone in my pocket. Now, you might be asking, if I had a phone, why wasn't I calling the cops right now? This is Canada, and the cops don't give a shit. I also didn't want to risk making any noise, or giving my position away with the light of my phone screen. You may think this was cowardly of me, and maybe it was, but until you've been in a situation when there's a guy with a gun 50 yards away from you, I'd say you've got no right to judge me. Anyway, this whole time, the guy with the tire iron had just been standing there. No hat, no gloves, and in the freezing cold, staring down at the bleeding man. Well, my car's engine suddenly stuttered. He glanced up and looked right toward me. I swear I felt my heart stop for a moment. He just stared in my direction. I froze like a deer in the headlights, praying he wouldn't see me. I'm a pretty scrawny guy and wouldn't have had a chance of defending myself against this dude, even without him having a weapon. Suddenly, he began to make his way across the street towards me. Maybe he'd noticed the cloud of exhaust coming from my car 
or he was just trying to get a better look. Either way, my fight or flight mode kicked in. I wasn't going to wait for this guy to get closer. I killed the engine, leapt out of my car without even shutting the door, and sprinted as fast as I could toward my front door across the icy driveway. I heard the guy yell behind me, Hey, you! I was convinced that at any moment I would hear a gunshot, then suddenly I would hit the ground and bleed out, with the lights starting to fade. But thank God that never happened. I reached the front door and frantically stuffed my keys into the lock. As I turned the knob, I heard the tire iron guy curse and hit the ground. I guess he had slipped onto the ice. I didn't turn around to find out, though. Once inside, I slammed the door and locked it. I immediately barricaded myself in the guest room, which only had one small window facing the backyard. I left all the lights off and laid down on the ground next to the bed. My heart was racing, breathing heavily, expecting at any moment to hear pounding from the front door. But it never came. I lay there cowering for what felt like 20 minutes when I heard footsteps out in the hallway. I clamped my hands over my mouth to muffle my breathing and strain my ears for any sound outside the bedroom door. I'd never heard the front door open, but the soft, steady thudding of heavy feet coming down the carpeted hallway was very clear that someone was there. I told myself that as soon as I heard the doorknob jiggle, I was calling the cops on my cell phone and telling them my house was on fire. That would get them there real quick. After a moment, though, I thought I heard the footsteps in the living room. Then, nothing at all. I was convinced the intruder was hiding somewhere in my own home, waiting for me to emerge so they could pounce on me. That was the absolute longest night of my life. I waited wide awake and terrified, convinced I was going to die. When the sun eventually came up, I found the courage to leave the bedroom. I picked up an empty wine bottle to defend myself as I walked down the hall. I carefully peeked outside. There were two police cars parked outside my neighbor's yard, and the Cavalier was gone. I didn't recall hearing any gunshots. I walked into my kitchen and took a look around. That's when I noticed my back door was unlocked. My heart sank as I noticed one word had been carved into my wooden table. Quiet. About an hour later, the cops knocked on my front door and informed me there had been an assault last night. My neighbor was in the hospital. They asked me if I had seen anything. I lied and said I had passed out at midnight watching movies and had just woken up right now. That might have been a crappy thing to do, but I didn't want to have my name be involved. Whoever these men had been, they were unstable and dangerous and knew where I lived. I didn't want to have to be dragged into court to testify against them. The police asked me if I knew my car door was slightly open. I said no. I simply shrugged and stated I might have forgotten to slam it shut earlier in the day. They seemed to buy that and left without any further questions. I threw out that table and got a new one and have since put a new security system in place. I'm not particularly proud of how I acted that night. But I have no particular regrets either. Had I tried to be a hero, I might have been killed. So call me a coward if you want. At least I'm still alive. I never made another attempt to go on a late night snack run ever since though. I think this story will be improved by context about the setting and such. So, here we go. First, the story took place after I graduated high school and moved away from my family. I moved up to Alaska again. I say again because I lived there once before for a short while while I was attending college there. Second, and very conveniently, my mother had been renting out our old house instead of selling it. I say conveniently because the long-standing residents had moved away and therefore I was awarded the old house. I had to work quite a bit to keep up the payments, but my mother pitched in, thankfully. At the beginning of this story, I should make you aware that I had recently broke up with a girl 
who had been staying with me in that old house. I was renting to my mother and this breakup was unclean and dysfunctional, much like the relationship itself was. Finally, the story begins. It was winter break, which meant I would be spending much more time inside than I normally would. It was feeling somewhat lonely in this house all alone, without my girlfriend around any longer. There were also no neighbors to really speak of, as the house was in an extremely wooded region. It was a few miles out of town. One late afternoon, soon after I'd thought the whole breakup fiasco had come to a close, I was made quite aware that it wasn't done just yet. My cell phone began ringing non-stop, and I saw that it was coming from an unknown number. Cliché, I know. I decided to pick up and see what was going on. It was of course my ex. She began telling me about how great her new boyfriend was and how horrible I am. The sort of talk you can just smell the booze off the caller's breath from miles away. I actually listened, though, until she decided to hand the phone over to her boyfriend. He was, of course, very threatening to me. I decided to hang up in the most politeful manner possible, with a, fuck you, have a nice day. Days later, my mind began to forget about this incident. It had most certainly just been a drunken phone call. We all do that every now and again, so whatever. I'm lying there in the living room, watching some TV. While laying there, though, I noticed something quite unsettling out of the corner of my eye. As I observed closer, I could see a person standing in the window behind me. You may ask me how I noticed this. Well, I could see his reflection from the TV screen. I didn't move an inch, though. I had no weapons to defend myself. I had no guns, no knife. I had nothing but my wit and my fists, so I just lied there watching this reflection, pretending I hadn't noticed. Eventually, it did move away from the window. Normally, that wouldn't spook me too much, but taking into account that this house was nowhere near any others, that was a big red flag. If someone was just wanting to talk to me, why wouldn't they knock on the door? For some reason, I was almost certain it was that new boyfriend. Nothing came of the situation that night, though. Unfortunately for me, similar situations continued to occur from then on, though. A car pulling into the driveway, no one getting out, and then leaving after idling there for a while. It was conspicuous and quite worrisome. I didn't suspect a true threat, though, until a few days later. I was lying in bed, and it was very late at night. I was getting ready to fall asleep when I get another call from an unknown number. It was her again, but this time she was asking me to come outside. She said she wanted to give me an apology. At the time, I was thinking I should just tell her to fuck off. I still decided to go outside, though, and see what the deal was. I opened the door, and it was incredibly dark outside. I say on the phone that I'm outside, and she tells me to come around back. With this, I began to walk on the snow-covered ground in the darkness, with just my boots on. The motion light turned on as I crossed the garage and driveway. The snow masking the ground was tinted yellow by the light. I rounded the corner of my garage and turned my phone to see the road that runs behind my house and connects to the driveway by bending. I made my way towards that road, the snow crunching beneath my boots. As I made my way closer, there was a part in the trees that allowed me to walk straight to the road. Otherwise, no one could make their way around the entirety of the driveway. I reached this part and I asked into the phone, Where are you? I'm in the car. I see you. I stepped onto the road and saw her parked in a car a few dozen feet away from me with the lights dimmed down. So what's the deal here, I asked her. I just want to talk. Come here. I approached the car and made my way around to the passenger side. I saw her face and she waved me in. I got into the car and sat down. She says to me, Look, I'm sorry. I know I've been a real bitch lately. No, it's okay. I wasn't really good to you either. 
I guess I deserve some ribbing. She abruptly stopped speaking, because a pair of car lights shined from behind us. Naturally, I assumed it was her boyfriend, and by the look on her face, she did too. The car parked behind us, and sure enough, the boyfriend gets out and storms over to my side of the car. He yanks the door handle and the door swings open. He attempts to grab me, but I grab his wrist instead and jump out of the car. What do you think you're doing with her, huh? We were just talking, dude, and I was just about to leave. You're trying to fuck her, aren't you? Look, I'm trying to get back and sleep. I'm in no mood to do anything like that, you piece of shit. He gave me this look of utter enragement before swinging at me. He missed, though. A scuffle ensued. Most of what happened, though, was him swearing and slipping and falling before yelling at us both that he'd kill us. I just stood by her car as he pulled away. She gave me a lift back to the house and I invited her inside. It was late in the night and I suggested she lock her car if she was going to stay. We slept upstairs in my bed before I awoke hours later. There was a banging at the back door. I knew this because the back door was directly below my room. She woke up too. I stood up quickly and went to my closet. I reached behind all the coats I never wear and grabbed my Louisville slugger. She was sitting upright in my bed with her hands covering her eyes. I didn't say anything before walking down the stairs, attempting to be silent. The lights were off and there were no windows on the staircase. The pounding on the back door had audibly ceased. I held the bat tightly, making sure not to bang it against anything and accidentally give away my position. I remember just how slowly I was stepping down, especially the bottom three steps which were always the creakiest ones. I reached the final step and I froze. It still gives me chills to this day. The sound of the hardwood floors creaking at the bottom of the staircase. There was also a creaking approaching me that was growing closer and closer. I raised the bat above my head, ready to slam whoever it was right on the top of their dome. The creaking grew ever closer, and I planned to swing as soon as it was in front of me, as the staircase opened to the left from the bottom. I had never listened so carefully, holding my breath. I squeezed my hands tighter than I ever had before around the bat, waiting for whoever this was to emerge from around the corner. The creaking sounds were now directly in front of me. I slammed the bat down hard, and I hit something. Whatever it was crumpled to the floor with a bang and a small flash. I turned on the light, and there he was. The boyfriend had fired his gun directly into the floor and left a hole in the hardwood. My ex came downstairs crying profusely, muttering she was sorry over and over again. I called the police, and four cops pulled into my driveway, along with an ambulance. I sat at the base of the stairs watching the boyfriend. He was still breathing, I could tell that much from his chest slowly inclining and declining off the floor. I grabbed what I thought was a 9mm off the floor and kept it in my hand, with the safety turned on. I just shook my head over and over in utter disbelief. I explained the situation to the police as the paramedics rushed in and carried him out on a stretcher. All in all, I didn't get much sleep until late into the afternoon, after everything was done and over with. The man ended up going into a coma, but eventually he did recover. A restraining order had already been filed in advance. My ex and I became good friends after the incident, and she never dated that guy again. I never ended up moving out, though. I had considered it, but nothing like that has happened ever since, and I don't really expect it to happen again either. So, there you have it. When my friend and I were maybe 10 years old or so, we were walking from my house to her house. A five minute walk at most. To get there, we could either go around the long way, or we could cut through a schoolyard. The school, which had been rebuilt since then, was about 50 years old or so. We decided to take this shortcut. Anyway, we were about to round the corner to the playground behind the school, 
when my eyes were brought all the way toward the back of the soccer field, which was still fenced off by a five to six foot chain link fence. What I saw there nearly made me shit my pants. I saw a shadow of a man running on the inside of the fence, our side, running towards us. I asked my friend if she had seen that too, and she quickly responded with, Yes, oh my god, let's go! We backed up real quick and booted it the fuck out of there, out to the front parking lot, and running straight towards her house. Who the fuck even knows why our parents used to let us walk alone like that late at night? But needless to say, we didn't take that way home again for quite a long time. We're both going on 21, and we still talk about that night to this very day. I still get the creeps whenever I walk there at night. Last summer, 2015, my best friend and I were taking a class that met two nights a week for a month. One night, after dropping her off at home after class was over, I went to a festival downtown and left at around 10.30 p.m. On the way home, I decided to stop at a local park just outside the city limits, where I went often to swing and listen to music. I wasn't tired enough yet to just go home. I was there for maybe 15 to 20 minutes, when another car pulled into the lot and a young couple got out. People fish at this park at night, so I didn't really think that much about it. After a few minutes, though, I noticed the couple was not leaving the general area around their car. I felt like I was being watched, too, so I kept swinging but turned the volume on my music down while keeping my headphones in. I was right. They were talking about me, speculating about when I was going to leave. My blood froze. I knew I had to get out of there, but in order to get back to my car, I would have to walk right past the gate to the playground and pass this couple in their car. Instead, I got off the swing while acting like I was sending a text and walked to a darker area of the playground away from them, hoping I could hide in the shadows until they left. Once I was there and hidden among the dark playground equipment, I suddenly heard a third voice in the darkness, one that sounded like that of a woman who had been chain-smoking her whole life. I felt sick to my stomach when I remembered that while I was watching the young couple, a second car had pulled into the lot as well, but whoever was in it had never gotten out. It appeared they were watching me from the vehicle, or lurking around in the dark somewhere I couldn't see them. Luckily, the part of the park I was in backed up to a fence that had a tree growing up against it. I hopped it as silently as I could, and decided I was going to make my way up the road where it was completely dark to go to the north entrance by foot, then circle around so I could get back to my car and get the hell out of there. I could hear the three of them arguing quite loudly with each other in the dark by now. My heart was pounding as I tiptoed along the street, silently praying I wasn't going to get abducted and murdered or something. I got to the entrance of the parking lot when there was a large bush and a portable toilet I could hide behind. That was when I heard the voice of the woman so close to me, it was almost like she was whispering in my ear. What she asked the guy and girl next made my heart stop. Did you get rid of the body yet? The three of them immediately started arguing again. The woman got into her car, slamming the door shut and turning the engine on. As she was pulling out of the lot, I ran across the street and hid in the shadows between a cluster of trees. Both cars pulled out of the lot within 30 seconds of each other, going in opposite directions. As soon as I was sure they weren't going to come back, and not wanting to catch a glimpse of whatever grisly crime scene they had left behind, I sprinted to my car and sped out of the park. I called the police as soon as I pulled into my grandparents' driveway. I talked with the dispatcher for 20 minutes, crying and shaking the whole time. Officers were sent to check out the area where this all took place, but they didn't find anything. I spoke with a detective one more time that night, but I was so full of adrenaline that I didn't sleep until the next day. 
I called my mom the next morning on her way to work and told her about what happened. Usually, she tells me I'm exaggerating and making something out of nothing, which is quite often true, but this time she was silent on the other end of the phone. After a moment, she just told me to never go to that park at night again. I never did find out what was really going on that night, but right around the time all of this happened, the police in our area were on the lookout for a man who had disappeared and supposedly been abducted. They found his body in the National Park, a half hour north from where my encounter took place two weeks later. We were going camping once, driving through some city. My dad was driving and my mom was in the passenger seat. I was in the back and it was evening, but not fully dark yet. We weren't really talking to each other at all. My mom was just looking out her window when all of a sudden she said, Oh my God, do you see that? My dad said, Yeah, I do. I'm going to slow down and let them pass. He slowed down, and the car on the right passed us by. I couldn't see inside, but one of their windows was down, and the arm hanging out that window looked to be that of someone impossibly thin. I asked my mom what she saw, and she said it was nothing. My dad backed her up, and they refused to tell me anything more. Years later, I asked them about it again. My mom said that what she'd seen that night was a person's skeleton. It was no mask, though, because you could see through their jaws. They still had some tissues like their tongue and their eyes, but the rest was rotting and decaying. My dad backed her up again, but years later, after my mom was dead, he recanted, saying it must have been a mask, because the person's eyes appeared to be moving, and nobody could be alive and look to be in that bad of a state. A couple of years ago, I was living in Budapest. It was half study abroad, half hanging out with my family, who lived in a town about 30 minutes south. Every once in a while, I would take day trips with my friends. On one of our trips to Romania, our car broke down right at the border. One of my friends had family that didn't live too far away. It was still way too far to just walk, though, so the four of us decided to hitchhike. We grabbed what we could out of the vehicle, then called her family to tell them we were on our way. We locked up the car and wrote a sign that said we were hitchhiking but would be returning for the car later. About five minutes after this, a van pulled over and we got inside. The guy who picked us up, Andres, was very nice. He was very interested in where we were all from, what we liked to do, where we traveled, what kind of things we were studying. It started to get quite dark out and Andres here mentioned his family had a house not too far from where we were actually. We could stop there for the night and sleep over, since he was pretty tired and didn't know if he could drive us all the way to where we needed to go to. We all kind of looked around at each other, but ultimately agreed that it was rude to expect this nice man who had picked us up to drive us all throughout the night. Yes, Andres was nice, but driving up the dirt road to his house made all the hairs on my arms stand up. I would later ask my companions, and they all said the same thing. All of us got silent as we tried to take in the scenery. It looked like an Eastern European house, set far back on what used to be a farm. There was still all of the old abandoned equipment around. We unloaded and shuffled into this house, which was actually very quaint and charming. He showed us into a room off the living room that we could all sleep in for the night. We all set out our sleeping bags and kind of congregated on the floor while Andres went into the kitchen. He started talking to his wife. Honey, I've brought back some travelers again. They're all very nice. Some of them are American. Ah, yes, I was going to offer them some brandy. 
He came back into the doorway of our room and offered us said brandy. I passed, but the others accepted. He brought us out a tray and the rest of the bottle, then disappeared again. Eventually, we all drifted off to sleep. I woke up first, got dressed, and went outside to pee. I ran into a little girl on my way back up to the house. She was incredibly shy. I asked what her name was and if she lived there too. She said she did, but kept saying her father didn't believe her. I chalked it up to either my Hungarian being rusty or her being a kid, but I told her she should come back inside because it was very cold out. She instead slunk back into an old mangled trailer she was playing inside. I went back in the house and breezed past the kitchen, where Andres was screaming out, Why are there not enough eggs for our guests? What kind of wife are you? When I got back to the doorway of our room, all of my companions were standing up, bags hastily packed and mouths agape. Looking behind me, I turned, and that's when I saw a scarecrow dressed up in women's clothing, sitting in an armchair at the far side of the living room. I turned back to my friends laughing, and said, Are you guys afraid of a scarecrow? Just then, Andres came through the door, picked the scarecrow up by the arm, and flung it across the room. You are the stupidest woman in the world, he howled. I worked so hard, and you embarrassed me. He went back into the kitchen, still screaming, and now rifling through drawers. I turned to my friends, and we all immediately agreed it was time to leave right now. The things Andres was saying got worse and worse. I killed the last one. I can kill you too. We stood there as a group frozen. My friend Libby turned around and saw a window, so we decided to jump through it to get out of the house. She was the first one out, and when she landed, she made this weird squishing sound. My friend Jenny popped her head out the window, and then started screeching and backing away from it. At this point, Andres had started stabbing the scarecrow with a big knife. We were all trying to get the hell out of this house. The two of us still inside pushed Jenny out of the way, not really caring why she was screaming, because Andres was packing a knife now. Finally, I jumped out and landed in what can only be animal remains. There was blood and guts filling this deep trench next to the guy's house. There was also a lovely portrait of a family painted on the side, using what looked like blood from this giant gaping hole. The four of us, bloody and shaking, were still able to hear Andres killing his scarecrow wife. We hightailed it the hell out of there back to the main road, and we decided against getting into another car. Instead, we ran all the way back to our old car. We took a break off from day tripping for a while. This happened about six months ago. I was 22 at the time, and my daughter was only four. I lived in a two-story house with just me, my daughter, and my husband. I was taking at-home classes to be an iPhone specialist, starting at 5 p.m. and ending at 10 p.m., Monday through Friday. My husband had left for his two weeks of training that he does every year for the military, so it was just me, my daughter, and our Pitbull Mix Mavis at home. I had just finished up my classes for the week and had the weekend free. I decided to go to my mother's house until Sunday. I packed up my stuff and my daughter's stuff, and we went over for the weekend. We returned home on Sunday to find that someone had broken into our home. There were muddy footprints and windows were open, but nothing was missing at all. I was going to call the police, but my sister's husband explained the cops wouldn't do anything. Nothing happened that night, but the next day my mother came over to pick my daughter up so I could do my classes without worrying what she was getting into. They left and I went to watch the classes upstairs. I put my headphones on so I could hear my instructor teaching the class, but I swear I began to hear things downstairs. I even texted my mom and told her I was hearing something weird going on. It was really creeping me out. 
She assured me it was probably just Mavis because she'd locked everything up tight when she left and no one could possibly get in. I agreed, thinking I was probably just freaking myself out. I continued listening to my instructor's teaching when I swear I heard footsteps on the stairs. I hurried up and took my headset off, but when I listened in, I couldn't hear anything. I walked down the stairs and didn't see anything either. I went back to my class and brushed it off. At 10 p.m., my class was finally over. My mom decided to just keep my daughter there with her for the night. I was doing my homework with Mavis upstairs with me, when all of a sudden, she started barking and growling and sprinted down the stairs. Now, Mavis usually barks and growls at the slightest of noises outside, so I didn't really think that much of it. I decided that maybe I should check it out anyway this time, though, because of what had happened earlier. Again, though, I didn't see anything out of the ordinary. I went back upstairs. I was finally done with my homework, and it was about midnight now. I went downstairs and called my mom like I do every night. We were talking, and I decided to open my daughter's door and peek my head in. I don't know why I did this, because my daughter was at my mom's for the entire night. It was just a habit. I guess I should have mentioned earlier that when you look into my daughter's room, her bed is on the far wall, a good ways away from the door. Because of this, you can clearly see underneath her bed as soon as you look in. I opened the door, and to my horror, I saw a man was hiding underneath her bed. I froze and didn't move. I just stood there in shock. After what felt like minutes, I slowly shut the door and whispered into my phone to my mom. There's a man in my house under my daughter's bed. My mom was terrified and screamed at me to get outside and stay on the phone with her. She had my brother call the police, so I ran outside with Mavis and waited for them to arrive. After about three minutes, they came and searched my house, but they found no one. They did discover my bathroom window was wide open. They happened to shine their light at the living room window, and I could clearly see two huge handprints where they'd slid the window down. The cops waited for my mom and brother to get there. And while we were waiting, they told me about this man who usually stayed two houses down from mine with his parents. Both of his parents had a pretty bad drug habit, and this guy had been known to put women in the hospital trying to kill them. What scares me even more is that since we bought this house, my daughter has been terrified and always told my mom she wanted to stay with her because it wasn't safe at mommy's house. I didn't really think too much of it at the time. I thought maybe it was just a new place, and you know how kids are with new places. After this whole thing happened, though, I stayed with my mom until my husband came home. We decided to ask our daughter what scared her so much about this house. What she told me absolutely terrified me. She said that at night, while her dad and I were asleep, monsters would come to her window and try to get inside. She said there was a boy monster and a girl monster. The next day, we installed alarms on all the windows and security lights. I can't stop questioning why this man was under my daughter's bed. Was he waiting for me to go to sleep? Or was he waiting for my mom to bring my daughter back home? And for me to put her to bed... I get sick to my stomach thinking about what could have happened to her. It all began on a beautiful day at the beginning of autumn in 1998. I live in a small town called Grantham in Lincolnshire, United Kingdom. I was out with a couple of friends and it was coming up to the end of the summer holidays. I was at a friend's house when I decided to nip home to get a drink. My two friends walked down with me as it was only around the corner, a five minute walk away from my house. I went in and they waited outside for me, or so I thought. While I was inside, I got real thirsty and drank about three pints of water before going back out. When I got outside though, I realized there was no sign of my friends around. I looked up and down the street for them. 
I looked up and down the street for them. Down the street, about four houses down from mine, there were a couple of very large trees about 18 feet high, overhanging the fence at the front. As I looked down that way, I saw two pairs of legs hanging down, as if two people were up in the tree hiding. I thought it must be my friends, messing around with me. I started walking down there, shouting that I could see them, and to stop messing around. As I shouted to them, whoever this was sort of jumped over the fence. When they entered the next garden over, they went to a gate at the side of the property, which was about eight feet high, and proceeded to climb over that too. I didn't understand how they'd just done all this so fast, but I still wasn't phased by it. I shouted again for them to stop messing around. Then I had an idea. I'd run down quickly and catch them when they came out of the next garden. I proceeded to the next garden over, but I couldn't believe what I was looking at now. There in this garden stood two people, but they were not my friends. At first, they looked really odd. There was a man, about 50, wearing a large trench coat that went all the way down to his feet. I could see he had large black boots on. As my eyes moved up, I saw his hands were very pale, and his fingernails were extremely long and overgrown, like big claws. They were a really dirty yellow color. His mouth was open wide enough to show he had sharp discolored teeth as well, and had a large pointed nose. When I looked at his eyes, they almost looked jet black. You'd never believe what I was talking about if you hadn't seen it yourself. I instantly froze on the spot. It felt like time was frozen. No one was around, and nothing was moving either. It felt like there was no wind. All I could do was stare into this guy's eyes. I knew they were staring right back at me. I was aware of the other person nearby as well. He was much younger and dressed in more modern clothes for the time. I couldn't see this young one's face as I was stuck staring into those deep pits that were the eyes of the first man. I'll tell you now, I've never felt so terrified in all my life. After what felt like hours, I managed to break the man's gaze and run home. When I got indoors, I just about bawled my eyes out. I think it was the shock and the horror of knowing those people were wandering around in broad daylight. I never knew what was going on until last night, when I discovered some stories of black-eyed children. After reading those stories, I realized that maybe that's what those guys could have been. It wasn't a nighttime door visit, though. I hope I never have to experience that again. I'm 36 now, but the following happened to me when I was 19 years old. A quick backstory is that I was and still am a volunteer firefighter in a small West Australian town in the southwest. In addition to the normal volunteer firefighting ins and outs of attending things, I was also involved in the sports side of the fire brigade as well. This was comprised of individual and team events. The fire brigade you belonged to was your team. Across Western Australia, there were about 30 such brigades, and between October and April, we would travel around and compete with each other. We had traveled to Geraldton to compete in the state championships in 1999. I had, through immense hard work, won the Championship Fireman Award and was at the hosting fire brigades after the event's celebration. I was enjoying myself with my team, drinking beer and socializing, which started at around 5 p.m. I'll admit I was pretty damn drunk at this point. There were a shitload of people around, and a lot of my time was spent talking to officials, older members, and chatting with friends and catching up. I had not really gotten my full drink on yet. I really needed to take a piss though, so I went around the corner and started to piss in the garden, like I had done a few times already. Every other bloke at the party was doing the same thing. While I was doing this though, 
I got a phone call from an unknown number. Being away from all the noise of the party, I answered this. I remembered the guy on the other end asking for someone I didn't know. They ended the call after perhaps 10 or 15 seconds, simply saying, Sorry, wrong number. I finished my piss and went straight back to the party. When I returned, I was absolutely in shock. Everyone else had disappeared practically. It was dead quiet. Every table and chair was neatly stacked with all the rubbish cleared. The lights were off, the doors were locked, there were no cars at all. It was completely dead, with not a sound at all. I was extremely confused. I took my phone out and saw it was just after 4 a.m. Well, what the fuck just happened? I checked through my phone, and it showed dozens of missed calls, 30 or 40 text messages of people searching for me and looking for where I'd gone to. I called up my mate and made it back to my hotel. Over the next few days, I confirmed with many people that I had been standing in the circle talking to everyone, when I excused myself to take a piss after receiving a phone call. That was the last anyone saw of me that night. Where I'd pissed was where everyone else was doing it, so it's impossible I could have gone there unnoticed. A group of friends had searched the entire area for me, but apparently I had just disappeared altogether. I still have no idea what really happened that night, but it was extremely weird. Throughout the days, we take our two dogs outside to their kennels, so they can get out of the house for a while and run and play. These are not small dogs, mind you. One is a Black Lab Husky mix, and the other one is a full-blooded Staffordshire Terrier Pitbull. The kennels are placed at the edge of the yard near the woods. The woods are big and large enough to take an entire day to go hiking through them. Lately, when it gets dark, the dogs seem to be very on edge. They'll bark and whine toward the house to come in. At first, I figured they just wanted to get back inside, but now I'm actually starting to think they might be scared for some reason. Three nights ago when I went to get them, it was already dark, but we have a security light so it wasn't pitch black or anything like that. I got to the front of the first kennel and noticed both dogs were being unusually quiet. They always barked at me excitedly when I'd go to get them, but now they were dead silent. This did weird me out a bit, but not to the point of being scared. I will admit there was a certain uneasiness in the air though, something I couldn't quite explain. It felt sort of electric, like I was about to be shocked or something. The longer I was there, the more uneasy I felt. I started getting the first dog out when I heard a heavy snap in the woods near the kennels. I froze, and the dogs froze too. By this point in time, I was so on edge that if someone had spoken out to me, I would have jumped and screamed, possibly even ran away. This ominous feeling in the air just kept getting thicker and thicker. My lab had her bushy tail stuffed underneath her and was whining. This didn't make me feel any better. My pit bull was as far away from the woods as she could get, whimpering for me to come get her as well. I could only take one dog in at a time because they'd get too excited and even sometimes try to fight. I avoided that at all costs, so I felt bad leaving my pit out there by herself. I had to do it though. As I walked away, she barked this kind of high-pitched whining type of bark at me. I had never heard her do this before. The lab couldn't get into the house quick enough. I went back for the other one and dreaded every step. Her kennel was right at the base of the woods. I would have to turn my back on them to open her door and get her out. The air felt heavy and stale with an unpleasant smell like that of dead skunk. I approached the kennel and another snap was heard. I was about ready to run for it, but I didn't want to leave my dog who had her head down defensively facing the woods outside. I could barely make it to be honest. It felt like trying to walk through water. I was terrified. As I reached the door, I heard a heavy breathing behind me. I got my dog out, 
She was scared too, but she started growling at the area behind me. I was frozen in place. That heavy breathing continued for about a minute before I heard steps coming out of the woods towards both of us. We took off at the same time. A terrifying scream came from the base of the woods. I didn't dare to look back to see what it was though. I just ran all the way home, my pit bull pulling me all the way back. I got in and flipped off all the lights. I stared out the window at those woods. I could see that something was clearly moving around outside, but it was just out of reach of the light. It moved back and forth for about five minutes before it disappeared back into the woods. It took me forever to fall asleep that night because I was so scared that every little noise freaked me out. The next night I went to get the dogs earlier, right around dusk or so. I thought all was good until I was getting my pity out again. A huge snapping sound like a tree branch cracking rang out. It sounded pretty far away, so I hurried up and got my dog and started toward the house. A few steps away from the kennel, I heard something quite big charging toward me from inside the woods. We ran again. Whatever it was appeared to follow for a while, then retreated back into the woods once we were inside. Now, every night since then, I hear sounds coming out of the woods like branches cracking and things being thrown around or something knocking against the trees. I'm absolutely terrified. I no longer even take my dogs down there. I just take them for walks during the day instead and make sure we're all in bed before dusk. I don't know what to do. I'm thinking of buying a gun, but I'm not sure how much that will actually help. During 1999, I worked briefly as a vacuum cleaner salesman. Yes, the job was as terrible as it sounds. It also required very late nights, as I was often at customers' homes until around 9 p.m. before having to go back to the head office to check in, then drive back home. Often, I wouldn't even arrive home until 12 or 1 a.m. in the morning. I was working late this one particular night and was on the home stretch around 10 miles from home when my old crappy Ford Fiesta started to overheat. I knew the car wouldn't make it home, and I had no other choice than to pull over on top of the big, dark, deserted mountain next to my town. My hometown was literally the last town before there were only mountains and forests for countless miles on end. As I pulled into the mountain parking area with steam pouring out of my engine, this is 100% true by the way, I could see a white human figure. Obviously surprised a car was pulling into a deserted parking space in the middle of the night, this figure ran directly in front of my headlights. As it sprinted from the edge of the clear side of the parking area and into the forest on the other side, I could see it had no clothes. They also appeared almost luminous and reflective in my lights. To say I shit myself is a bit of an understatement. My eyes nearly popped out of my sockets when they ran in front of me. I realized that I was now stuck in a dead car on a deserted mountain in the middle of the night with no mobile phone signal. This was back in the days when mobile phones were just starting to become popular so large chunks of the country were missing from network coverage. I had no choice but to sit there for an hour until my car cooled down. They'd given up the ghost pretty much the second I pulled in, so I just sat there in my car alone, staring directly into the forest where I'd saw them run. I had no weapon and no way to make contact with anybody to let them know where I was. There was no passing traffic to possibly flag down for help. I knew for a fact I had actually seen someone there, and it was not a trick of the light. That much was clear. I discounted any other animal that populated the Welsh mountains, as I was certain I'd seen a two-legged humanoid. Roughly a human head, body, arms, and legs. The obvious answer was that it was some very strange man, who for some reason was either wearing white or completely naked. 
since we were miles away from the nearest home and I was the only car around. I didn't know why someone would have spent hours walking through thick forests just to hang out in an empty parking area in the middle of the forest. Eventually, my car cooled down enough for me to limp back home. Nobody really believed me when I told them what I saw, though. All my friends were adamant I must have seen a sheep or something, but to this very day, I swear that I saw something that night, something different than I have ever seen in the forest before. I've been camping many times, biking and hiking, and I've never seen anything like that again. Whenever I go there now, though, I'm always aware of the possible presence of someone else being out in the woods with me. I was living with my then-boyfriend and his flatmate about this time last year. I just got in from work on a Sunday night, at around 11 p.m. or so. I work in a bar, by the way. We'd all decided to go smoke a joint in the park next door to our flat. Now, the area we lived in was actually very nice. Never had any problems, very quiet community. As we got about halfway through the park, some random guy started cycling towards us. He got about a meter past us, then fell off his bike. We all ignored it and carried on walking, until he randomly started to scream at us. Hey, you wanna fight? He ran over and started pushing the guys I was with around and screaming in my face. He was a big guy, and we were all pretty freaked out. We turned around and started to head home. And that's when the guy climbed back on his bike and started chasing after us. He was screaming, I have a knife, and I'm gonna kill you all. We all legged it back to the flat, but you have to key in a code. We got in just in time. We didn't get the chance to close the door properly, though, as the guy shoved his way in. We had to run up three flights of stairs. I was at the very back. We got into the flat just in time. The man started banging on the door shortly after. We didn't call the police in the end. And probably should have in hindsight, but we were all pretty shaken up. We later ordered a pizza and when the pizza guy came up to the flat, we asked him to make sure the guy was not still there. I was once walking through the woods in a rather remote area by myself, as I needed to take a shortcut from where I was going to arrive in time. After a few minutes, though, I thought I saw something moving in the bushes right next to me. It was just about getting dark, so there was still enough light out to see movement, but not really enough to see what was doing the moving. I just shook it off, surely a squirrel or some wild animal. After a few hundred meters deeper in, though, I noticed strange noises coming from behind me. It sounded like heavy breathing, like the rattling sound you'd make if you had pneumonia or something. As I turned around, I couldn't see anything. It had gotten darker very quickly. I'm a guy in his mid-twenties and in good condition, so I thought, oh, fuck it, let's run for a few minutes until I'm back on track. I tried to focus on my steps so I didn't trip on a root or a stone or something in the darkness. As I slowed down because of a big dead tree blocking my path, I could hear the breathing behind me again, now much closer than it had been before. Whatever this thing was, it was clearly following me. Because I had been running, I was too loud to notice it. I jumped over that lying trunk and turned around, ready to face whatever was following me. And there they were. There was a naked man, eyes glowing in the darkness. He could see the yellow shimmer of their teeth with their mouth opened drool seemingly pooling down. I pulled out my pocket knife, prepared to fight this unusual man. Luckily, they must have been intimidated by the sight of my knife because they dashed right back into the bushes where they came from, and I went the rest of my way in peace.
I met my stalker when I was in middle school. My school consisted of 7th grade through 12th grade and had a normal program and an accelerated program. The students within each program were pretty segregated from each other. My friends and I all belonged to the accelerated program, but there was one guy in the group from the normal program named Carson. We were all typical teenagers, with Carson being the group's prankster. We could only hang out at school, really, because we were all shipped in from various parts of the county for the accelerated program. After school, we would all get on AOL to chat and play games together. Online, we had even more friends, as we'd each invite our own local friends to chat with everyone. One day, Carson invited his friend Steve to join in. He was nice and contributed a lot to the conversation. We learned that Steve actually attended our school too, but he was in the normal program, and so had a different lunch period than the rest of us. We had almost no chance of crossing paths with each other. We insisted on meeting him in person, however, and scheduled for Steve to come to my locker to meet up with everyone before first period. The next morning, we waited, and Steve never came. My friend and I did have a short exchange with another kid, though, Marco, which consisted of us telling him to go away. Marco had been Carson's satellite since the beginning of the year. Wherever Carson went, Marco would stand 10 to 15 feet away watching us all. We had tried to become friends with him, but he was simply too strange. He would do things like touch your face unexpectedly or try to sneak up behind you and bite you. He'd tell you he wanted to see you inside out. His list of strange behaviors was a mile long. A few days after Steve failed to come meet with us, it came to light that Steve was actually Marco, and the whole thing was one of Carson's pranks. Considering Marco had been a pleasant addition to the chat as Steve, though, we gave him another chance to join the real group as well. Besides Carson, though, I was the only person that really gave Marco a chance. He still did all the weird things he had always been doing, but now it was more apparent it was more of an act to get attention for being the weird guy than anything really malicious. Marco was being abused at home by his mom's boyfriend. He rarely saw his mother because she worked so damn much. Marco became the poster child for bad attention is still attention because of this. Still, my other friends wanted him out of the group. I repeatedly found myself arguing his case to let him stay. Once I caught an older student beating Marco up, a boy that lived on my street. Being much larger than either of us, he was literally picking Marco up and slamming him around while calling him a freak. Knowing the bully and his mother, I did what was my signature move at the time and kicked him in the balls while threatening to tell his mom on him about how he was treating me and my friends. I believe this was the catalyst for years of torment as Marco instead became my satellite after that day. At school, Marco followed me any chance he got. At home, he would message me non-stop typically in private chats as my other friends no longer wanted anything to do with him. I felt a bit bad. He was a sweet kid besides his weird attention-seeking stunts, and no one should have to go through life with no friends. Eventually, Marco asked me out, which I politely declined. He was my friend, but he was not the type of guy I would ever be interested in dating. He was persistent, though, begging me to give him a chance. Over and over again, I would have to tell him no. One day, his approach suddenly changed. You will go out with me, or I'll show your mom all of our chat logs. There was nothing especially bad in there. I wasn't drinking or doing drugs or anything bad. I was pretty depressed at the time, though, and sometimes talked about wanting to hurt myself. If my parents saw any of that, I could effectively kiss my freedom and privacy goodbye. I tried to bluff him, telling him good luck with any attempts to convince my parents to believe him over me. That actually seemed to work. I was not very impressed with the stunt either, and stopped talking to him soon after. 
A few weeks went by, and Marco came crawling back, begging for forgiveness. Eventually, I caved in, allowing him back into the group with me. At first, he was well behaved again, but he slowly started pestering me to be his girlfriend once more. Over the course of high school, he tried many different methods begging, blackmailing, attacking my self esteem by calling me ugly and a slut, catfishing me, threatening any guys I dated, and more. I tried to be nice at first, but eventually I had to get mean in how I said no. His behavior would always reach a boiling point that forced me to cut him out of our friend group. It was nearly impossible to actually get rid of him, however. Online, he would create dozens of new accounts to send messages from, overwhelming my attempts to block him. He would call my phone all night long and leave woeful messages about how lonely he was and how he would kill himself if I stopped being his friend. He would show up at my house and stand outside my bedroom window at random times. When my parents had parties like the 4th of July, Thanksgiving, or Halloween, he would always manage to find out and show up. Because these parties were always pretty big with an open-door policy, he'd slip in, usually in disguise. Then he'd do something to get thrown out, like get belligerently drunk or stuff his face with all the food, then slam them back down on the serving platters. The first time I really felt that Marco might be an actual threat, though, was at one of my parents' Halloween parties when we were 16. One of my dad's friends had a son our age named Tim. He was a bit of a joke and fancied himself pretty cool. He thought it would be fun to pick a fight with a weird kid, make a display of his superior strength. Marco accepted his challenge. We all knew he was going to get the crap beat out of him, Going out into the streets, Tim towered over Marco. That year, he was dressed as Alex from A Clockwork Orange, his favorite book, with his costume including a cane. He swung the cane at Tim, hitting him in the head with it. Tim went down quickly, and Marco beat him over and over until an adult intervened and sent him home. Marco's go-to threat became whenever I had a boyfriend. I'll beat him to death with a shovel and use it to bury his body. Suddenly, this threat seemed like something he was more than capable of. Our senior year of high school, Marco's dad died in prison. He learned the real reason his dad was put away was for murdering someone. He'd always thought his dad was in there for drugs, and he started to spiral out of control. He said that his dad was a murderer, so he must be doomed to be one too. He dropped out of school halfway through the year. My brother said that after I had left home for college, Marco came to the house looking for me a few times. Once he figured out I wasn't there, he'd come and stand in the front yard aimlessly, playing with a Bic lighter until someone threatened to call the police. One of my biggest fears was that he'd try to set our house on fire in some weird way of trying to punish me. When I'd go home with my boyfriend, he'd always show up at my parents' house. At one point, he even tried to intimidate my boyfriend into breaking up with me by showing him his big knife. It was always an ordeal to get him to leave. A lot of issues have now eased up just due to distance and time. I don't use social media much anymore, and I'm able to semi-block people on my phone. Initially, he was calling and texting every day. Hundreds and hundreds of messages. I tried asking him to stop, but this only encouraged him. My family no longer lives in that area, so I'm significantly less worried for their safety. I found the most successful way of dealing with him to be simply ignoring him. Eventually, his messages dwindled down to once a week, then once a month. Now I hear from him maybe officially once a year. His message is typically something along the lines of, Please just be my friend. I won't try for anything more. I need you in my life. The last time I actually talked to him, which was about four to five years ago now, Marco tried to tell me I'd ruined his life. He said I put some spell on him and that he couldn't move forward with anything. He told me he would kill himself and it would be all my fault. I finally had to tell him I wouldn't care if he did. In fact, it would be quite the relief if he did so. His most recent M.O. is to call my work phone from a private number 
just to hear me answer the phone, then hang up. He also calls and texts my brother, our high school friends, my brother's best friend, my parents, my grandparents, my aunt, and my husband, all to beg them to ask me to call him. He messaged my husband, tell her she's my angel, the love of my life, I'm nothing without her. I'm worried he'll snap someday and show up at my house or job and try to end me. I have security systems and other means of protection, but I'm still very paranoid about it. I've talked to the police about getting a restraining order, but they told me there's no real grounds unless he does start showing up and threatening to kill me, so I guess we'll see what happens. This story is not as shocking or traumatic as some of the ones you might have heard before, perhaps. But when it was happening to me, I was extremely upset and unnerved by it. This happened many years ago. I was newly single and looking for a way to meet new people, so I thought I would try my luck at online dating. I created a profile and went about speaking to some men online. I even met up for a few coffee dates or lunch. My initial nervousness at the prospect of meeting strangers online for possible romance was calmed down somewhat. I learned that there were actually quite a lot of nice guys out there just looking for the same companionship I was. I started to become more optimistic. In the past, I had this habit of dating men that were non-commitment types. I realized that I was ready to try and find somebody that wanted something a little more serious. I made a big mistake, though. In formulating this goal, I had largely blamed myself for my failed past relationships, reasoning that perhaps I had somehow unconsciously chosen a partner who was not ready for commitment. I decided I should try and be more open to nice, sincere men who seemed ready for the kind of relationship I was ready for. In doing so, I ended up ignoring the gut instincts I had always followed, and that came back to bite me. This is where Mark enters the scene. Mark worked in banking and was divorced with one child. He was fairly good-looking, articulate, and we shared many interests. We began chatting online. This progressed to phone calls after a couple of days, and finally the idea arose to meet for coffee. Looking back, I now note that he seemed in a hurry to meet me right from the get-go, despite me saying I preferred to speak for a while initially. We decided on a possible date, general location, and general time, but nothing was truly confirmed. I recall at the time I was actually fairly busy, and as we began to get closer to the date, I felt like I was going to be too busy to meet up with anyone. In the days leading up, without a location or exact time set, I didn't get back to him. I ended up getting tied up with other things and didn't know when I'd be free. I hadn't spoken to him in several days by this point. This is where the first red flag occurred, and in retrospect, I should have passed altogether on further meeting. As I said, though, I was trying out this new attitude of being more open and accepting of nice men. On the date we discussed meeting initially, I was out somewhere doing something when my phone rang. I noticed it was Mark. I picked it up and he spoke to me in a warm tone. Hey, I'm in your neighborhood. I know we said we were going to meet today, but where would you like to meet me? Because I'm here right now waiting. I found this alarming because not only had I never gotten back to him with a time or location... I knew for a fact he lived two cities away, and it would have taken a lot of time to drive down on the loose plan of a meeting that had never been confirmed. Again, I told myself, this man must really want to meet you. That shows he's sincere, I guess. Enjoy this for a change. Against my gut instinct, I told him I would simply meet him on a different day, and we agreed on a concrete date and time instead. When the date arrived, it went surprisingly well. He was just as good-looking in real life. We had good conversations, and he was very nice. We started seeing each other. He was all about romantic gestures, paying attention to me, calling me, generally just being kind and sweet every day. 
He always seemed to want to spend time with me, and I told myself that this is what I had been missing for a long time. I tried my best to appreciate the gestures and attention as something positive, even though I wasn't really used to this much. It did feel a little strange as well, because I didn't know him that well. He would do things like show up unannounced with flowers to my work, only a short time after meeting each other in person. He was very touchy and feely, something I wasn't used to, and he did it in an off-putting way. I was uncomfortable with his constant touching and rubbing of me all over the place, generally suffocating me with his presence even while we were in public. I recall one time telling him that I was going downtown with a group of girlfriends for a birthday celebration, and he insisted we should go out for a drink alone beforehand. I said that was not really necessary, because I only had an hour or so to spend prior to going out with them. The drive for him to get there was already an hour or more. This would be an extreme amount of trouble to go through just to see me for a short period of time, but he insisted that even a single hour would be worth it. When he arrived, I met him at a local pub. We had a drink, and then he laughed and joked that he should just come downtown with me and my girlfriends. I told him no. That was really weird. He wasn't invited, and that was not what we had discussed. He went home dejected, and that was the first time I felt a little bit off about him. Things went on, though, and I spent the night at his house after about three weeks. I told him I had plans the next day, and I would have to get going at about 10 a.m. or so. When I went to leave the next morning, though, he got very distressed and kept insisting I should stay because it was such a beautiful day. It was such a real shame I was leaving because there were so many wonderful things we should do together. He blocked me in. I should also mention that for the past week or so, he'd been insisting he loved me and would tell me multiple times a day. I didn't reciprocate because I wasn't ready for that yet. When I went to leave out the front door, he wrapped himself in front of me in the doorway and kissed me over and over, repeating the words, I love you, you're everything I want in a woman, like a robot. I got really grossed out at the way he was behaving. I shoved him out of the way and left very irritated, although I didn't say anything, as I really did need to get going. I decided before I was even out of his driveway that I was never going to meet up with him again. Over the next day or two, I thought about how I would let him down and talked it over with my friends. I kicked myself too for deliberately ignoring my gut. During this time, I responded to his relentless phone calls with polite texts to stall him until I was ready to come up with a response. Finally, I settled on what I felt was a compassionate but firm approach to letting him down. I spoke to him on the phone and explained I had come to the conclusion that I was not at a point in my life where I wanted this relationship whatsoever, with anyone, including him. That was a lie, of course, but I didn't want to hurt his feelings. He kept trying to question what he had gotten wrong, what he'd misunderstood, but I just kept repeating that nothing was wrong. I simply didn't want a date. I went with this approach out of a complete lack of interest in doing anything to enlighten him what a turn off his behavior was. I already had enough responsibility in my life. I had no desire to add him to it. Since we'd only been seeing each other less than a month, I thought that would be the end of it. But boy was I wrong. I woke the following day to find a long, desperate email in my inbox. Basically, he said he was mentally ill. He was taking antidepressants that he blamed for his clingy behavior, although I had not complained to him about this at all. He ended by saying he would throw out all his medication, and therefore we should date again. The tone of the letter was very panicked and weird. I ignored it. Then the real onslaught began. Over the following weeks or so, he blew up my work phone, cell phone, and email with non-stop messages. I became increasingly annoyed at how entitled he felt to dismiss everything I said and to blatantly intrude in my life with such a relentless stream of calls and emails. At work, for example, he called my desk phone 34 times in a three-hour period. My co-workers were flabbergasted and even offered to answer and scream in his ear. I cannot understand why he thought this behavior would somehow make me like him, but obviously it did the exact opposite. 
even began to use attempts like regarding a pair of cheap plastic scratch sunglasses he left in his car. He claimed they were very expensive and were heirlooms from his mother, and she would be very upset if I didn't return them to him. Whatever. I drove to his house and dumped them in his mailbox. I finally texted him back after this to say, They're in your mailbox. Don't contact me again. Of course, that didn't stop him, though. The onslaught continued for days on end. He'd always exclaimed that I'd left something small, like a scarf or something at his house, and that he needed to return it to me. I'd send him another text. I told you to stop harassing me. If you contact me again, I'm calling the cops. Eventually, this did work. Well, sort of. I continued to get Facebook messages from him for years after, even though we were not friends. I never responded to a single one. In the last one, he told me he was following me out in public somewhere. I was with my giant husband at the time, thank God. He wrote how good I looked, and added that he hoped still that we could be friends again one day. Uh, no thanks, Mark. I do not want to be your friend. But thanks for the lesson you taught me. Never ignore your instincts. Listening to mine led me to the next awesome, sincere, and unclingy man that I ended up marrying. It started during Christmas break last year. A close friend of mine had an appointment for a pretty detailed tattoo, so she wanted me to come along with the boyfriend she had at the time, and his best friend Chuck. Now, mind you, I had never once met this Chuck before, but he's the main star of our story here. My friend and I were supposed to meet up with Chuck at Dunkin' Donuts before the appointment, since he was also supposed to be getting a tattoo done. When he arrived, he wasn't at all who I expected him to be. He seemed pretty cool at first. Then, though, he started acting like one of those fake, deep people who thinks they know everything about someone by looking into their eyes. He kept telling me he really liked that he could see I was a person who suffered like he has, and at one point he even said, Your eyes are like a vortex. Needless to say, it kind of weirded me out. I figured it wouldn't be that big a deal, though. Since the whole purpose of meeting up was to get some tattoos, we started talking about that instead. I showed him the tattoos I already had, and what other ones I had planned. For some reason, Chuck insisted that he buy a small, relatively cheap tattoo for me. I kept on trying to say no, you know, on behalf of the fact that I just met him an hour ago. But he kept insisting it was no big deal. As weird as it made me feel, I decided to simply go with it. No use in arguing. Fast forward to the appointment. We're sitting there in the parlor's lobby, waiting for the artist to be done with their current client. All of a sudden, Chuck starts acting weird. He's saying he's having an anxiety attack. Obviously, I don't take that lightly, but I was confused as to what was happening. Regardless of how odd it seemed, though, we tried to calm him down. While my friend was getting her large thigh piece done, I got the tattoo Chuck had offered to pay for. It was just a short quote on my arm, and only took about ten minutes. After this, Chuck got his small hand tattoos done. This is when he decided he wanted to get one to commemorate our meeting. I was really unsure about this. It was so weird. He was married, and I wasn't sure if his wife was a jealous person. Either way, it didn't seem very appropriate. He kept on saying, though, that I was a cool-ass chick who was spontaneous like him. I can't remember exactly why, but the talk of my initials came up. He really liked that my initials were SSS. So this man, who I'd met just two hours before, decided to get that tattooed on the front of his wrist. I was very uncomfortable now. I wasn't sure what to do. My friend and her at-the-time boyfriend were too occupied doing their own things to say much. So I just kind of zoned out and went with it. After that was over, we all parted ways, and he told me he was going to start texting me. I thought he meant he would text me like one or twice after and disappear, but surprisingly, he tried to talk to me a whole lot. 
he was actually kind of a nuisance. I replied to him anyway, though, because I liked that he took me seriously, and I was insecure in that period of time. Things got more and more weird, though. He would constantly ask me if I wanted to go and watch movies with him and his wife. At one point, we ended up talking about my sexuality. He told me it was so cool with him, because his wife was also bisexual. He kept on saying his wife wanted to meet me. It was getting more and more suggestive. As time went on, I started replying less, because I was pretty sure he had some sort of weird fetish going on with me. And that's when shit hit the fan. One night, Chuck was drunk. He was actually pretending, and decided to profess his love for me. He said he'd fallen in love with me the second he met me, and was so overwhelmed with the feeling it caused him to have the anxiety attack I mentioned earlier. Of course, he was married, and I had no interest in him. I had never once let him on or even suggested I liked him. I hadn't even talked to him that much. He told me his marriage was falling apart. I texted the friend from earlier in the story, and she told me he was lying about everything. The next day while I'm in class, he texts me and told me he lied about everything himself. As you can imagine, I was livid. How fucked up was it to lie to me about things like that? Especially saying his wife was cheating on him and stuff. He tried to tell me he'd never do anything like that again, but I wasn't having it. I'll admit I said some pretty brutal things to him, but it was well deserved. I decided my best decision was to block him. Afterwards, my friend would text me all the time, saying Chuck was harassing her to try to get through to me. At this point, both of us were done with his shit. He was causing a lot of issues. Even a few months after the incident, her boyfriend cut him off too, because he was starting to harass him as well. Even though it was nearly a year ago, I still wonder how he feels when he looks down at his wrist and sees my initials there. There's no worse feeling in the world for a five-year-old, or any age really, than losing your parents in a public place. Times that by a crowd of thousands and triple the number of places they could be, and you have my absolute nightmare, especially in the baking sun of the Florida summer. Looking back, I would call myself a really codependent kid, getting anxious if my parents even went into the next aisle over at the grocery store and not really leaving the yard without them knowing, or at least another adult like my friend's mom or dad. So, when we took a trip to Disneyland in the foreign state of California, I knew I would be clinging to them like gum on the sidewalk. That didn't mean I wouldn't be having any fun, of course. Just that I was going to be doing it exclusively with my folks in tow, and I was perfectly fine with that. My dad, though, was more of an independent fellow, and he wanted his only son to eventually fall into his footsteps and grow up to be a real man. While on this trip, he would make it a point to leave me alone for a couple of minutes at a time, while he and my mom looked at an attraction across the street or went to another place in the gift shop increasing the time by a few seconds each time. Now, don't get me wrong here. He let me know where they'd be. It's not like he just up and left me there. And they'd come back right away if I got their attention. But still, it was anxiety-inducing being alone around all these people I didn't know. I knew my classmates and teachers at school and things like that, so that didn't really count when I was around crowds there. My mom comforted me if I started to cry, and said maybe my dad was being a bit too hard on me. But you really couldn't win with him. If he had something in his head, you'd be fighting him the entire day, if not more. This all came to a head on the third morning of our Disney trip, when my dad suggested he and my mom go grab some breakfast. While I waited in the hotel room by myself... To most kids, a chance to be alone and watch all the TV I wanted would be heaven. But I just remember a spike of adrenaline shooting through me, and the hotel floor practically falling away beneath me. I mean, I'd be in my room or out in the yard at home alone just fine, but they were always nearby. 
At the same time, though, a big part of me looked up to my dad, and I wanted to make him proud. So, reluctantly, I put on a brave face and said I'd be fine. I hunkered down in front of the Disney Channel as they left, feeling like the whole room was closing in as the door shut behind them. After watching reruns of Good Luck Charlie and Ant Farm on repeat, I quickly got bored and tried to change the channel. Flipping through was the only way to combat my mounting anxiety. Apart from the TV, the room was too quiet, too big, too unfamiliar for me to be comfortable but the TV wouldn't change without a passcode for whatever reason. I guess I'd left it idling for too long. I tried to remember what the room passcode even was for what felt like forever, but I came up short. I could feel the anxiety starting to mount again as the TV played the same commercials over and over. Now I had nothing to forget that my parents weren't in the next room. In hindsight, I know now that I had an extreme undiagnosed anxiety disorder, but at the time, I had no idea what that was, or how to deal with it at all aside from distracting myself or finding them. And so, I chose the second option. I could hear my heart beating in my ears as I opened the door to our hotel room. We were on the ground floor, and technically, we were in a motel attached to the main resort so our door faced a small parking lot. I had been in that dark room so long with the curtains drawn that the sun reflecting off a bright blue car next to ours blinded me for a bit. I knew I had to act fast if I wanted to find them. I didn't know exactly where they were going, but my mom said before they left they'd be across the bug bridge to the left. I started walking down the road to the left, looking for any bridges or Disney-themed breakfast nooks I could find. A little bit difficult, considering nearly everything around me was Disney-themed. I walked far too long before I realized I didn't see anything that could be like what she was describing. Just the Cinderella castle a middle distance away, a looming presence and a beacon. Maybe someone there can help me find them, I thought. I ran to it as fast as my legs could carry me. Only even then I managed to get even more lost. The bright signs all seemed to look the same, and I couldn't read too well yet, so a map was out of the question. It was also, I learned later, rush hour at the Magic Kingdom area, so the streets were very congested with strangers going about here and there. None of them paid any attention to me. Not that I'd tried to get their attention in the first place. My breath grew short at the thought. I ended up just crouching in the corner for a minute, trying to make myself as small as possible, and trying not to cry while a Disney song played nearby. The people were really starting to close in. As I looked between my fingers, I realized why. Someone in a princess costume had strolled onto the corner and was greeting people and signing things. I recognized the yellow dress immediately. Belle. She was my favorite princess. We were going to do a picture opportunity with her later today, but if I couldn't find my way back, that would never happen. My blood rushed into my ears. My tears caked my face as they dried. I decided to be a man in that moment, even if a scared one. With shaking, wobbly legs, I cut the line and ran right up to Belle and said, Can you help me? You might know the rest of the story. Belle looked at the crowd of kids for a minute, as if signaling the parents to come get theirs for cutting in line. A look of realization crossed her face, though, and she asked me, Are you lost, honey? Maybe Beast can sniff out your mother and father if we ask nicely. I agreed, drawing the tears from my face. This time, they were tears of relief, though. Apparently, my parents had been looking for me since they found the room empty and the door wide open. I guess in my panic, I'd forgotten to close it. The TV was still on too, blaring more and more reruns. It must have looked a lot worse than it actually was, like I'd been kidnapped instead of just wandering off or something. They called the front desk who called hotel security, and eventually it made its way through a good portion of the chain. By the time I'd asked Belle for help, my parents were considering calling the actual police and filing a missing persons report. My dad in particular felt guilty for his part to play in the incident. He apologized for leaving me scared and alone, and said we could wait until I felt ready to try something like that again. 
They hugged me and promised me a special dinner that night. With my favorite Disney princesses, I ended up sitting with the bell that waited with me until security could get my parents, and she was very wonderful. She chatted with me for a long time about anything and everything, and I still have her autograph and a picture she let me get with her once my parents arrived to this day. I know this doesn't sound so scary. After all, there was nothing actively dangerous going on, but like I said, a kid getting lost in a huge crowd like that can be your worst nightmare. My name is Diane, and I'm here to tell you about my honeymoon with my wonderful husband, Cooper. We met only two years before we got married in college, and it was a whirlwind romance. I'd never met a more considerate, kind, or funny man in my entire life. We've been married for a total of five years now, and I can honestly say he's still my better half to this day. Our first date was to see 2017's Beauty and the Beast remake, and despite what people say about the live-action versions, we both found we actually really liked it. In fact, we make it a tradition to watch it on each of our anniversaries, or on special occasions significant to our relationship. Early on in the wedding planning, we decided to take the plunge and have our honeymoon at Disney. This would be our first major couples trip not sponsored by our school, so we had a huge learning curve ahead of us. Cooper had gotten a degree in finance, so he knew pretty well the ins and outs of trip planning, and I was more the bargain finder. This made it a lot easier than we thought it would be to plan for the trip, so despite all the stresses of slapping a wedding and honeymoon together, we never lost sight of what it was really all about, celebrating our love. Cooper and I, however, found ourselves in the middle of something straight out of a thriller. The first few days of the week-long trip were wonderful. We chose a tropical suite with a strong paradise theme. It had its own pool and hot tub and was close to a cute little Disney-themed breakfast place we wanted to try. Coop loved the Mickey-shaped waffles, by the way. Still likes to make them like that occasionally. It was pretty cozy room-wise and overall, especially for a newlywed couple. Without going into too many details, I knew I wanted a life and family with Cooper forever, and I was looking forward to four days of wedded bliss together. Day four started off just like all the others. I'm an early riser, while Cooper sleeps in a bit later. So I was up and brewing a cup of coffee for myself, while the sun crept higher through the morning, flooding the room with light slowly. By the time 10.30 rolled around, he shuffled out of bed to join me. He wrapped his arms around me and kissed the back of my neck before heading to the bathroom, mulling over the plans for the day out loud. That's how we decided to go to the Epcot Center that day, a spot we hadn't tried yet, and something different from the Magic Kingdom and other areas. We wouldn't be going on many rides, though. We just like to soak up the atmosphere of a place at our own speed seeing what we could find while walking around. We'd meet all sorts of people, both tourists like us and cast members, and even had a couple take our picture in front of some cultural monuments. One of these people we met definitely stood out, though. A large man that looked to be about his mid-forties. He introduced himself as Charles, and he towered over both of us. When he offered to take our picture in front of the Epcot Ball itself, I noticed him staring at me and not really making eye contact with Cooper. He seemed to be taking a little too long to snap one or two photos as well. Though, in his defense, we were facing the sun at the time, so I can't really say for sure. He was polite enough and quick to hand my phone back to me, but I couldn't shake how he never seemed to blink, especially when Cooper casually mentioned we were on our honeymoon. Oh, you're a lucky man, he said. That was the only time he acknowledged Cooper directly. Thanks, Coop said, drawing his arm around me. We excused ourselves and walked away. 
Coop teased me about having competition even on the honeymoon. I rolled my eyes and smacked his chest. Not a chance, I said. The rest of the day went really well, though I couldn't get Charles' creepy stare out of my head. I know some people can't help it, or don't realize when they do it, but still, it gave me a little bit of a shiver each time I thought of the way he looked at me. We tried to just put it out of our minds and continue on with the day, but every once in a while I'd swear I'd catch him out of the corner of my eye. He didn't seem to be blatantly following us at least, just always ending up in the same general vicinity, but I kept my eyes out even closer after the third time. I mean, the parks aren't that small, right? We decided to go back to the hotel room after the sun started to set. We were tired and wanted some couple time together. Coop was whispering romantic sweet nothings into my ear the entire shuttle ride back, right up against my ear so the other passengers couldn't hear. His voice resonated warmly in my chest, ever the romantic. I had just cuddled into him when the shuttle stopped to let on more passengers, and who do I see walking down the aisle? Charles. Same clothes, same towering form, same creepy stare. He noticed us immediately, and in about the time it took me to think, please don't sit by us, he sat down right next to us, of course. Seriously, what are the odds here? Coop launched into the friendly thing and started trying to chat with him. Oh, it's you! Small world, huh? <laughs> Enjoy the parks for the day? I wasn't really listening, though. I was too busy glancing from Coop over to Charles. I noticed that once again, Charles wasn't paying any attention to Coop at all, even as he gave vague answers to his questions. His eyes just centered straight on me. If I felt a little uncomfortable feeling his gaze from a distance away, being glared at from point-blank range made my stomach nearly roll out onto the floor. My heart nearly stopped when Charles cut Coop right off and said, I can do you better, pretty lady. I can tell you like it rough. What? I couldn't stop the anger in my voice. Coop immediately dropped the nice act and went off on the guy, telling him not to talk to me like that and to leave us alone or else. We were starting to attract attention now, but Charles didn't seem to care. He simply said, come to my room if you change your mind. He rattled off a room number in our same resort. Great. Just great. Hell no, I said. My finger hovered on the emergency stop button above our seat. I wanted off this bus. I felt red-hot angry, embarrassed, and sick. I could tell Cooper was feeling the same. Some woman with her kids looked at me from across the aisle, concern plain on her face. I raised my eyebrows in an I-don't-fucking-know way and pressed the button. The bus immediately came to a jerking stop. Coop and I leapt and ran out before Charles could even think about following. A security officer stopped by our room a short while later to ask us about the incident. Apparently, Charles went on a loud rant about how the pretty woman never see what he can offer and intimidated the other passengers to the point where the bus driver felt the need to call security and kick him out. They were even suggesting we submit a report to get him banned from Disney entirely, maybe even arrested on misconduct charges. Coop and I agreed. After all, the thought of him stalking another person felt awful. Even though he didn't do anything physically to me because we were always surrounded by people, the next girl who came alone might not have been so lucky. Regardless, Coop and I were still able to enjoy the rest of our honeymoon in the privacy of our own hotel room, and we never saw or heard anything about Charles ever again. I loved Disney's Dinosaur the Movie as a kid, and I mean I really loved it. I would watch it multiple times a week. Sometimes every night even when my summer vacations were in full swing. I would fall asleep to the sounds of dinosaurs roaring their ways through different environments, drawn into the suspense every time. So, when I learned that there was, in fact, a ride solely based on that movie at Disney World in Florida, and we were scheduled to go in just a few months around my 11th birthday, 
I was absolutely ecstatic. My mom would tell me later in life that I would not stop bouncing around the house for weeks on end. I'm sure it eventually got annoying for her and my older brother Zach, but at the time I was too lost in the moment to care. We were going to see those dinosaurs in the flesh, or as much in the flesh as an animatronic ride can allow. We arrived at our Disney resort in the middle of fall, just when it was starting to snow back home. But not so late that Florida was not still warm. I remember the heat blasting my face as we exited the airport, and the air conditioning in the shuttle bus right after honestly gave me whiplash. Zach just seemed to be bored on his way to the hotel, but I gazed out the window intently, looking through all the Mickey ears and coaster tracks and parade floats for anything scaled, anything that would hint to the reptiles I so dearly loved. You can imagine my disappointment when, as we were settling into bed that night, I learned the Animal Kingdom, in which the dinosaur ride was located, would be our very last day at the parks. That would mean my plan of riding it enough to get the full scope of what we were dealing with was now squashed. And I would probably only get to ride it once or twice anyhow, as Zack said the lines were ridiculously long. I lay dejected in my Disney-themed pajamas that night, staring at the combo of moonlight and security lights through the hotel blinds. It was like this over the coming week that I would come up with my own plan. Don't get me wrong, the rest of Disney was magical as well. We went to all the major sights and rides through each of the four parks, even water parks too. We got our photos taken with the numerous character icons perusing the streets. Even Zack started to lighten up too. I caught him grinning when a parade happened to go by, and being 15 years old, he would blush whenever a princess waved at him. By the third day, he took his hoodie down and didn't groan at all when Mom asked him to go on a ride with me. He and I had been growing distant for a couple of years due to our age gap, but I feel like that trip really took us back in time to when he would play with me like we used to. He really let his inner child come out, even grabbed his own set of Mickey ears before we left. Maybe that's why he didn't hesitate too much in going along with my plan later on. I let it slip as we were coming out of the Toy Story ride. The one where you shoot at stuff. Hey, Zack, I said, nudging his arm. Yeah? I want to ride that dinosaur ride tomorrow as much as I can. He looked at me thoughtful. I know you do, Bug. His old nickname for me, since I used to wear thick glasses that bugged out my eyes. His face then split into a grin, one that he had whenever coming up with a bit of mischief. Want to do something crazy? He knew I did. My plan was simple, but Zack made some additions that, years later, we both realized were really stupid. I wanted to sneak into the ride and slip away without my mom realizing. Zack proposed we duck under the seat so the ride operator would let us go as many times as we wanted, or find some way to loop around that wasn't getting back in line. Eventually, though, we landed on the most reckless idea yet, one that would definitely get us in trouble, or even banned from the entire area if we were caught. We'd sneak out of the ride near the end if it wasn't too fast, then find a way to slip back in from between the animatronics near the beginning. This way, you'll really get to see them up close, maybe even pet one, Zack teased as we brushed our teeth for bed. I grinned. Tomorrow, I would see these real-life dinosaurs as close as I could get, or we'd fail miserably. One of the two. The Animal Kingdom was just as awesome as the rest of the parks. We went on a jungle rescue, safari tours where the real animals could walk around as freely as though we were really on the plains, and even a prehistoric-themed cafe. We sat next to a moving baby mammoth as we ate. It was my favorite part of the day but I knew the best was still yet to come. I kept giving what I hoped were discreet winks at Zack across the table. I had no idea what was coming, though. Around late afternoon the next day, I was staring at a giant model of Aladar the Iguanodon outside the ride. The sun streamed red and yellow behind the trees, illuminating his scales and green eyes. 
While the line moved, we were greeted by two scientists in white lab coats on a projection screen, one sitting at a high-tech computer, while the other stood with a clipboard and pen. They gave us the whole spiel about our destination being the early Cretaceous period. They were going to be our guides while we traveled through time. Zack nudged my arm and I laughed. We boarded the ride, Zack and I in the middle and our mom in the row in front of us. We made sure to sit at the end so we could try and slip away easier. The ride itself was pretty amazing. I really enjoyed it. It all flew by though and seemed so short. I only got to feel a glimpse of everything by the end, and I could barely remember the events that happened, although that may have been because I was way too excited. I knew as we were stopping along the track that it was time to put my plan into action. Let's go! After checking that no one was looking, and our mom was lost in the crowd, we managed to slip out without anyone seeing, and onto the dark set. Zack, being a responsible older brother, held my hand to make sure I didn't trip or get myself hurt, until we got to a more lit section of the ride, right by one of those triceratopses, I think. I reached out and patted its spiked nose. It was rough and surprisingly warm. Its horns were really solid, too. It was a deep brown color. Its eyes looked dead while not lit up and moving. I moved on to pet most of the other smaller dinosaurs, taking in every detail, every scale pattern, even Aladar all the way at the back. Suddenly, a loud mechanical hiss sounded far down the cavernous ride. The workings under their skin began to twitch. Zack immediately put the pieces together and grabbed my hand. The ride's going again, hide! We dove into some plastic ferns and squeezed ourselves as far back as we could go praying that no one would see us as the cars went by. The music and roars of the dinosaurs were deafening. Zack covered his ears and hunched down, covering me with his black hoodie. I still remember the smell pressed against my nose. Mothballs. There was a carnotaur lit up in reds and blues snapping at the audience. That one quickly caught my eye. He would be the next one I looked at up close. I gazed over at the glistening yellow teeth and wondered what they'd feel like. I wondered if they were actually sharp, considering the ride was not actually supposed to bite anyone. After the ride quieted down again, I crawled my way over to the large animatronic and quickly made the biggest mistake of my life. I examined around the nose area, looked at the eyes, and wedged my hand into the gap between its teeth. Its mouth was rubbery and cold, and while the teeth weren't pointed, they still made my skin go numb after a minute of feeling around. I wanted to see how far I could actually go in. Would I be able to feel the back of a throat, or was it all just empty space and robotics? I ended up making the second biggest mistake of my entire life. I pushed my tiny arm into its mouth as far as I could possibly go. I managed to get it almost up to the shoulder before it started to hurt. It was an awkward angle. My arm was straightened slightly upward, and I had to brace myself against the animatronic to stand. Zack caught up with me and said he wanted to take some pictures to show his friends. He told me to make funny faces, as though the dinosaur was in the middle of eating me. I did, twisting myself to face the camera this way and that. All the while, my arm was in the gigantic mouth. When we were done, Zack said, All right, let's get out of here before it picks up again. I remember replying, but I found that I couldn't move. I pulled and pulled, but I couldn't get my arm out from between the rubber teeth. It had gotten stuck. My shoulder was really starting to hurt from the strain. As I twisted my arm around, I couldn't feel much except for pins and needles. I'd gone numb. I can't get it out, I said, my voice extremely small. Zack was starting to get annoyed. We're done. Come on, let's get out of here. I can't get it out, I said, louder this time. Zack, my arm's stuck. I never got to finish that sentence, though. The ride whirred to life, and something in the mechanical body shifted. The mouth clamped down over my arm. It dug into my skin. I could feel something sharp and mechanical jam into my hand inside its throat. There was no way I could describe the pain that followed. I screamed. I don't even really remember that much, except for something wet, warm, and sticky flowing down my arm. Zack told me sometime later that the animatronic had done a motion releasing my arm, but my hand was stuck in the mechanisms. 
He then told me he had to watch as I was picked up by my wrist and flung around extremely hard right as a car went by. I remember him screaming, oh my god, over and over. The ride instantly stopped. Zack came out of hiding, screaming for someone to help me. People were frantic. Someone tried to remove me from the thing's mouth, but a cast member stopped them, saying it would only make things worse. I was dangling limp and unconscious. Blood covered my shirt and caked the inside of the dinosaur's mouth. Zack said that was the scariest part, how much blood there was, and how I wasn't moving at all anymore. I woke up in the hospital hours later, with my mom and Zack right there. I had come away with a wrist broken in multiple places, a dislocated shoulder, and slicing off three of my fingers, but amazingly I was still alive. The doctor said to my mom that I was lucky that was all that happened. The flinging and the pressure on my arm could have caused much more damage, maybe even caused me to bleed out or sever an artery. She told me all she could do was nod and cry. Obviously, our big trip was cut short. Zack and I were grounded more than we'd ever been before after we got home, and my injury slowly healed over time. I obviously have some major motor issues in that hand, but otherwise I get around okay. Although I still love the movie, I had to go into another room whenever the Carnotaur showed up on screen. I just couldn't look at them anymore. I'm a lot older nowadays and look back on that incident as a cautionary tale. In theme parks, even places like Disney, those rules to stay inside the vehicle are there for a reason. I grew up a military brat in San Diego, California. My dad was in the Marine Corps for 25 years, eventually reaching the rank of gunnery sergeant. Before he retired in 2011, I'm really proud of him and I love him very much, but I won't sugarcoat it at all. Growing up with a parent in the military was not easy. He wasn't home much, and when he was, he was something of a disciplinarian. I didn't have nearly as much freedom as some of my friends did, but that was just as much of a boon as it was a burden. It really helped me to stay on track at school and gave me the means to get into a good college later on in life. Without a doubt, though, the worst part of him being in the Marine Corps was when he had to go away to war. Although he wasn't part of the initial invasion force, my dad was deployed in Iraq in June of 2003. I was 11 years old at the time, and it really sucked having to say goodbye to him, no matter how much he tried to reassure us he would be okay. I was old enough to be acutely aware that that might be the last time we ever got to talk to him, the last time I ever got to hug him, the last time I'd ever get to see him alive. Needless to say, the next six months were some of the most stressful of my entire life, Every little news report I saw on TV gave me the worst anxiety. Every time we got news a serviceman had died over there, I feared for the worst. Mom tried to shield us as best she could, but at the risk of sounding a little full of myself, I was smart, inquisitive, and sensitive as a kid, and she could only do so much to keep me from worrying. So it was that in September of 2003, Mom decided to take me to Disneyland for the weekend to take my mind off of things. To be honest, it was exactly what I needed. I was hugely into Disney when I was a kid, and although I'd been over to Disneyland a few times before, being so stressed around the house meant seeing it again was like doing so through fresh eyes. I took pictures with as many of the characters as I could, and each ride me and my mom went on seemed to alleviate my anxiety and depression that much more. The whole first day was going wonderfully well. That was until we got in line to ride the Big Thunder Mountain Railroad. I'm pretty sure it was at about 11.30 by the time we got into the little rail cars for the ride itself. Everything was going smoothly at first. We were speeding along all the twists and turns, till we hit the little fake desert setup, and then an incline into a dark tunnel. I just remember feeling this jolting sensation shake the cars, all while we were in the dark. 
then this horrible grinding of metal and a thud before the people in cars in front of us started screaming and everything came to a sudden stop. Everyone was really shaken up from this. But then I heard some of the worst things I've ever heard before in my life. This woman started calling out, Mark? Mark, wake up! We were all mostly in the dark, but there was a little bit of light coming from the openings of the tunnel on each side of us. I remember seeing how some of the cars weren't even on the tracks anymore. The cars in front of us were all wet and shiny, with some kind of fluid. I would only realize later it was someone's blood. In the moments after the rail cars came to a stop, people started clambering out of them and walking down the tunnel as fast as they could, calling that someone was hurt really bad and we needed help up there as soon as possible. My mom climbed out of the rail car and followed. I could see that the train car thing at the very front of the coaster had derailed and the rear of the thing had mounted the car behind it. It was only then that I realized that whoever was in the car just behind it would have taken the full force of that thing as we sped up that incline. There were also people in the cars ahead of us who were trapped by it, stuck in the rail cars and unable to get out because of the way they were positioned in the tunnel. Thankfully, me and my mom weren't trapped, so we could just get out of there. I think it took another half hour before firefighters could get them all out, so paramedics could treat them before taking them to the hospital. All the people that could get out were herded off by park staff toward the River Bell Terrace, where a medical treatment area had been set up. Like I said, me and my mom were mostly okay, just a little shaken up from the whole thing. But there were people with some very serious injuries who had not been so lucky. We later found out the guy at the very front who'd been in the first car had actually died. It's horrendously tragic that someone should lose their life when all they wanted to do was go to Disneyland and have a bit of fun on a few roller coasters. I know it's kind of messed up for me to think like this, but we got really lucky that day. Way more people could have died. Honestly, I was really surprised to find out that only a single person lost their life in that incident. At least half the riders on the coaster could have been killed from the way that train straight up mounted the cars behind it. Since that day, I've never ever ridden a roller coaster, and theme parks in general just kind of creep me out now. I know they're super fun, and I hope I'll get past my fear of them one day, but for the time being, I'm more than happy to just avoid them and stay safe. Even the sound of people screaming on them reminds me of Big Thunder Mountain, and the way that woman just kept screaming for her husband or son or whoever it was to wake up, and they never did. Back in 1999, I used to work at Disney World down in Orlando, Florida. I was a custodian, which is really just Disney World's fancy way of saying janitor. We mostly worked when the park was closed. We'd clean the place up, empty the trash, and treat all the water features around the park with cleaning chemicals to keep them from getting stagnant and smelly. There was also a little guest interaction involved too though, including things like giving directions, helping guests plan their day, and answering the millions of questions they'd have about the park. I suppose that means the job was 70% janitor and 30% walking information point. There were major perks, but there were huge downsides as well. I'd get disgruntled guests coming up to me and complaining about the stormy weather, as it meant some of the rides were closed down for a few hours. I'd have to deal with that by just smiling and nodding and sympathizing, but sometimes I swear it was like they wanted me to clap my hands and magically make the clouds disappear from above our heads. It was like they imagined I had the power to do anything. Like, it's not my fault you chose to visit Disney World during a freaking hurricane season, dude. Make better choices in the future. I also had to deal with lost children a few times, too. I had to take valuable items to the lost and found in Main Street, which was pretty fun, as it meant you could really wander throughout the Magic Kingdom on your way to the lost and found. And that was one of the good things about being a custodian. You're allowed to walk all over the place within reason. For instance, if a guest wanted directions to Space Mountain, I could walk them over to Tomorrowland 
instead of just telling them how to get there. This worked well when trying to communicate with guests who didn't speak much English. I had a lot of good times during that job. The whole team was like one big family. But I suppose that's why what I'm about to tell you happens to be probably the worst thing that's ever happened in my entire life. It still kind of messes me up even 21 years later. So this happened on the second weekend in the February of 1999. The actual park opened at 11 a.m., so we used to spend the first two or three hours of our shifts basically doing cosmetic cleans, testing rides, and making sure the park was ready to go for the day. The morning section of my shift involved helping out with the cleaning and prepping in Tomorrowland. At one point, I'm walking through the park, and I see this guy up on the platform for the Skyway in Fantasyland. He's sweeping away, whistling to himself, generally being the cheerful guy that he was. Ray was in his 60s at the time, and he had already been with us for like a year. Everyone liked him a lot. He was older than most of us, but he was super chilled out and friendly, always willing to help out his fellow cast members. Like I said, we were one big family. We worked together, we partied together, some of us even lived together. I called up to him. Morning, Ray Ray. He smiled down at me, returned the greeting, and waved a little before going back to his sweeping. It was a beautiful morning. Everyone was in a good mood. It was another day in paradise. In my mind, at least. So I'm walking toward Tomorrowland for a few more minutes, when I hear this slow electric whirring sound above my head. It was the sound of the Skyway starting up as the four-person gondola started moving along the track. I still felt terrible that it took me as long as it did to realize what was so wrong about this situation. It was a Sunday morning, and I was pretty tired already and slightly hungover from having gone out drinking the night before with a few of the other cast members. Honestly, it took me a while to stop blaming myself for not having prevented what happened next, because I always figured if I'd been just a little bit sharper, I'd have been able to really help out. Then it hits me, though. The gondolas are moving pretty fast on their first test loop, and Ray was still up on the platform. Someone had switched the Skyway on, without checking to make sure if it was clear or not. I started running back the way I'd walk following the platform the Skyway was on, and hoping I'd catch up to Ray before the gondola reached him. I was running as fast as I could, trying to catch up with the lead gondola, but I just couldn't seem to close the distance in time. I looked up and saw Ray whistling away to himself with his back toward the gondolas, not seeing them at all. They were quickly approaching. I started shouting to him and trying to warn him before the gondola knocked him off the Skyway platform, which was 60 feet up in the air. He heard me and turned around, obviously horrified to see that someone had turned on the Skyway before checking to see if it was clear. He had a mix of anger and fear in his voice as he turned back around and started moving as quickly as he could away from the gondola. He just couldn't move fast enough, though. The thing caught up with him quickly. It didn't knock him off right away. He grabbed onto the gondola and tried to pull himself inside of it to stop himself from falling, but he just didn't have enough strength. All of a sudden, I'm watching him dangling from the thing, in danger of falling the whole 60 feet onto the concrete below. I'm just shouting up to him, Hang on, Ray, just hang on! There was nothing I could do. I had to watch him struggle to hold on to that gondola as it moved along the skyway, knowing it was only a matter of time before he lost his grip and fell. I could see Ray looking over his shoulder, down at the ground below every so often, I'll never forget that look of absolute terror on his face, or that feeling of pure helplessness as I watched this whole thing unfold. Then the gondola started passing over these flower beds instead of just pure concrete. I figured the soil and plants would have been a better option to fall onto. It had to be. I started shouting, Jump, Ray! Jump into the flower beds! Let go! I don't know if he deliberately let go or just lost his grip but he fell the whole 60 feet down and landed with an audible thump in the flower beds below him. Watching him fall was like slow motion. He seemed to fall so slowly, but I guess that's just because it was such a long way to fall. 
He was in a bad, bad way when I reached him. He wasn't moving at all. He laid there among the flowers, glassy-eyed, wheezing and groaning in agony. In the moment before I ran off to get help, I saw him spit up blood onto his bottom lip and chin. I was in tears by the time I found another cast member to help, begging them to call 911 so we could get an ambulance out as fast as possible. Emergency services got there less than 20 minutes later. They carried Ray out of the park on a stretcher before driving him over to Orlando Regional Medical Center. We all prayed that he'd be okay. It brought us a great deal of hope that he'd actually landed on the flower beds and not straight onto concrete, which would have definitely killed anyone who had fallen that far. Unfortunately, a few hours later, we got word that he hadn't made it. His injuries were so bad that he passed away, despite all the hospital staff had tried to do for him. The fall had caused too much trauma, too much internal bleeding. He had slipped away before they'd even operated on him to drain the blood from his lungs. We were all absolutely devastated to have lost such a cheerful, charming, and dedicated man. Ray made all our days just that little bit brighter, and it would be impossible to really ever replace him. I felt for his family. I felt for his friends. I really felt for the cast member who had turned on the gondolas before making sure the skyway was clear. Technically, Ray should have been done with his sweeping by that time in the morning, but like I said, he was dedicated and the kind of guy who didn't finish a job until it was properly done. And the person who turned on the skyway, whose name I won't mention, was completely inconsolable, so much that they had to be put on leave before they eventually quit. They blamed themselves for Ray's death, saying they should have checked the cameras, done a walk around to make sure the platform was clear. It was no one's fault, though. I've come to terms with that. It was a simple breakdown of communication. It could have happened to anyone. It wasn't my fault, it wasn't Ray's fault, and it wasn't the operator's fault. It was a horrible twist of fate. Everyone that could get time off attended Ray's funeral. We all wanted to be there for his family as best we could, to assure them their husband and father was one of the best men we'd ever known. Ray was the first cast member to die in the park in over 10 years. A little memorial was put up backstage for him, so we could all remember him at his best, with a smile on his face, instead of scared and broken. Rest in peace, Raymond Barlow. We love you, and we miss you every single day. It's every kid's dream to go to Disney World, right? It's a dream a lot of American kids never get to have come true, let alone British ones. So I always felt extremely fortunate and privileged that my parents were not only financially capable of taking our family over to Florida for a couple of weeks, but also that they could actually put aside the time to do something like that. In all likelihood, they probably didn't want to. I mean, no offense to anyone that does, but what kind of actual grown-up wants to spend all their time queuing up for rides and baking in the hot sun after paying for overpriced churros and chocolate sauce? That's not even touching on the pure scam that kind of stuff can be. You remember Disney dollars? But my parents relented to mine and my sister's pleas to take us all the way across the Atlantic to arguably the craziest state in the Union. Florida. This happened a long time ago, back in 1998, so excuse me if I misremember any of the smaller details about the park itself. I remember the year pretty clearly, though, because the game StarCraft had just come out. I was fortunate enough to pick up a copy in the US before it was even commercially available in the UK. To a ten-year-old like me, Florida was the land of the lost or something. I mean, it had actual dinosaurs, i.e. alligator farms where you could feed the big old beasts with hunks of meat, something I was way too scared to do myself. I was happy to watch my dad do it, though, before he scampered away down the wooden walkway like he was regressing into a childlike state of pure primal fear. It was the land of Tropicana, where food proportions dwarfed those in the UK. The grass and trees were different and fantastical, so much so that I might as well have landed in an alien world. 
It was also the home of the most magical place in the entire universe, Disney World. It was during our third and final day trip to Disney World, though, that something happened I didn't properly understand until I was a great deal older. In the truth of the event, my parents tried their best to shield me and my little sister from. So, this is how it happened. I remember we were in the Animal Kingdom part of the park. I was always really interested in natural history when I was growing up, so I was particularly excited to see this portion of Disney World. I was incredibly happy and excited to be there. Of course, I'd had to wait three whole days at Disney before we finally got to see this particular part of it. Every other kid seemed to be just as happy as I was. As we got off the shuttle bus out at the park, I remember seeing this one little girl with her dad, who looked uncharacteristically miserable for a kid who had the good fortune to be visiting Disney World. I mean, there's always one moody kid out of the bunch though, isn't there? One who never seems to have any fun no matter what's happening around them. Honestly, as confused as I was about her, I forgot the sight pretty quickly. My own excitement was overwhelming me at seeing my favorite Disney film animals, like Mustafa from The Lion King. Go figure, I was on a buzz throughout the entire day. Whether we were on the rides or on the safari tour thing, or eating at one of the cafes, I'd constantly see this little girl and her dad. She looked consistently exhausted and unhappy. I found myself staring to the point where my mom and dad had to warn me to stop staring at other kids because it was rude. I knew they were right, of course. It was rude to stare. Besides, this girl seemed awfully upset for some reason. Surely seeing me staring at her would only make it worse. A little while later, I remember walking along drinking one of those ginormous zillion ounce sodas or whatever. Happy as Larry, when I see that little girl and her dad in front of us again. I'm not going to pretend to be all like I knew something was wrong or that I sensed it, because I didn't at all. One thing that struck me as kind of odd about this whole thing at the time, though. One thing did kind of strike me as odd, though. By the time I was 10, I hated holding my mom or dad's hand. That was what babies did. This girl didn't seem to be all that keen on holding her dad's hand either, and at one point even tried to shake it loose, but he kept on holding her. At one point, he even started to grip her wrist and telling her to behave. I found this kind of distressing. I looked up at my dad as if to be like, Are you seeing this? half expecting to be told to stop staring again. Both of my parents looked very concerned about what was going on, though. I didn't dare to say anything. I was old enough to know that some kids misbehave sometimes, and people around had that kind of cringy, pretend-it's-not-happening kind of feeling about them. Only, instead of calming down, the little girl burst into tears and started wailing, I want my mommy over and over all while the guy was trying his best to calm her down. I'll get you to mommy soon, sweetie. All this other stuff he was saying, too. What happened next is kind of a blur in my memory. There was a lot of commotion around. This is how my dad tells the story from his perspective, though. Apparently, while the little girl was waiting, my dad heard her blatantly say, I want my dad. Where is my dad? The way he tells it, the mood in the crowd around us visibly shifted. It became obvious that this guy who had been taking her around the park was not her father. No one knew how to actually act on this revelation for the first few moments or so, and for good reason. Maybe the guy was an uncle or a family friend, a legal guardian or a caretaker. There was nothing inherently insidious about it, until the guy snapped back at her in a way that was distinctly unparental. Some other American dad walked up to him. Is there a problem, buddy? The guy was quick to calm the situation down by telling them the girl was just having a temper tantrum. When someone asked the guy if he was actually the girl's dad, he replied yes he was, again trying to reassure the gathering crowd that everything was okay and she was just having a tantrum. The next part I remember pretty clearly though. The girl shouted something before the man clamped his hand over her mouth so hard it sounded like a slap. My mom started pulling me and my sister away from the scene. It was starting to turn ugly, like really ugly, really fast. 
According to my dad's version of the story, what the girl had screamed before the guy tried to shut her up was that he wasn't her dad at all. Not only that, but he had taken her away from her dad. All kinds of people started rushing forward, and my view was blocked off. There was shouting and moving. I remember seeing this tubby woman shoving her way through the crowd of people with that same little girl in her arms, who by that point was sobbing uncontrollably. A crowd had formed around the man, and it began to sway and shift. There were shouts and screams. I mean, the kind of screams that were so intense and frightening, they made me shake and shiver in fear. My little sister was bursting into tears, too. By the time Park Security showed up, who ten-year-old me assumed were the police, the crowd began to disperse. I distinctly remember seeing the man who had taken the little girl from God knows where, pinned on the ground with someone on top of him. That's the thing I remember most crystal clear to this day. A lot of my memory has been filled in with my mom and dad's retelling of the event, but the image of that guy's rage, how it twisted up his facial features, is still burned into my mind. It's been made all the more sinister by the fact I now know what he was so angry about. He'd taken that little girl and kept her pliant because he'd promised her a trip around Disneyland. She was probably so keen to go that she hadn't fought back. God knows what he was intending to do with her afterward. Luckily, that chance was taken away from him by a bunch of do-gooders. At least that's the way I imagine he thought of it playing out. It's sick. His long game of lulling his prey into a false sense of security before he finally had his way with her. Not that I realized any of this at the time. To a ten-year-old, it was all just one big mess of confusion and fear. I knew that whatever was going on was very, very wrong. We have no idea what happened to the man or the little girl after. No one spoke of it again for the rest of the holiday. I'm pretty sure it was almost five or six years before one of them brought it up with me and explained exactly what the situation had been. As far as I knew, all I'd seen was a dad mistreating his daughter, who'd then been arrested for it. Even to this day, it still screws with my head that one of the most horrid things I ever witnessed happened in what was billed as the happiest place on earth, and if things had gone just a bit differently, that girl could have been a corpse or worse just a few days later, and nobody would be any the wiser. Thank God she had the courage to speak up when she did. And thank God there were good people around that reacted the way they did too. Because I don't even want to imagine the alternative. So a few summers ago, the old ball and chain and I took the kids down to Florida for a week or so so they could visit Disney World. It was a win-win situation. It would actually stop hounding us to take them there, while us grown-ups could soak up for a while in the tropics. A whole seven days to experience what an actual summer feels like. Don't get me wrong, I love my native state of Maine, but the only thing scarier than a Stephen King book is the weather there. As the saying goes, don't like the weather in New England? All you gotta do is wait a minute. So, we're down in Orlando for the week, and the arrangement is that we'll spend three days at Disney World, with a day on either side where the grown-ups will do fairly grown-up things together. So we're walking around the city, seeing some sights, baking in the Florida sunshine. I get the one thing I'd really been after, which was a huge Cuban sandwich. And the kids are being corralled by their mother, while I'm trailing behind trying not to pass out from ingesting my body's weight in pork, bread, and cheese. At one point, my wife needed to use the bathroom, so I was in charge of keeping an eye on the kiddos. She ran off to find somewhere that had let her use the restroom without making her open her purse. Now, admittedly, this is where I fell short of being my best as a father. I found a bench nearby and sat my ass down on it. I told the kids to stay where I could see them, which, since I shut my eyes and started sunbathing like the disgusting, greasy lizard person I was, was a little bit redundant. Next thing I know, I was just about to doze off when I kind of jerked out of my haze. I had to check on what the kids were doing. I get up and look around. I see my son halfway down the street, 
talking to some guy dressed up as Mickey Mouse. I knew that characters appeared outside the parks on occasion, but all the way downtown in Orlando, I was a little bit confused, but more relieved than anything. They hadn't disappeared into thin air at least, which would have ruined more than just a vacation. I can tell you that much. I'm walking towards old Mickey when I started to realize there was something not quite right about him. The Mickeys in the park were all super animated, having theatrical movements to keep the kitties entertained. This one was anything but. While my kids were basically dancing around him, wicked excited to see him outside the park, Mickey was just kind of staring at them, almost like Mickey Mouse had taken a few Mickey pills. Sorry, that's a dad joke. Comes with the territory, I'm afraid. It's only as I started to get closer, though, that I really started to see how this particular Mickey here wasn't just acting wrong, he looked wrong too. It wasn't just that, the shape and color of his copyright dodging costume was all off kilter. It was pretty damn filthy too. I mean, I get those things must not be the easiest thing in the world to wash and clean, like I'm pretty sure the head won't fit in a washer dryer or something, but this thing was covered in dirt and old stains. It was seriously gross. I dread to think about what that thing must have smelled like on the inside. Look, I'm not a total jerk. I understood, or at least thought I understood, what the deal was. This guy was in a knockoff suit. No one in a financially stable situation chooses to wear stinky old Mickey the Rat costumes or whatever, and parades themselves around downtown Orlando. I figured this was a dude half-exhausted and heat-stroked looking to make money by taking photos with the kids or something. I reached into my wallet and went to hand him a 20. The guy just kinda looked at me. Or rather, the guy didn't, the head did, which I didn't anticipate. It was so creepy, this pair of big, black, lifeless eyes just staring me down from a few feet away. It seriously rustled my jimmies. I kind of thrust the 20 in his general direction. Like, hey dude, come on, take the money already. The guy actually tilted his head at me, like he was in a well-rehearsed horror movie scene or something. I responded by putting the 20 back in my wallet so as to not offend him any further. I called my kids back to me. Their mom was probably wondering just where in the world we'd gotten to. Of course, they were all like, Oh, come on, Dad, can't we play with Mickey a little more? Well, Mickey goes back to staring at them, which obviously was making me super uncomfortable now. I insisted in my best stern dad voice that they would do as they're told right now, or I'd be telling their mom on them. She's the tough one after all. As they went to walk away, Mickey reached out to try and grab my seven-year-old son. Red line crossed right there. Don't touch the kids unless I know you. I stepped up to the guy and stated that he had no right to lay a hand on my kids, especially not in that fake Mickey suit. The man just took to staring at me again. The whole time he'd not made a single sound. I took both my kids by the hand, who were getting pretty distressed at this point, since Dad was being mean to Mickey. Mickey wasn't exactly being his cheerful self either. I made a show of apologizing to the man for being curt with him then tried to make it one of those teachable moments as I walked away with my kids, making it clear to them that no adult is allowed to touch them without their express permission, and that strangers are most definitely not allowed to touch them, even if it's Mickey. Always tell mom and dad if they do. Then, though, I made the mistake of looking over my shoulder, where I see old Mickey is still staring at me, and somehow managing to be even creepier than before. That night, I just couldn't sleep. I was not used to how humid Florida would be. Our motel room's air conditioner had been very well behaved all week, but picked that night of all nights to start malfunctioning. Thank God the kids' room's unit was still working hard, but ours not so much. I ended up getting out of bed and sitting at the little table in the kitchenette where I drank a glass of something. I was just trying my best to cool down so I could get back to sleep. We had the flight home the next day, so I needed to be as sharp as possible so I didn't screw up and lose the boarding passes or whatever. Just so you know, the motel we were staying at was all bungalows, single-story units in a horseshoe shape. 
The one we were staying in happened to face the highway outside. I took a walk over to the window and took one final look at the floor. I walked over to the window and took one final look at the floor tonight. I loved vacationing here. I totally understood why it's the retiree's destination of choice. As I'm looking out through the blinds, though, I see something out there that made my jaw drop. Standing outside, silhouetted by the streetlights as still as a statue, over near the highway, was an obvious Mickey Mouse shape. The circular ears, the oversized hands, the whole works. I actually said no fucking way out loud. The realization hit me that knockoff Mickey Mouse Man from Orlando had somehow figured out where we were staying. Okay, so I had no idea how he managed to work that out. It's something I still think about from time to time. The only concrete thing I can imagine in my mind is that when not wearing that suit, he could have looked just like anyone, so maybe he followed us all the way back to the motel on foot, or in a car or something. I'd have no idea we were even being stalked by the same person. Like I said though, we left Florida the next day, and I only talked to the cops down there one time. I have absolutely no definite answers on how that guy found us, so I found myself rushing back to the kitchenette to grab a knife from the drawer, which might seem like an overreaction to some of you, but I can't overstate the fear I was feeling at that moment. Something happens when you're a dad. Something where you're not willing to roll the dice with your kid's safety. So whatever was about to happen, there was no way I was going into it with just my fists. Knife in hand, I rushed back to the window and looked out to see that no one was there anymore. Note that I say no one and not nothing, because lying in the parking lot about a hundred meters closer to the motel room was the entire knockoff Mickey Mouse costume just lying there on the tarmac. I was staring at the damn thing in terror for a moment. This guy had stripped off his costume in 15 seconds and was now nowhere to be seen. What happened next is literally something out of a horror movie. I'm checking the peripheries of the parking lot, trying to spot this guy, when boom, he pops up right in front of the window and bangs his head onto the glass. Yes, his actual head. It was so hard I thought it would knock the entire pain out whole. I almost had a heart attack right there. Whatever yelping scream I made when the guy appeared immediately woke up the wife and kids. I told the missus to get in the kid's room and lock the door behind her and call the cops as well, after which a few terrified questions pertaining to what was going on came. This window pane must have been made out of security glass or something, because this guy, who by the way was now completely naked from head to toe, just couldn't seem to break it no matter what he threw at it. His fists, his forehead, whatever it was just boomed and shook the frame. The whole time I was waving my knife at him and shouting that the cops were on the way. He switched his attention to the door, trying to bash it open. As I rushed over to the kid's room and asked my wife if the cops had sent anyone yet, I heard her respond with yes. By the time I got back to the window, the banging had stopped and the empty Mickey suit was gone from the parking lot. I watched that parking lot until I saw the blue flashing lights approaching, and only then was I really able to breathe properly. I gave statements to the cops who arrived, and told them all about the earlier interaction I had with the man. I figured it would be pretty easy for them to find the guy who was butt naked, if he didn't have this huge Mickey Mouse suit on. But like I said, it wasn't like we were there for much longer. The next day, we caught the plane back home to Maine, and back to reality. I had to get on the phone to Orlando police to see if there had been any developments at all, which, to my surprise, there hadn't been. There hadn't been a single arrest relating to the incident that night, despite having questioned several Disney cast members, both current and formal. I know that might seem like a really anticlimactic way to end such a story. No one was caught, nothing was resolved, and I have absolutely no relevatory or illuminating piece of info to share with you. No twists like, oh god, the call was coming from inside the house or something. That really is where the story ends. The guy found us, he terrorized us, and then we left Florida. 
I suppose I can end it by saying I'm looking forward to going back at some point when the kids are older, and they have no interest in going to Disneyland, but definitely not anytime soon, and definitely not to downtown Orlando. A few years ago, my brother-in-law bought another apartment complex in Florida. He owns a few of them in West Palm Beach and Miami, so when he told me he bought another one and wanted me to manage it, I figured, why the hell not? I just graduated college with my degree and planned to go out and get my master's as well. I figured I could manage his place and do graduate school. When he booked my flight to Orlando, I was stoked as hell. Yes, I love Disney, and I dreamed about buying a year pass and checking out all the neat parks. When I got there, we drove out to Orlando, and I had a bad feeling. He bought the apartment in a town called Leesburg. It's only about an hour from Orlando. It's as if a biker town and a retirement community had a baby together. I was a little disappointed that I was an hour away from Orlando, with its nightlife and clubs and whatnot. I made it work, though. I soon started to settle into life there, managing the small apartment complex. I had my own one-bedroom apartment in the corner. Then there were ten other tenants. Most were older folks, snowbirds and retirees that spent their days golfing and swimming in the pool. There were two military families there, one with small kids, and then there was Andy. Andy was an enormous man. I'm a pretty big guy myself, six foot and around 250 pounds. He was at least six foot four and 400 plus pounds. He was absolutely gigantic. He walked with a cane and had long black hair, which he'd pulled into a ponytail. He worked from home, or so he said. There was a rumor, though, that he was on disability after a horrific work accident. That wasn't exactly something I felt it was my place to pry into. As long as he paid his rent on time and was peaceful and kept to himself, I was just fine with whatever he wanted to do. I was only in his place once, when his AC cut out by surprise. I actually found out that he was pretty neat. There was no food containers or beer cans lying around, like you might expect a big guy with a beer belly like him to have. Things were all neatly organized and it was a pretty nice space. Our complex was relatively peaceful for the next year, until one night in November. It was raining like it always does in Florida. It was about midnight when someone rang my doorbell. I looked out and saw one of my tenants there, Joseph. Old Joe was one of my retirees who'd retired in Florida to, in his words, play golf and drink beer. Normally, he was all smiles and jokes. But that night, his face was completely pale and he looked absolutely frightened. I hate to bother you, Sam, but something's not right with Andy. I put on my jacket and followed him to the apartment, since Andy was his neighbor. He put his finger to his lip and motioned for me to listen in. I put my ear up to the door, and I could hear Andy fighting with someone. It sounded like whoever he was fighting with was also throwing things around. I was a bit taken aback. He'd never had a guest over since the entire year I'd known him. I knocked and heard him stomp over to the door. He opened it very normally. Normally, he was very well-dressed and put together. Like I said, he was not a messy guy at all. This time, though, he answered in a t-shirt with grease stains all over. His hair was limp and greasy, and he reeked of B.O. As I looked behind him, I could see the inside was a complete disaster. I asked him if everything was alright. He was irritated and told me it was, then shut the door in my face. I sent Joe back to his place and told him to let me know if he heard anything else, then went to bed. There wasn't much I could really do in this situation. The next morning, I decided to pay Andy a visit to see if he was okay. I went to his place and knocked on the door, but there was no answer. I decided I would try again later. I got busy doing other things, though, and forgot to do it. So, December rolled around. 
I was starting to gather all the monthly rent checks, but there was none from Andy. That got me a bit worried. He was always on time before, so I knocked on his door. There was still nothing. I knocked again. I heard the guy grunting and moaning now. Maybe I should have called the police first, but instead I opened the door with my emergency key ring. I was hit with the foulest smell I'd ever smelled. It was like shit, vomit, and death were all rolled into one singular nasty thing. The walls were all streaked with what I could only assume was shit, and the place was trashed. I started to call Andy while typing 911 on the phone. I could hear the moaning coming from the back room. What I saw that day, I can never unsee. I sometimes still get flashbacks. Andy was lying naked on the floor of his room, on a pile of dirty clothes. He was covered with his own excrement and piss, and there were puddles of vomit everywhere. What was the absolute worst, though, was that he was covered in bites. There were human bites all over his arms and legs, and they were starting to smell of infection. He was also bleeding from his rectum. I wondered who had attacked him. Was it the person we heard him fighting with? I didn't get my answer then. He had to be rushed to the hospital and was fighting for his life in the ICU. The doctor spoke to his sister, who turned out to be his medical guardian, and things slowly started to come into place. Turns out Andy did that all to himself. He suffered from multiple mental disorders. He'd stopped taking his meds the month before November. There was no other person that night. He was arguing with himself. Those bites, he inflicted them on himself. The bleeding from his rectum was from inserting a foreign object in there and doing so much damage he ruptured his own internal organs. He ended up pulling through in the end and went back home to live with his sister. I had the task of cleaning up his apartment. What I found while cleaning freaks me out the same as finding him lying there that day. He had this old shoebox full of cutouts from magazines. Old family photos, even photos he'd taken of residents of the apartments, including myself. All of the eyes were burnt out with cigarettes. On some of them, X's were put over the mouths as well. I'm not sure if that was all part of his mental decline, or if he had always been that way and I just never noticed it. All I can hope for is that Andy got the help he needed, and is in a better state now than he was before. I travel pretty regularly, so I don't really struggle with anxiety nor anything about flying. I really quite enjoy it, actually. That being said, Flight 72 from New York City to Istanbul in 2012 was easily the scariest experience of my life. We departed from JFK early evening. I want to say about 5 or 6. It was a 10.5 hour flight. A couple of things for background. My plan was to eat the provided dinner, wait a little bit, take the sleeping pills I'd brought, and pass out. Hopefully wake up an hour before landing, and avoid all the monotony that goes with long flights. The other thing to note was that this was not a nice plane. It looked old, it felt old, and it was rickety. It had that old plane smell too. Okay, so everything was going to plan so far. We were about three or four hours into the flight. I had the dinner, took my pills, and was just starting to fade out when I noticed two things. One, the screens throughout the cabin that depicted the flight path in our current location were off. Last I looked, it had shown us a ways off the coast near the middle of the Atlantic. It felt like we were periodically dropping altitude as well. It was odd, because it felt controlled. It wasn't like a big constant drop. Just every few minutes, you could sense we were being lowered bit by bit leveling off intermittently. This sort of piqued my interest enough to shake off the drowsiness that was coming on. I wasn't really nervous at this point, though, just curious as to what was going on. I don't think many people on the plane had any idea about anything unusual. That was until we heard over the intercom that we needed to make an unscheduled landing. Flight attendants prepared the cabin. 
That got people's attention, obviously. My first thought was unscheduled landing. Where? We're in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. I was sitting in the middle of the cabin, where the flight attendant station is, and the jumper seats they sit on, so it was easy for me to lean over and try to chat with one of them. I asked if they had any more information. If they knew where we were going to land or what was going on. The two flight attendants replied they didn't have any more information than we did. So, this sort of quiet anxiety now existed within the cabin. People were chatting quietly between themselves, and everyone was looking around out the windows. It was a clear night. We were over the ocean. All you could see for miles around was water. The screens were down, and we were continuing this sort of periodic descent. Ten minutes passed by, when the captain came on and essentially repeated the same message. Still no more information from the flight attendants. There was this ten-minute pattern of repeating the same message and the word descent, with only the Atlantic Ocean to be seen out the window. I had no idea what to think about all this. Even the flight attendants themselves seemed anxious now. I specifically asked them if it was an emergency landing, if the plane was malfunctioning, but they couldn't confirm or deny anything. Let me just add, though, that the flight attendants were phenomenal for the whole process. They were very patient, very helpful, and I could tell they legitimately didn't have any answers we were looking for. They did a wonderful job of keeping everyone calm and stopping them from panicking. That being said, now the pilot gets on the line and repeats the message, only this time saying we're making an emergency landing. We couldn't have been more than a few thousand feet above the Atlantic at this point. Our descent had continued this whole time. I didn't have the perspective to see forward, obviously. But on both sides of the plane, all I could see was the ocean. There was a palpable anxiety in the cabin, including myself. I always wondered how much that sleeping pill I took coincidentally helped me to calm down in that moment. With how high my adrenaline level was, it certainly wasn't helping me sleep at all. At this point, we were getting closer and closer to the ocean. It looked like we were going to crash land. My heart was thumping in my chest. I got my phone out and started drafting a text to my wife to tell her I loved her, on the small chance it would somehow send. Not sure what I was thinking at that very last moment, though. Nearing the ground, I could see the small light of some fishing boat, then the lights from land. As we touched down on land, everyone clapped and yelled in joy, and let out a huge sigh of relief. The pilot got on and said there was a malfunction with the plane. We had made an emergency landing in Newfoundland. It was on a tiny island called Stevensville. I came to find out later there had been an electrical malfunction in the cockpit, and the instrumentation for the pilot was completely inaccurate. He was essentially flying the plane with very limited instrumentation, manual and flying blind. This explains the weird descent pattern he was doing, bit by bit, as he tried to figure out where to land. When it happened over the Atlantic, he had the choice between trying to make it to Iceland or turning back and trying Newfoundland, and chose the latter. I learned that generally, they try to plan flight paths across the Atlantic in a sort of arm shape just in case situations like this do happen, so the pilot has multiple options. In this case, I'm certainly glad he was such a skilled person. I had the chance to talk with him later on in the evening. He wouldn't go into much detail about what happened, but I assumed he would have told me that this was a routine kind of thing. That seasoned pilot probably saved a lot of lives that day, including mine. Beyond all that, though, what happened over the next 8 to 10 hours is another crazy story in itself. But still, that time with those crazy descents were some of the worst and most terrifying times in my life. I'm extremely glad I made it out alive. So I grew up as a middle-class suburban dweeb middle son in a waspy family in a mostly stable home, like many such children. I was left to my own devices quite a bit. When the first modem made its way into the house, along with AOL, 
I was hooked on chat rooms immediately. That was a pretty momentous occasion for me. Let me explain. I was a very sexually curious child. Therefore, in my teens, I was already desperate for it, despite not knowing what that actually meant. There wasn't really an outlet for all this, though. That mostly meant me spending huge amounts of time alone in my room, thinking abstractly about the topic of sex. When chat rooms became available, that entered the equation. It gave me a wealth of people to talk to about the topic. I basically became addicted. I would lurk in sexually explicit chat rooms for hours on end. After years of being a lurker, casually observing the discourse in these chat rooms, I started participating as well. Being on the internet, it was mostly men. But I was crazed, and there was a certain tension. I began to have lewd chats, leading to cyber sex. This was in the days before the proliferation of digital cameras or even scanners, so all of this was strictly text-based. It went on for a little while. Generic hookups and chat rooms. I'd roleplay with anyone who came my way. When they inevitably asked for my location, though, I'd give a random suburb anywhere from an hour to two hours away from where I actually lived. One day, I remember very clearly, I'd been simmering with one guy in his late teens, only a handful of years older than me. When he asked me where I lived, I lied and returned the question to him. He replied that he lived in the same suburb I actually lived in. I confessed to my lie, saying I'd only lied in the first place to keep creepers away. He commended me for the clever idea, and so it got to be that I'd cyber with this guy every couple of days. He did ask me about phone sex, but I didn't want to get a call on my parents' line. Our sessions turned into discussions of what we would do if we could meet up. He said he had the perfect place, too. We could play in his car together. He asked where a safe spot would be so he could come pick me up. I mentioned a park that was several blocks away. Things continued this way, strictly in the realm of fantasy for a long time. Eventually, though, as in all things, I started to lose interest. I wouldn't sign on for weeks at a time, then months. Whenever I did, he would always be right there, ready to pick off exactly where we'd left off. I was usually willing to oblige. After all, it was just a harmless, idle fantasy. Years later, I'd all but forgotten about that account. We didn't really talk anymore, and I'd never made a newer account either. About five years after all this started, I was moving into my college dorms, setting up my new laptop, when I remembered my old AOL handle. I signed back in. It had been years since I last signed on. Surely enough, though, who messaged me first but my old friend? He asked me why I never applied anymore. I told him I was moving and going through some stuff. Ah, shucks, he replied. We never did get to meet up. Yeah, I said. He replied, it's a real shame that date didn't work out. What date? I asked. We were gonna meet in the Walgreens on your block. Then you chickened out. Oh, I don't think I remember that. I was racking my brain trying to recall such an event. There was in fact a Walgreens on my block, but it was relatively new. Yeah, we were in the parking lot, but you drove away before I could even talk to you. I assured him he was mistaken, as I hadn't spoken to him since I got my license. No, for real, man, you were gonna meet me in that black Ford Focus with the bike rack and the alien sticker on the back? The room seemed to swim. It felt like I was falling backwards. He'd correctly identified the car I was driving, but I'd never told him about that, nor mentioned those tiny details. I hadn't even sent him a picture that included my face. So how could he have known that was me? I was sure I'd never set anything up either. Was he deliberately messing with me? Trying to let me know he'd found me? Or had the years since this happened twisted my mind? Maybe he'd convinced himself that him stalking me was a meeting we'd mutually arranged. I blocked him and tried to forget about it. I wasn't living in the same town anymore. 
and even though his stalking prowess was apparently pretty good, I was a significant distance away now, and a pretty athletic guy. If he found me again, I didn't think I'd have much to worry about. I'd nearly forgotten about the whole thing, until the other day. This is nearly a decade later at this point. My older brother and I were catching up, lamenting getting older. I told him there was an old member of my graduating class who had already gone to jail for a felony, served his time, and gotten out. This led to a discussion about friends, classmates, and such who had been arrested. He led with, Remember Charles? I used to play football with him. Yeah, he was arrested for sexting up kids he met online or something. Crazy. I looked up the case. He'd been tried and convicted for a whole slew of sex crimes. He had apparently been using social sites like MySpace and Friendster to meet young boys. He blackmailed and assaulted some of them when they wanted to break it off. The more and more I read, the more I got a heavy f the more I got a heavy feeling in my stomach. I googled his aim handle. It wasn't terribly unique. There were similar accounts named on all sorts of sites which were definitely not him. One deeper in the results, though, was an account on a rollerblading forum skimming these accounts' posts. I was positive this was the same person I'd been chatting with. Clicking the user profile statistics page, the last login was precisely the day before my brother's friend was arrested. At this point, I have more questions than answers. Was that really him? Was it random chance, or did he choose me through my brother? Is that how he was able to put a face to my name? Was he waiting in my neighborhood on purpose, or was it a coincidence? It felt like years were drained from my life, all in a single moment. I don't like to tell people about my life and the things I have experienced, especially because I have anxiety related to interacting with other people. I've only told this to a few people outside my immediate family, and I've only just recently started talking about it. I really wish I'd told someone sooner though, as I discovered a co-worker encountered these people as well. We're talking about it now, and it does seem very therapeutic. Anyway, this is my story. I work downtown, standard 8 to 5 shift. Once in a while, I've worked overtime, but not very often, and not on the day this happened either. It was just a couple of minutes after 5 p.m. I left work, and it was just a few blocks away from my office building to the train station. And there were a few bars and back alleys along the way but the worst I'd ever dealt with were a few homeless folks who got a little too aggressive asking for cash. They didn't bother me much, though. The train ride from this station to downtown where I'd parked my car was about 40 minutes if I'm lucky. I managed to grab a seat and didn't have to spend the whole ride standing on that day. It was a pretty lucky happenstance, more or less, I got a seat next to a window, which left the seat next to mine wide open. At the next stop, three men got on. One of them sat next to me, and the others sat on the seat across so they were facing me. I was listening to music on my iPod, so I couldn't really hear them. I did notice, however, that the guy sitting next to me was trying to move closer to me on the seat. He would move so close that his leg was touching mine. I'd scoot away, then he would move closer again. Eventually, I was squished up right against the window with no room to move. I had no doubt he had more than a few inches of free space on his side. I was wearing sunglasses and could surreptitiously glance at them. I noticed they would occasionally say something, then all look at me. It was incredibly creepy and uncomfortable. I was nervous about getting off at my stop. Mine was the second to last on the train line. When the train pulled into my station, I got off. The guy sitting next to me tried to grab my arm, but I was moving away too quickly and was able to get out just fine. I was hoping they wouldn't follow me off the train. It was a busy station, so they couldn't have known where I was parked, but they did get off with me. I guess it was just their luck that they targeted me. I'd parked in the furthest spot from the station because the parking in that area was free. 
It was about a seven-minute walk away. Usually, that wouldn't be too bad. This area is very quiet, though, and I was worried that these guys were following me. A bit of background. I was quite unfit since I worked an office job and sat down all day, not working out and all that. Add to that my strong sweet tooth and you've got a recipe for a bad body. I was 30 pounds overweight and couldn't run more than 30 seconds at a time. That was pretty depressing for me, considering I ran track and played hockey in high school. I still play some hockey, but on a woman's day league, and it's really not that competitive. I'm the youngest on my team anyway, about 20 years old. It's just something I do for fun together with my mom usually. I was crossing the bridge over the road from the station to the parking lot when I noticed the three guys were less than 10 feet behind me. I wasn't carrying a knife or any pepper spray because it's illegal in my Canadian city. I do know a little bit about personal protection though, a required class for girls at my private high school that I attended in my youth. I put my house key between my fingers just in case I needed to hit someone with it. At least that would hurt them a little more than my fist. The guys continued to follow me across the main lot. They didn't even try to hide the fact they were there. The more nervous I got, the louder and more excited they became. I managed to get across the road between the lots before they arrived to it. They had to wait for a couple of cars to pass before they could follow me. I was almost halfway across when they crossed the road, and I started to run. I could hear their feet pounding the pavement behind me. I used my clicker to unlock the car when I was close and wrenched the door open. I'm really glad there was no one parked next to me. I barely managed to close my door and slam the lock down when the first guy reached for my car. They all arrived and started banging on my windows, yelling and cheering. I'd never been so afraid in my life. I was worried they'd break the windows and get me all the same. There was a guy in the back hanging off my hatchback too, so I couldn't reverse out of my spot without running him over. Maybe I should have, but I was afraid and not thinking. I was screaming, but no one was around to hear me. I don't know what they wanted, but I knew it couldn't be anything good. I wish I had the screamer my mom had given me for protection, but it needed a new battery so I hadn't brought it along with me. As I thought about that screamer, though, it made me realize I had something even better. When you're being assaulted, you're not supposed to scream for help. No one wants to help you. You scream fire because everyone wants to watch the blaze. So, I turned on my car alarm. It was incredibly loud. So loud, I thought it would go deaf inside my car. It got the immediate reaction I wanted, though. The guy started backing off. I could see people walking in the lot looking in the direction of my car. People began to see what was going on. As people began to converge, the guys took off running back toward the train station. I drove home crying. The next night, I started working out. I worked out almost every day since then. If those cars hadn't been on the road at that time, if I'd run just a little slower, if I had been too slow in clicking the locks, it could have all ended very differently. I've lost 20 pounds since then and have gained a great amount of muscle. I quit my job after. I've had anxiety issues for years and this encounter made it so much worse. I never want to feel that powerless ever again. I drive a truck on a delivery route in a pretty rural part of Kentucky, so I see a lot of weird things out there. In fact, just today, I witnessed two black labs fighting in the middle of the road over something. As I got a little bit closer, I could tell they were fighting tooth and nail over a severed foot. Probably the creepiest thing I ever witnessed, though was when I drove by a house that was in the midst of being set ablaze by the owner's meth-addled brother. It was relatively late at night, around 10 p.m. or so. All I see is a spark, then flames bursting in my side mirrors. I heard the next day that the brother whose house was being set on fire came out and beat the guy half to death before putting the fire out himself. Lots of crazy stuff happens around here.
I've told this story to my friends several times, but I guess I can share it here too. I was driving for Costco a few years back. It was around this time of year actually. We usually took extra toy shipments to various locations due to the holiday season. We got a call that one of our locations in rural Kentucky needed a restock. They knew I was a fast driver, so I was given the last minute late night duty. I loaded up my truck and headed out. It was around 3 a.m. or so when I started to have this strange feeling. I chalked it up to just being tired and tried to amp myself up. About 15 minutes later though, the road started to fog up. I mean, more so than I'd ever seen before. It got to the point where I had to pull off to the side of the road and just wait there. There weren't any other cars on the road, and I was a bit ahead of time, so I figured I could wait until things cleared up a bit. About five minutes of sitting still in silence, though, my truck suddenly goes dead. No lights, no engine, nothing. I tried to crank it, but it was like the battery had just suddenly died. I tried my CB, but I couldn't get anyone on. I checked my cell phone. No signal. As I'm sitting there contemplating my next move, I hear what sounds like a child crying outside. It slowly morphed into the sounds of a woman crying, or at least that's what I could make out. It sounded like it was very nearby as well. Now, I'm a big man, six foot three, but I refuse to exit my cab. I did roll down my window slightly and called out to ask if anybody needed help. At that point, the crying immediately stopped, and then I heard what sounded like a sinister laugh. I felt like the laughter was directed at me. I rolled my window back up. It seemed like the more scared I became, the louder and louder the laughing got. Then, as soon as this all started, it stopped. Just like that, my truck started back up again, and the fog dissipated soon after. I drove out of there like a bat out of hell. I got to the next truck stop and pulled in. I ran to the bathroom and poured water on my face. I asked myself, did that really just happen? I went out to the diner and see this fella in a John Deere hat, red flannel, blue jeans. I needed to know if anyone else had experienced that too. I go right up to him and say, excuse me, I just had one hell of an experience. I'd like to know if you have any news from around this area. He said he'd never heard about it before, so I don't know what was going on that night. So, there was this story a while back by a trucker who shared his creepy experience while out on the road. It was getting very late and very dark, of course, so he pulled into a rest area just off the highway right in the middle of nowhere. The place was totally empty, meaning there weren't any other vehicles or people there. While he was getting some shut-eye inside his truck, he began to hear the faint sound of a barking dog that seemed to get louder and louder as time went by. Eventually, this nasty barking sound was coming from right outside his driver's side door. As he got up to look out the window, he didn't see a rabid dog there, but instead a crazy-eyed person looking directly at him, growling like a dog and trying to get in. He started the engine and got the hell out of there, asking no questions about it. So this is a bit of a weird one. I was driving from Albuquerque to Socorro. I was on a stretch with no lights. It was perfectly dark when I noticed someone in the headlights standing on the side of the road. As I was passing by him, my lights, my lights fully illuminated this guy's face. Nothing about this man seemed natural. His posture was weird. He was wearing a gray suit and his face, it just looked off. As I observed, I noticed he was wearing a mask or something. For half a second, we locked eyes, even with my headlights clearly blinding him. It still felt like he was looking at me somehow, not my truck. It really creeped me the fuck out. 
Shortly after this, my CB started picking up some odd chirps as well. I rushed to my destination fast as possible. I guess I was pretty close to the VLA though. The high desert can be a pretty damn weird place. A year ago, I was 28 years old, living in a condo in southern Arizona. I'm a single parent and live with my three children and my dog, a Belgian shepherd named Loki. The neighborhood we lived in was very quiet and friendly. My children would often play outside with the neighbor's kids on a daily basis. I didn't have to watch them like a hawk. Plus, my neighbor worked in his garage all day and was able to keep an extra set of eyes on the kids as well. One fall night last year, I was doing my usual chores, vacuuming, cleaning the rooms, and washing the clothes. I wanted to do as much as I could before the kids came back from their grandparents' house the next morning. I had a sliding glass door in my bedroom that I usually left halfway open so it would be easier for me to go back and forth to the garage where the washing machine was located. Loki also loved to have it open because it was the easiest access for him to run back and forth from inside and outside. I went out through my sliding glass door and opened up the garage. While I was putting the lid back down, I turned around and saw Loki growling, his eyes fixated up on the roof. I looked up to see what he could be growling at, but I didn't see anything there. Figuring it was only a stray cat, I started to walk back into the house and was about to slide the door shut behind me. That was when I noticed Loki hadn't moved and was still out in the alley. Normally, I didn't even have to call him in. He usually just followed behind me. I called for him multiple times, but he didn't so much as look in my direction. He was just sitting still, looking up at the roof as though he were waiting for something to appear there. Suddenly, he jumped up and started snarling, barking viciously at the roof once more. At the same time, I heard the heavy thuds of footsteps moving across my roof just over my head. That was frightening enough already, but what scared me the most was the way Loki was reacting. I had only ever seen him act like that once before, and that was when I was almost robbed back when I was in Washington years earlier. I quickly rushed out and pulled Loki inside, then shut the door behind me and locked it. I was very shaken, pacing back and forth. Loki was crying and growling. I texted one of my neighbors and asked if he could swing by my house and check things out. I didn't feel confident enough that something was really going on to call the police yet. When my neighbor arrived, he physically climbed up onto the roof and didn't find anything. We both concluded it was probably some sort of animal, but I couldn't shake the gut feeling that those thumps across the roof sounded far too heavy to be made by a cat or a squirrel or something. A few days go by and I didn't hear anything more, so I'd almost forgotten all about it. The next morning comes, and before it was fully light out, I was awake and brushing my daughter's hair, getting her ready for school. That's when I heard loud footsteps echoing across my roof once more. I grabbed my old military machete from under my bed and ran out back with Loki. There was nothing. I circled back around to the front, but I still couldn't find anything there. I went inside to reassure my daughter it was probably just a cat, but she looked at me with terrified, wide eyes. She said it sounded like someone was running away. Later that day, when I came home from work, I saw police cars down the street at my neighbor Colleen's house with an ambulance as well. Colleen was a very sweet, older, and fragile lady. I eventually found out that someone had broken into her home while she was napping. Colleen apparently startled the assailant, he had shoved her into the wall and broken her hip. Colleen lay upon the ground in pain, unable to move until her daughter came to check on her. The police officer started to question the rest of us if we had seen or heard anything suspicious lately. I immediately told those officers about the footsteps on my roof and how my dog had reacted and responded to them. 
The police had officers patrol our neighborhood for about a week. I told my daughters what was going on and explained to them that they couldn't play outside freely at the moment, at least not as they were used to. Two weeks passed by and I was still on guard. It was late one night and I needed to do some laundry. I decided I wasn't going to let my nerves prevent me from getting my parental chores done. I had the glass door open and was on the very last load. I was walking towards the garage when I paused dead in my tracks and couldn't move, barely breathing. I tried not to make a sound. I heard creaking up on the roof. I slowly looked up and finally realized where it was coming from. Directly above me, my heart sank and my blood went cold. I know that feeling of being watched wasn't just my imagination. Loki was by my side. He snarled and barked viciously while trying to jump up on his hind legs. I dropped my basket of laundry and ran back inside. Just as I made to close the door, I screamed for Loki to come in. He came sprinting inside, and I immediately locked the door. Just barely a moment after, I saw a shadowy figure jump down from my roof. My oldest daughter came in, and I told her to get my phone and take her siblings into her bedroom and call 911. Loki was practically foaming at the mouth, desperately wanting to go out and get this fucker. I was absolutely terrified, shaking uncontrollably. The figure was just standing there in my backyard, not moving at all. I was unable to take my eyes off them. I had been to war and seen terrible things, but when my children were now suddenly in the crossfire, this felt much different. The strange man literally walked directly up to me, right outside the glass window. He just stared in, glaring at me with anger in his eyes, as if I had just rear-ended his car or something. He was wearing a hooded sweatshirt and held a crowbar in his hands. I remembered the machete that was right by my nightstand. I didn't want the man to know that I had it available, though. If he tried to break in, I wanted to be able to give him the element of surprise. He jiggled the handle to try and open the door, then smacked against it with the crowbar. The window didn't shatter or anything, though. My kids were yelling hysterically as he started hitting the door harder and harder. I realized this guy had every intention of coming in, so I swiftly grabbed my machete and yelled, Come on, fucker! The shock in his eyes was a glorious sight. One of the patrolling officers was nearby. He hopped my fence and started shouting at the guy to drop his crowbar. When he didn't do it, the cop tased him. As the officer put him in cuffs, I went to go get my kids. When they saw me, they came running and started hugging me tight. The would-be home invader was charged and sent to prison soon after. My kids are still going to therapy. I'm doing whatever I can to help them cope with everything. Loki is still with us, and we love him very much. If I ever see that guy again, though, I'm not going to hold back. Everyone keeps telling me how lucky I was, and I truly agree, but I always remind them that that guy was even more lucky he didn't break in through that glass, because he would have had to deal with me. This is a story my uncle told me before he passed away. Unfortunately, I'm unable to provide much proof of this occurrence, but I don't think he would lie about something like this. I'm going to write this story from his perspective, as it was told to me. It was the mid-1980s in Arkansas. My girlfriend at the time dragged me to this wedding. She was close friends with the bride, and the wedding was taking place on a ranch. I have to say, it was a pretty nice setup, surrounded on all sides by thick forests that stretched on for miles. We were literally in the middle of nowhere. It took us three hours just to reach the damn place from where we lived, but the journey was so worth it. Even though I didn't know a lot of people there, I had a really great time. I even found myself dancing, and I never danced, so that's how you know it was real good. There was an open bar, so as you can imagine, things got pretty wild as the night progressed onward. After about an hour of reenacting Saturday Night Fever on the dance floor, I sat down, 
my feet were really starting to hurt. Before I go on, let me explain the layout of this ranch. The outdoor dance floor was located in a clearing and was surrounded on all sides by trees. There was a tree line about 35 to 40 yards away from where I was, and there was a lot of bright lights around the dance floor. Beyond that area, though, it was pitch black. As I was sitting there rubbing my sore feet, I could see something taking place in the distance, just outside of the tree line. I couldn't see it too clearly because of the lighting over there, but what I saw sort of amused me. I saw what looked like a dark figure dragging someone into the tree line. Again, it was somewhat hard to see. But I thought the person that was being dragged was wearing one of those bright yellow bridesmaid dresses. I chuckled when I saw that. I remember thinking, huh, looks like someone drank too much, huh? I feel the need to point out right now that I was also obviously intoxicated. Otherwise, I would have said something about someone being dragged away from the party into the dark forest. Honestly, I thought maybe the two were going to get freaky in the woods or something. A few hours later, we left the wedding celebrations, but what I found out two days later made my stomach drop. Apparently, one of the bridesmaids had gone missing after the wedding. I told police what I remembered seeing that night the very next day. They found the body of the missing bridesmaid in the woods. She had been dismembered. Her limbs were found scattered throughout the forest. From what I hear, they didn't even recover all of her body parts. The person responsible for this was never found either. I felt guilty for many years after, because I can't help but think I could have saved her life if I had said something to anyone. She wasn't even 20 years old. She had her whole life ahead of her, but she ended up in pieces in the forest because of some random asshole. Here's some backstory for you. I lived in rural Kentucky my whole life. I'm 52 and currently semi-retired. I used to be a contractor, but I suffered a nasty accident that rendered my left hip near useless. I'm on disability now, but I do odd jobs in the local town. Sometimes I hunt or help train younger contractors in what to do give them advice, and try to keep myself busy. I have two kids with my ex-wife, who are now in their late 20s, and one with my current wife who's turning 8 next month. My wife is Spanish, so my son looks fully Spanish as well, even though he's half Caucasian. Everyone in town knows my name and my family. They also know I'm a good, humble family man. I personally helped build the house we're living in. It's steep in the woods, and the nearest neighbor is about three miles away. Last weekend, my eight-year-old son woke me and my wife at around two in the morning. Little Jake is a sensitive kid, so the slightest bump in the night causes him to panic. We were used to this, and we didn't mind. But when he said there was a fire outside in the woods, I was immediately struck in alarm. Still only half awake, I bolted to look outside my bedroom window and noticed that in the distance, the night sky was glowing orange. There was smoke rising only 500 yards away from our house. My wife started to panic, picking up the phone and calling the local fire department. I took the phone from her shaking hands and set it down for a moment. I knew this couldn't be from a wildfire. The light and smoke were coming from one singular area. A wildfire would be widespread out by now, since the woods we live in are very dense, and fire travels fast. This must have been a controlled fire, which in a way might be far worse. The local fire department wouldn't be able to help with that. I threw on my hunting gear and rushed my wife and son to the basement. I handed her my cell phone and told her to call her brother, I shut the door and told her to lock it and not open it for anyone other than her brother or myself. I retrieved my bolt-action rifle. My intention was not to harm anyone, but rather find out who was setting this controlled fire in the forest. Maybe I could scare them off or get them to put out the fire peacefully. 
Ultimately, though, I knew that was a decision they were going to be making for me. I deadbolted the front door and left the house. My wife's brother had a key, but wouldn't arrive for at least 20 minutes. I ventured off into the almost complete darkness of my property, following the smell of smoke and the tinge of orange light in the sky. As I approached closer, I could hear the sounds of an ever-increasing sermon being spewed. I got to the tree line that overlooked the clearing, and it was exactly what I expected. Clansmen, about seven of them in a circle, with their arms stretched out while the smooth-talking preacher was spewing hate, using Christ as a justification. The preacher was standing in front of a makeshift cross as it continued to burn. I've had run-ins with these clansmen before due to my property's relative seclusion. They tend to hold sermons out in the woods where no one can find them. Especially in the woods surrounding my house for whatever reason. It only happens maybe twice a year, if not less. Usually I fire off a round into the sky and tell them to fuck off back wherever they came from. Then they scatter off like little cockroaches. I watched as the preacher paused for his followers to say amen and white power and all that shit. And that's when I shot off around into the sky. All of them jumped about four feet off the ground. As I moved towards the fire, I called out to them. You must be new here. This is my property, and I don't appreciate these activities going on near my family. I loaded another bullet into the chamber and positioned my rifle near my right hip not taking aim at them and showing overt hostility yet. While the other followers slowly stepped back, their preacher stepped forward, coming within 30 yards of me. This is your property, he said with a thick Kentucky accent. I apologize. We scouted the area during the day and didn't see a single house around here. You mind telling us where you live, just so we can meet a bit further away from you and your family? I didn't answer this preacher's silver tongue. It may have been able to work on his flock of sheep here, but it wasn't going to work on me. There was a tense silence between us before one of his sheep spoke up. I know this guy. He's married to a... He even has a half-breed with her. The other sheep began grumbling amongst themselves and moved closer toward me. I raised my rifle up below my shoulder and pointed it at them to force them to back away. The preacher chuckled to himself before speaking. So that's why you don't want to tell us where you live, huh? You think we're going to break in and harm your family? Good sir, we may hate your wife and child, but we ain't no savages. You may not be, but that ain't for me to decide and I don't trust your friends here, I said bluntly. I kept my rifle aimed and ready just in case. You can't choose who you love after all, the preacher said. I bet he was sporting a shit-eating grin under his hood while saying that. You have my word we'll never lay a hand on you or your family, so maybe we can arrange a deal. My stomach dropped. My trigger hand trembled slightly. A vague threat was still a threat. You don't bring this up with law enforcement or anyone else, and we'll relocate our get-togethers further away from your family. How I see it, you don't have much a choice. You already fired one shot. You think you could take all eight of us with a bolt action? My friend, that is simply impossible. I remained silent and took a moment to breathe, so I could make my voice remain strong and firm. My palms were sweaty. Another 700 yards further into the woods, there's another clearing. If you hold your meetings there from now on, I won't acknowledge what you do. But if you ever come near me again, I'll bring more than a bolt action next time. You have yourself a deal. He offered up his hand to shake, but I stared him down right past the slits of his hood, my rifle still raised. I didn't accept his filthy hand. Very well, we'll be on our way to check out this promising area. You can head on home now. Just be sure to tuck Jake in tight. This must be a dreadful experience for the poor boy. I stood dead still in total shock. My vision began to blur as the preacher and his flock of sheep moved toward the location I pointed them to. And part of me wasn't surprised. I worked in the community my entire life. The other part of me was in panic mode, though. If he knew my son, he knew where I lived already. 
I often held local events at my home. This gathering was not a coincidence. It was a warning, a threat. I got a hold of myself and moved slowly back into the tree line, watching as their white robes faded into the darkness of the night. I hobbled as quickly as I could back to my home, looking over my shoulder whenever I heard a twig snap or the wind rustling the trees. When I finally made it back, I breathed a sigh of relief and let my wife's brother know what happened. I didn't tell my wife, though. If she knew, she would have never gotten a good night's sleep in that house ever again. My wife's brother slept in the guest bedroom in the basement, and we took turns keeping guard during the night. There wasn't a single sign of their return, but I'm still on high alert even during the day, and especially when I go into town. So far, they've apparently kept their word. Right now, as I write this, I see the sky turning orange and the smoke starting to rise in the distance. It's far enough away to indicate their use of that clearing I recommended. I just wish I could get rid of them entirely. At the time of this incident, I was 18, and very much not intimidating. 5'2", slightly stocky, maybe 130 pounds at the most. I was staying at a friend's house, which was off a back road way out in the country of Mississippi. Her street was full of other family members. Once you got to the main road, it was an unlit, treacherous, curvy area that went right through the woods and was covered on both sides by ditches. It would be suicide to choose to drive drunk, especially at night. With that context, I'll tell you one of the creepiest moments of my entire life. I left her house around 1.30 in the morning, slightly buzzed but still coordinated enough to drive. I turned my music up, lit up my high beams, and made the turn onto the main road. It was less than two minutes away from my friend's house, when out of nowhere, a lady suddenly appeared in my headlights. I slammed on the brakes and pulled across the road into the oncoming lane. I stopped on alert for a possible trap. I rolled down the passenger side window and asked this woman if she was alright. She was probably in her late twenties, very disheveled and moving like she was walking across thin ice or something. After a moment, she replied in a raspy and unhinged voice. I'm very angry with my husband. I stepped out in front of your car to kill myself. No hesitation. Just admitted that to me like she was offering me morning coffee. Are you fucking serious? I shouted at her. She asked me for a light even though she didn't seem to have any cigarettes. She shambled up to my car. I rolled up my window as soon as she made to reach inside. I could already smell the liquor on her. She very nearly got her fingers trapped in my window. As soon as I started to roll forward, she started screaming at me, rambling on about how she hated her husband and wanted to die right now. I carefully drifted forward, watching her following me in my rearview mirror. As I pulled out my phone from my purse and attempted to dial 911, she jumped on my trunk and started banging with both hands. I took my foot off the brake and gave it a little more gas to put some distance between me and her. She jumped off. As the operator came on the line, by the light of my headlights, I noticed up the road that a red truck had crashed into a ditch. It had to have been fairly recently, as the hood of the truck was still smoking. The operator raised her voice, and I realized she was repeating herself whatever she was saying. I apologized to the woman and told her the name of the road I was on and the situation with the truck, and this drunk suicidal woman who was still following me. Suddenly, from the driver's side window, there was a loud thump. The light of my cell phone shining in my face, I turned left to see a grizzled man sticking his face into my window. He was shining his phone's flashlight directly in my eyes, screaming for me to stop and open the fucking door. His face was covered in blood. I screamed so loudly that every 911 operator in the building probably heard me. I dropped my phone and floored it, leaving both the man and the woman behind. 
there was a bloody handprint staining my driver's side window. After a minute of driving close to 80 miles an hour, I finally slowed down and told the operator the further details of what just happened. I hung up when she asked my name, though, mostly because I was freaked out. I drove straight home and never called back. To this day, I don't know what their situation was or what became of them. All I know is I'm never driving down an isolated road at night, especially in Mississippi. Never again. I grew up in southern Mississippi, and like most Mississippi kids, my parents were super young when they had me. My mom was a major alcoholic for most of her life, and it was pretty bad back then. My dad worked all the time, which meant my younger sister and I got to spend all our time at home with her, sometimes when she needed a break from us, or when she just wanted to go on another bender, she'd leave us with my great aunt, who was 98 years old at the time, and very senile. Her property also bordered a mental hospital. My grandmother used to tell us stories about being at my great aunt's house when random people would wander up asking to use her phone. Sometimes they would even still be wearing hospital gowns. I was eight years old when this specific incident happened. My mom dropped us off sometime in the afternoon on Friday. My sister, who was five, went straight to the living room to play with toy horses next to my great aunt, who was wrapped up in knitting a blanket on a recliner while watching TV. A timer in the kitchen went off, and she asked me to take some biscuits out of the oven for her. As I walked past the window that overlooked a large willow tree in the front yard, I thought I could see the figure of a man underneath the branches. I couldn't tell if it was just a trick of the shadows or something, though, so I called for my great aunt to come over and check it out. When she got to the window, she pushed her glasses up to the bridge of her nose. I pointed to the tree and said, I think I see someone out there. She squinted her eyes and studied the tree for a moment before throwing her hands up and laughing. I was so confused. She looked down at her old leather watch and whispered to herself, Oh, silly me, it's that time again. She began to shuffle out of the room, saying, The bicycle man is hungry. I followed her into the back room. She then turned on a lamp that was next to an old, torn black leather couch, where a pillow and blanket were laid out. There were two half-empty glasses of water on the table. She picked the pillow up and fluffed it a bit, then began straightening the blanket. As she did this, she began to tell me how the bicycle man visited her every night. They'd have some dinner, then coffee, then she'd put him to bed. He'd ride off in the morning on his bicycle. At this point, eight-year-old me was completely creeped out, and I began to feel my body tremble. I moved quietly back into the living room, crawling on my hands and knees, not wanting to be seen from outside. I locked myself in a spare bedroom with my sister, I pulled the house phone in with me. I desperately tried calling my mom, but unsurprisingly, she didn't pick up. I didn't know my dad's work number, and this was before he had a cell phone anyway. We heard whoever this man was enter the house. He had a very deep voice and was coughing quite a lot. I don't remember what he and my great aunt were talking about, but he used a lot of profanities and barked with laughter. She asked him some question, and I distinctly remember him talking about some sort of blood stains or something. He said it slowly, though, almost like he was singing. My sister and I didn't come out for supper. We stayed there until it got dark out. I made my sister share the bed with me. As I lay awake, still as I could, so low in my breathing that I could hear whatever noise this man might be making at any corner of the house but I remember my heart skipping a beat when I heard heavy footsteps walking down the hall. They made their way just outside our door. Then the doorknob started turning. I knew my aunt had a key to this room, and I remember praying that the strange man didn't know where to find it. After a moment of wrestling with the locked door, the man let out a mournful, almost disappointed cry. 
like the sound a kid might make after he dropped his ice cream cone. The footsteps walked back down the hall. I stared at the door in terror, my heart pounding in my ears. I don't even remember falling asleep that night. I just remember the sound of something moving around in the kitchen. The next morning, as soon as I realized what time it was, I hauled ass into the kitchen and explained what happened to my mom the night before. She looked really concerned, so she asked my great aunt about it. She gave her the same story that she had given me the night before about the bicycle man. I told my mom about the makeshift bed in the back room, too. We went to take a look at the couch. Another half-empty glass of water was on the nightstand, and the bedspread was messy, as if someone had slept there and left in a real hurry. My mother flipped her shit, then called her friend at the sheriff's office about this stranger on a bicycle. A few days later, my mom got a call from her friend that they had picked up a guy on a bicycle who was trying to break into a house nearby. They found a knife, some rope, and several bags of biscuits on him. Apparently, he had been responsible for several break-ins in the area while he had been staying with my aunt the entire time. I tried to find some newspaper articles or anything online about this bicycle man, but needless to say, with those search terms, they didn't bring much luck. My great-aunt passed away a couple of years later. As for the bicycle man, I don't remember what his name was or what became of him. I barely remember what he even looked like, but he gave me the worst night of my entire life. This didn't happen to me, but rather a friend of mine when he was driving a truck from the US to Canada. He usually carries a gun of some kind, but he couldn't take one with him into Canada. Late one night, he woke up to a man in his truck. The man looked right at him and stared at my friend without saying a word. The guy showed my friend he had a machete and went back to rummaging through my friend's things. Now, even though my friend could not carry a gun into Canada, he was allowed a flare gun. My friend pulled out the flare gun and pointed it at the man currently robbing him. There was an intense standoff for a few moments, gun against machete. The man slowly began to get out of the truck, then took off running into the night. My friend didn't let him get away that easy, though. He shot him in the back with the flare gun and swiftly drove away after. No idea what happened to the guy he shot. About 10 years ago, I was coming back from working the night shift. It was about 2 a.m. or so, and I was driving an older F-250. I was in the right lane, or the slow lane as you might know it, on the interstate doing 65 miles per hour. The speed limit was technically 70, but I was very tired, and I wanted to play it safe. There was no one else driving except for this 18-wheeler coming up behind me. He was flashing his lights frantically. I was already in the right-hand lane, so I couldn't pull over any further without running off the road. This trucker tried to switch to the left lane, then tried to cut back into the right lane. He slammed into the front of my truck in the process. My truck went careening off the road, but thankfully by some miracle of God, I didn't flip over. And the trucker stopped and came to my vehicle. He immediately started screaming. Why didn't you pull over? I was flashing my brights at you. He looked extremely pissed at me. I didn't answer him and waited for the police to arrive. The police came and took our statements. The trucker kept complaining to the cop that I should have just pulled over. The cop was trying to keep his cool, but eventually went off on the guy, saying he was already in the slow lane. Needless to say, I got a whole lot of money from that settlement. Thank God I wasn't injured, though. My family used to go up north to work. They were migrant workers. Once on their trip up there, they saw a bag in a stream behind a gas station. As they got a bit closer to observe it, 
they saw was some sort of burlap-looking material. They could see entrails being dragged out by birds and blonde curls poking out of the front of it. I was too young to remember it directly, but my family told me about it later in life. Upon seeing this grisly sight, they hightailed it out of there as soon as they called it. They were too scared to call the cops because they were migrant workers, so we never found out the aftermath of that in the end. For some background, I've grown up in South Africa my entire life and live in a generally safe area. Any medical professionals in South Africa, i.e. doctors, physios, etc., have to complete a year of community service where the government places you in a most likely rural area where you're expected to work in a public facility and help around the community. Being a medical professional, I moved to another province, equivalent to a state, in South Africa for a year to complete my aforementioned service. I won't mention the specific area, but it's considered more rural than the regular South Africa city. Needless to say, having not lived there for very long, I wasn't always sure which hangout spots were considered safe and which ones you'd much rather avoid. Fast forward a few months into living in this new province, my boyfriend came to visit me. We drove around and noticed a huge park enclosed by a fence nearby. There were tons of families walking around on the grass. Having barbecues, sitting on benches, we thought it looked like a pretty safe area. We chose a spot on a bench and sat down together to talk. My boyfriend still lived back home, so we were doing the distance thing. I was sad he was going to be leaving again in just two days, and started crying because of this. That actually is relevant later. He calmed me down and we sat looking at all the people walking around. Next thing we know, these two guys started walking from about 20 meters away, heading right for us. They looked extremely sketchy too. All mismatched clothes which were torn up, and they were doing the typical gangster walk. We thought they might just walk past us, but they literally walked straight up to us. Being from South Africa, my boyfriend and I both had an immensely bad feeling about the encounter soon to come. They approached us. We froze in place instead of getting up and walking away. One of the gangsters, clearly covered in gang tattoos, crouched down next to me while the other one went around to my boyfriend and stood behind him. They asked us if we could help them out with some money because they'd just gotten out of jail yesterday. We said we didn't have any, but they were persistent and wouldn't leave us alone. I was starting to freak out at this point. I'd been robbed before, and I knew this persistent behavior could and eventually would escalate to violence. They told us they didn't exactly want to hurt us, but they needed the money and whatever else we had to give or else. My boyfriend realized this too, and took out his brand new phone in hopes that would make them leave us alone. They took the phone and glanced it over a few times. The brand was not common in South Africa, and because they couldn't recognize it, they said they didn't want this. They moved in closer, behind us crouching down. We assumed that so the other people around us wouldn't see them. I tried to hide my car keys in my pocket. I was scared they'd try to take the car, as they kept looking over at me. I didn't know what to do, and I was feeling overwhelmed, so I just started crying. I lied and told these gangsters that we just found out my boyfriend's dad passed away. Could they not see we were very upset? There was no way we'd be able to make it to his funeral if they took all our stuff from us. Luckily, as I said before, I had already been crying beforehand when they arrived, so it didn't seem like a lie at all. The one on my boyfriend's side's demeanor immediately changed. He apologized and gave his condolences. I was very surprised at this. The other gangster crouching beside me didn't seem to care, though. He reached into his pocket. At this point, I was very sure something bad was about to happen. Likely, he would pull out a knife on me. 
I grabbed my boyfriend's hand and we tried to run away. They just stood there watching us and luckily didn't try to chase after. I guess they decided there were too many people around. For anyone wondering, South Africa's crime rate is extremely high, one of the highest in the world. And while most areas are safe, you can never escape running into situations like this. For anyone thinking we may have been prejudiced because they didn't technically do anything, I can promise you, when you see a South African gangster, you will know. They're known for being cold and ruthless, so I'm glad we made it out of there unharmed physically. I don't want to know what would have happened if we didn't get out when we did, or if they hadn't believed my lie. This story stretches over a couple of years, starting in my junior year of high school. I was a very sad teenager. My dad had recently declared he didn't love my mom anymore, and my parents had been fighting non-stop. My father became completely distant at the most crucial point of my development, so as a result I developed attention issues. It was one of those usual, my dad doesn't pay attention to me, so I wanted everyone else to do that sort of things. Not going to lie, I wouldn't go as far as to blame myself for this situation because I was a minor, but I can't say I didn't want it when it first started. We met online like it usually happens. He was attractive, very smart, a college student. He told me he was 20. I'm not sure if that's true or not because apparently he told me a fake name also. I had turned 17 that summer. It was nearing March of my junior year, and we hit it off immediately. I liked him a lot, actually, so nearly a week after us talking, we decided to meet up. He lived a couple of hours away from me, which he drove all the way through traffic just to meet me at school. That sounded sweet to me at the time, but now it just raises major red flags. I didn't really think much of our age difference, because I was almost legal anyway, and I also thought of myself as very mature. It didn't bother me that this man was already almost out of college. He picked me up from school in his Prius. We hugged and decided to go to the mall to just hang out a bit. It was nearing sunset at this point. He bought me some ice cream and everything had gone pretty nicely. Everything changed when we went to his car, though. He drove out to the empty side of the mall parking lot and asked if I wanted to make out in the back. I said sure, thinking it was no big deal. So we began kissing and I was really feeling it, you know. I was a horny teenager, I mean, what else would I be doing? Then, though, something strange began to happen. He stopped in the middle and said, Can I bite you? I was taken aback for a moment. I was like, what do you mean by bite? I don't know, he said. I just get so turned on by pain. I love seeing people suffering. I was like, maybe he's into BDSM or something. I thought it was really strange, but maybe he just worded it poorly or something. Also, I didn't really want to be bitten, though. A certain fear began to settle in. I felt nervous. I realized we were all alone, and this dude had just said something super unsettling. It was getting dark outside as well, and the doors were all locked. I felt myself backed into a corner. I legit thought to myself, if I say no, will he hurt me? I decided to say yes with much hesitation, but tried not to show it. I said he could bite me on the arm, but to stop when I said so. He said he would try but no promises because he couldn't control himself. I was terrified. The man bit me so hard it looked like a zombie bite from one of those TV shows. He bit me right on the center of my forearm. It was dark purple, and he left teeth prints in my skin. I couldn't handle him biting me for such a long time, so I screamed in pain, at which point he removed his jaws from my arm, and it started to bleed. After that, he took me home. I was alarmed, but I just couldn't stop talking to him. I still talked with him for weeks after. He started to tell me all types of alarming information about him. He talked about being together and running away with each other because our parents wouldn't understand. 
He was a Muslim and I was a Christian. He got so weird though that we stopped talking for a while. He began to follow me on all my social media. I decided I wanted to block him after I realized just how toxic he was. There wasn't any particular occurrence as to which I stopped or a final red flag. Basically, my best friend just talked some sense into me and bullied me into breaking it off with him. She was the smart one of us two, definitely. She convinced me he was a creep, and I agreed with her. I felt an immense amount of guilt. I pretty much forgot about him until my freshman year of college. What I hadn't been aware of this entire time, though, was he'd made a fake account to follow me on Twitter. I had already been in a relationship for about a year, and this one time, without even thinking about it, I decided to post a kind of racy picture on Twitter. I was 20 at this time. After a few minutes, I received a DM from a person I didn't know. I was like, who could this be? I could tell immediately it was him. The message read, I finally got to see those beautiful Slav boobs of yours. I was grossed out to say the least. My boyfriend was all questions because I'd completely forgotten about this guy up until that moment. It still doesn't end there though. Fast forward a couple of weeks. I'm walking on my university campus and guess who I see there just sitting down on a random bench. Yeah, you guessed it. I was so done with this. Are you serious? The universe just seemed to want to fuck with me. He looked up with me and made eye contact, after which I received another Twitter message. I didn't even bother reading it. I thought I had blocked him on everything, but the fact we still somehow ended up attending the same university gave me chills. It's not that I knew he would do something to me, because I don't really know if I can say for sure he would. The unsettling fear was still there, though. I was intensely paranoid. It all just seemed too convenient that he was going to the same college as me, years after he was supposed to have graduated. We talked about going to this university because he wanted to transfer, but he said he probably wouldn't because the drive was too far away from where he lived. And then seeing him there after he mentioned not wanting to attend it, it felt kind of crazy. The timing was just too good. After that, I saw him again several times, though I don't think he'd noticed I was there. I'd completely changed the way I looked by then, dyed and cut my hair, switched to contact lenses instead of glasses. I hope he just didn't recognize me or stop paying attention, maybe even graduated. I'm not sure if this is as crazy as some other stories you've heard, but I definitely don't want to see that guy ever again. I used to work at Borders way back when, though I had another job at the mall as well. Something about being at the bookstore, though, made me much more recognizable, I guess. I often had people approach me when I was on the street, or ask me about the store's sales while I was at a drive through window. It was mostly harmless stuff, though I did get some creeps on occasion. At the time, I had a dating profile up, but I had to take it down. I'd started getting really weird messages from people saying they'd seen me at the grocery store or something. Just really bizarre crap. The killing blow that finally made me close it, however, came shortly before my 19th birthday. I was checking my account after work, and I see a message titled, We've Met, which really creeped me out immediately. I clicked on it, and it said, Sort of. It proceeded to go into this very weird graphic depiction of this guy, who was apparently so thrilled by my cashiering skills that I caused a stirring in his loins while checking him out. This email was seriously like three pages long, all talking about how sexually excited he was and all the things he wanted to do to my young body. It was in great detail. I was horrified to think that while I was just doing my job, one of my customers had been looking at me like that, thinking all these horrible things. I clicked on the profile, only to find there was no photo. It said he was 56 and single, but no other information. I needed to know what this guy looked like, which is the only reason I replied. 
I imagine that had been his game all along. I didn't respond to any of the other things he said, but I asked him if he'd send me a photo. He told me he couldn't do so, because he was some sort of public figure. He told me he'd email it to me instead. It took him two days to get back to me. Those were two very long days. While I waited, I looked at my message history and discovered that this guy had actually written me many, many times. I just always ignored him because he had no pictures and was out of the age group I was looking for. Out of morbid curiosity, I looked through all these messages. All of them were of him seeing me at random places, describing the thoughts of sexually graphic things he wanted to do to me. He talked about fantasies of using me with another man he knew, beerupping me, tying me up. Many of the details were specific to me alone, which led me to believe he wasn't just mass sending these out to every young woman on the site. They were specifically about me. Meanwhile, this guy was older than my dad. I spent the next two days tensing around every older man who came in. I was afraid to be friendly with any of them. I was in fear that one of them would be this guy, and he'd take it as a go-ahead to come at me. I was having my birthday celebration, the day he finally got back to me. The moment I saw his name, I got a bad feeling in my gut. I couldn't immediately place it, but I knew there was something wrong with this person in particular writing these things to me. I stared at it for a moment, positive I knew this guy from somewhere. My brain just refused to click for some reason. I texted my friend to confirm with her as it began to dawn on me. This man had been my high school principal. I was horrified. I was still 18 at the time, which meant he must have been creeping on a bunch of us all along. I remembered many times of being alone with him in his office, and it made me feel queasy. Was he just perched there waiting for us girls to graduate so he could legally pounce on us? I wrote him back and told him, I don't know if you remember me, but you were my high school principal, and I happen to know you're married. He didn't reply. I thought that would be the end of it. I was still super creeped out for a while after that, though, just knowing how long he'd been thinking about me and sending me these graphic messages. He'd been an authority figure in my formative years. Almost a year passed without further incident. He didn't come in when I was there. One day, I was ringing someone up without having gotten a good look at his face, though. It was a friendly exchange, right up until I made eye contact. It was him again, grinning at me. I put his stuff in his bag and turned away from the register, but he stayed where he was. I pretended to organize some returns, but he just kept standing there, silently, not moving or saying anything. I knew he was watching me, but I couldn't bear to look. The moment lasted far too long. Finally, I grabbed my headset and asked a manager to come to the front of the store. He ran out after that and I never saw him again. This first started when I went to a summer camp in my junior year of high school. I met this girl, whose name was Mar. I introduced myself to Mar. Then, for the rest of the six weeks, I talked to her probably a grand total of three times which includes my introduction, the time she locked me and my friend in a room, and when I said goodbye when the camp ended. She seemed really nice, and I thought she was extremely sweet. Fast forward a year, I get a text out of nowhere, saying, Hey, I missed you. It's me, Mar. We continued to text, catching up on our lives. At the time, I thought this was fairly normal as I'd usually get texts from people at that camp trying to catch up, and it was really nice hearing where they were in life. About nine texts in, after catching up on everything, she suddenly asked me, Would you go to prom with me? I dismissed the strangeness, because I thought she was probably desperate to get a date for prom. I was about an hour drive away, and that was a good distance. She let me know the date of her prom, which I realized was the day after my own, and the day before one of my concerts of an orchestra I was in at the time. 
I let her know of the complicated situation, but she continued to try and convince me to go with her. Every day, she texted me many times asking if I could go, saying that I had time, that I should do it for her. I said yes in the end. I felt like she really wanted a date to prom for the experience, so I thought, why not? I would want the same if I was in her situation. What could go wrong? Three days later, I'm playing some games on my PC at the time, when I hear my older sister yell the darndest thing from downstairs. Your girl is here! Confused, I go to the window of my room, and what do you know? Mar is standing in my driveway, smiling and waving at me. Now, most people might have thought, oh my god, how did she find my address? How did she know I wasn't doing anything right now? What the fuck? Instead, my dumbass instantly thought, oh shit, she drove an hour to get here. I feel kind of bad. I headed outside to meet her and ask her why she was here. The first thing she said to me was, I drove an hour to get here, so you should take me out on a date. Behind me was my dad, approvingly shaking his head. Before I could even reply, he told me to go. He had such a proud look on his face. That's when I realized this situation might be kind of bad. I took her out to a Chinese restaurant and decided to order three plates of food all by myself. I realized that if I could keep eating, I could decrease the time I had to talk, as I'd be chewing 75% of it. To start off, she told me stories about all the guys she'd ever went after, who were taken by people she knew. She got increasingly mad, as she kept talking to the point where people around us started to look. She suddenly asked me about my relationship with a girl I'd had a thing with a few months back. In my head, I again thought this was fine. She probably knew about that girl because she was friends with her friends, and they probably told her about it. I explained my situation about how I don't talk to that girl anymore. Mar suddenly gets this flare in her eye. She asked me what I planned to do with the time until college, and if I was interested in dating. I told her I didn't really have any particular plans. After a few more places we go to, because she said she wouldn't leave until she was satisfied with her time with me, I went back home, and we decided to play games on my Wii. After a solid game of Super Smash Bros. Brawl, she realized I was not having much fun. I guess you're kicking me out then. She proceeded to try and kiss me. Out of panic, I put my entire right hand on her face and pushed her away. I led her out of my house into her car. Once she got in, she started to take pictures of me on her Snapchat, with the caption, First Date. I told my parents about the situation, and I swear to God, they literally brushed it off right away. Oh, people can be like that. You should be happy a girl likes you. My sister, though, started to figure out that maybe this was not good. She agreed with my parents, though, because she thought it would be funny to see how this all went. Two weeks later of dodging all her texts of her asking to come over again, I'm heading to her pre-prom party. I was completely exhausted, to the point where I couldn't even run. I was not ready for another prom. Surprisingly, though, the pre-prom party and the prom itself was a lot of fun. She didn't do anything that made me feel uncomfortable, and her friends were amazing. After the prom, she took me back to her friend's house. She then asked if I could stay the night, which I couldn't due to my concert the day after. She started to get very angry with me, so I texted my sister to help me. For the first time ever, she came to my rescue. An hour later, as Mar was getting increasingly furious with me, I got a call from my sister saying she was outside. I let Mar know and ran out of the house, relieved my day of prom with her was now over. A few months later, I got an anonymous letter in the mail addressed to me. Inside were three whole pages, filled the front to back with a declaration of love from Mar. It explained how she fell in love with me at first sight, how everything I did made her love me so much more. She couldn't live without me anymore. I met up with a friend a few days later, and he showed me all these Snapchat conversations with her. Just walls of texts, questions asking personal things about me. For the next year while I was in college, I would get random texts and Snapchats from her, showing pictures of her coming to my town and asking where I was. 
There were times she would go to my town's high school games and send pictures of our coaches with their jackets and the name of my town on there. Eventually, she stopped messaging me because I blocked her on everything, but I don't know if that means she stopped following me at all. Kids in my town used to swim at the local reservoir all the time, from early spring to early in the fall. It was on what we called the Old Airport Road, a deserted, forested stretch of dirt road that eventually led to a small airport in my area, hence the name. There was a rocky cliff area that some kids would be dared to jump off from, and sometimes my friends and I would have water balloon fights from the top of there, pelting the ones down below in the water. The water was always clean and pretty cold. It was overall just a pretty and quiet spot to enjoy your time in the water. It all changed one day, however, when the bodies were found. The story goes that a family from a neighboring town had gone to the reservoir after hearing about how nice it was, and decided to have a picnic and swim around for a while. For a little bit, everything was okay. The kids had gone around a bend in the reservoir, and the parents still heard the sounds of them playing, so they thought everything would be okay, and that they'd see them in just a minute. Then, things suddenly went quiet. I mean real quiet, too. The type where even the birds stopped chirping in the trees because there's something dangerous nearby. The parents obviously grew concerned and went poking around the top of the rock ledges to check on their kids. Two little boys, seven and five. That's when they found their boys poking at something with a big stick just on the water's edge. Something bloated, distended, purple and wearing a bright red hoodie. It was the body of a young girl just floating there in the reservoir. She looked pale and her eyes were bulging from her head. Her parents yelled at them to get away from the body and come there right this minute. The family members were interviewed, which is how we know this, especially the accounts from the children. The canine units were quickly dispatched as well. They combed through every inch of the surrounding reservoir, but the dogs couldn't pick up any scent other than this girl's. She was labeled a Jane Doe. No family or friends seemed to be looking for her and the case went cold only a few months in. What little we do know is that she died of strangulation, not blunt head trauma like the family thought, and it's likely she had been sexually assaulted beforehand. Now, kids don't really go to that reservoir anymore, out of fear. Fear that we'll find another body just like that girl's. Fear they might become another casualty on the water, for another family innocently enjoying the scenery to find. The killer is obviously still out there somewhere. Maybe he moved on. Maybe he decided to only kill once and that was enough for him. Maybe he's still out there, living a normal life along the old airport road. I don't know if we're ever going to find out who did this. My friend, we'll call her Kay's family, was always more well-off than most, with enough disposable income to buy some very luxury items. With enough disposable income to buy some luxury items, new cars, the latest gadgets or technology, even a full party boat. It's that party boat and my first experience out on the water that I'd like to focus on today. That boat was a real nice one, Cherry red with a single sparkle in the paint, with a built-in sun cover and comfortable seats situated in a ring around the deck. Although it was relatively small, it was enough for a group of teens to go out on the local lake and party one night. Long story short, Kay had just gotten her driver's license. One night, she called me and a few of our friends and classmates up got in the truck with the boat attached, and drove off while her parents were out of the house. Yeah, she basically stole that boat. Some hearing this will condemn those actions, and maybe some won't. I just felt it was an important thing to mention. 
The group consisted of Kay, myself, our friend Jake, and his older brother Clayton. Now, Clayton was 20 at the time, and in his sophomore year of college, the rest of us were all between 17 and 18. Kay had had a huge but silent crush on him for quite a while. We all knew he would probably never reciprocate her feelings, but that didn't stop her from trying or dropping hints constantly. I think inviting him to a stolen boat party out on a lake at night with underage drinking was definitely her biggest one. It took some finagling to set everything up and get the boat going in the water, as she'd only seen her dad do this once or twice. Once we did, Clayton took over driving, as he was the oldest and therefore the most responsible. I say that with a huge grain of salt, as he had just as much idea of how to drive a boat as the rest of us. We did a few circles on the leg. The wind was frigid as it whipped past us. Kay and I cuddled together for warmth, with Jake telling his brother to slow down a bit. We were obviously making a lot of noise. It was hard to hear anything, as the darkness around us slipped by, slick as oil. It was impossible to tell where the ground was in the darkness, where the sky ended and the water began. Clayton laughed, and I'm pretty sure he said something. But his voice was very muffled by the wind. He had already had a couple of cans of beer while we were fumbling setting up the boat, too, so he wasn't in the clearest state of mind. Kay turned to me and whispered in my ear, Hey, I'm gonna try to kiss him later. Her eyes were bright with drunkenness. She'd taken up on the beer already as well, after she saw him doing it. Most likely, she wanted to impress him and show him how mature she was. I was going to tell her I didn't think that was a good idea. I mean, he was in college and it would be kind of weird, right? But I didn't even have time to finish that thought. There was a jolt and a shuddering, scraping sound that vibrated the floor beneath our feet. Suddenly, we were launched from the boat into the cold, dark water. The boat had slammed hard into some rocks that were jutting out at a very high speed, and it had completely flipped over. I was flung out a fair bit, but I later learned the boat had collapsed right on top of Clayton. Kay had been launched right into one of the rocks and broke her arm, but still managed to crawl her way to safety, since she landed not far away from the shore. In hindsight, that's partially what made us crash in the first place. Jake was yelling, and I saw the faint outline of his back as he dove under to look for his brother. Each time, he came up empty-handed. Dizzy, with my head fuzzing over from the impact, I swam over to help him look, I just remember him yelling over and over until his voice was completely strained. Clay? Clay, can you hear me? I dove under, groping at rocks and weeds and everything I could find until I had to come up for air. At the last second, my fingers brushed what I thought was the front of a shirt. Attached to an arm, attached to a body, I burst out of the water, screaming to Jake, I got him! He's right here! I dove back under. Together, we managed to get him to the shore where Kay was waiting, holding on to her broken arm. As she moved it around, I could tell it was flopping over in a way arms never should. Jake told us to call 911. He slapped his brother in the face, trying to get him to wake up. How the fuck do you do CPR? He said. We can't, Kay blurted, wincing in pain. I mean, we drank beer. I stole the boat. Kay, I said. I took her face in my hands, forcing her to look at me. I could see the whites of her eyes. She was clearly crying. We have to call. Come on. She nodded and grabbed me with her good arm. She cried as she dialed 911 in my arms. The police and ambulance came 15 minutes later. They took Clay away on a stretcher. Miraculously, he still had a faint pulse, but it was not looking good. Jake went with him in the ambulance while the cops drove me and Kay home. They lectured us on underage drinking and driving a boat recklessly. Kay's parents had gotten home earlier than expected, and they were waiting for Kay when she got back. When the cops explained to them what had happened, they didn't yell at Kay like I thought they were going to. Instead, they just hugged her and I tight and made us promise to never do something like that again. We were offered towels, a shower, and a change of clothes while waiting for my dad to pick me up. 
I felt numb and cold. Even after a hot shower, Kay still cried beside me, begging Clayton to be okay. She really blamed herself for the whole thing. Although Clayton did live, he was never the same again. He had difficulty speaking and remembering things, and he couldn't really move without a walker or a wheelchair. His brain had been without oxygen too long to make a full recovery. Kay, Jake, and I visited him a lot these few months in the hospital, and although he couldn't remember our names sometimes, he wrote down on a piece of paper in his shaky handwriting that it was okay. He still lives with his parents and needs constant care. As for me, Jake, and Kay, we're doing all right. Last time I spoke with Kay, she went off to college in another state, where she could escape from that terrible night. Jake stayed in the area to help care for Clay, and he and I actually became a couple many years later. We now have a daughter together, and we've talked a lot about that night. We're going to make sure to educate her on boat safety, and how it's a very, very bad idea to go out on the water and not tell anyone where you're going. That it's exactly what happened to Uncle Clay. I really hope she listens to our advice. I'll start by saying that I'm deathly terrified of water. Any large, deep body of water, I refuse to go near it. Hell no. My wife finally convinced me to go to counseling after suffering through a lot of beach and pool trips with no swimming and not knowing why. That was part of the joke. She was actually really concerned about my well-being and why I wasn't opening up to her about it. When I finally did, she brought up counseling every day until I would go. My therapist recommended I journal my thoughts and open up to others about my fears so I could conquer them. After some soul-searching, I can trace my crushing fear of water to the old swim instructor I had when I was still in kindergarten. His name was Mark. He was in his early 20s from what I can remember and was extremely fit with the physique of someone who swam every day. He was extremely energetic with us kids, and unfortunately also very critical as well. He expected little two to five-year-olds swimming for the first time to jump right into the deep end, so to speak. He wanted us to be able to swim as well as he did after only a single lesson or two. My first lesson, the one my mom was present for, went about as well as you'd expect. He was very patient, nice, and helpful. He even guided me across the shallower parts of the lake and held me up as I tried and failed to kick. I forgot to mention, instead of traditional lessons at a swimming pool, Mark offered them over the summer at a lake in my town. The lake was so wide you could just barely see the other side over the horizon, and the water ranged from blue to a dark muddy black on most days. There was a dock and a little strip of beach that I could play on after my lesson was over. That was if my mom wasn't tired after working. Some parts of the lake bottom were very rocky, though. I remember getting out of the water a lot to find small scrapes and cuts on my feet after stepping on a few sharp rocks. Mark didn't care, though. At least, not when we were alone. He would just tell me to go back in the water, sometimes even pushing me in, causing me to trip and get scraped up even more. The worst part, though, was when he made me swim out deeper than I was comfortable with. If I started to get scared, he would call me a wuss or a baby, and things like that. He would keep on pushing me until I made it to whatever arbitrary point he'd set for that lesson. I'd get so tired from all that swimming. My mom said I used to fall asleep in the car after every lesson and had to be carried inside because my legs and arms were too strained to move. Mark would also tell me scary stories, too. Ones about monsters hiding at the bottom of the lake with teeth and claws that would snatch up kids who were bad at swimming or too slow to escape them. I hated it. Every time he made me go out deep, I would picture gnashing teeth grasping at my legs from below and trying to pull me under, just like he'd said. I cried whenever I couldn't feel anything below me or see anything in the dark water. I guess it all came to a head one day 
and after this experience, I never had swimming lessons with Mark again. Or anyone for that matter. It was a cloudy day on a Wednesday, and I was dreading going out into the water when it would be most dark, almost an oily black. I really couldn't see anything, and I knew Mark was going to be mean about it. I don't really know why I didn't tell my mom about any of this. I guess I didn't want to disappoint her, since I was the one who begged to learn how to swim in the first place. Mark was waiting for me as usual, already in his swim shorts. As soon as I got out of the car, though, he immediately flashed me an angry look. He looked madder than I'd ever seen him before, and I could feel something drop in the pit of my stomach. Even back then, I knew something was wrong. I had on a neon pink swimsuit at the time with bright blue flowers, and Mark had noticed. He flatly, even with an intense look in his eyes, said, You know, the fish people are gonna see that easily. Maybe you should take it off. My heart just about stopped. I had just covered safety in kindergarten that week, and what to do and look out for if an adult in your life said something exactly like that. And boy, if that wasn't a get an adult you trust right away moment, I don't know what is. Just as quickly as the panic spiked, it settled though, when he said, I'm just kidding, go take a lap. He put his hands up defensively, as if seeing the recognition in my eyes. The lake was really cold that day, and stretched on forever in that waving black expanse. I stepped out carefully on my shaking legs, wanting to get away from Mark, while also terrified about going out there. When I was about waist high, I started swimming. He usually made me go to the buoys separating the deeper parts of the lake from the shallow part, so I thought I could hang there for a minute with the excuse of catching my breath. He would be annoyed, of course, but since he couldn't reach me from the shore, I'd be okay. I turned out to not be okay. The buoys were an orange beacon as I bobbed through the water. My arms were already feeling heavy and tired, but I pushed on. I could feel Mark stare on me all the while, and though I didn't look back until I got to them, I knew he would either be angry or disappointed that I was already out of breath. I reached them and clung onto one for support. Since it was so cool out, my hands were already clammy from being out of the water, and goosebumps started to make their appearance on my body. Aside from the few birds that flew overhead, I felt completely alone out there. I nearly had a little heart attack when something splashed beside me and a hand grabbed my shoulder. In reflex, I let go of the orange buoy and sank below the surface. The hand went with me, but instead of letting me go, it held me down. The muddy water stung my eyes. I couldn't see which way was up or down. I thrashed and tried to get away from this hand. My chest hurt, and I couldn't take it anymore. I gasped for air. My mouth quickly filled up with lake water, and I screamed. Blood was rushing hard in my ears, and I couldn't even hear myself thinking. The hand tugged me up suddenly, holding my head out of the water, before plunging me back down again. I didn't even get a chance to breathe in. The hand did this several more times. I can only remember a blur of water after that. I thought to myself, this is it. Mark said they'd come for me, the monsters, and they did. And then, suddenly I was back on the shore, coughing and retching, trying to fill my lungs as fast as possible. I heaved myself over onto my stomach, and water rushed out of my throat onto the ground. Mark was standing over me, grabbing my back and slapping it, making sure all the water came out. The grip felt familiar, and as I calmed down and looked up at Mark, I understood why. Instead of concern or worry crossing his face, he was laughing, not even trying to hide it. I knew then it was never the lake monsters that had dragged me under. Come on, take it easy, kid, he said, reining in his mocking laughter. I knew you needed some motivation, but that was pathetic. You nearly drowned. He did this to me, all to motivate me to swim better, or to scare me. As a literal kindergartner who just almost drowned, I couldn't find the words to express what I was feeling at that moment. All I could do was burst into tears and cry until my lesson was over. Mark brought me my towel and didn't speak to me until my mom pulled into the parking lot above the beach. 
He leaned in close, and I could still smell his breath to this day, like he'd eaten something spicy for lunch. He whispered in a low voice, Don't tell anyone, or next time I won't pull you back up. Do you understand, kid? I didn't say anything. I just nodded and went to the car. Mark waved to my mom and smiled as I got in. She asked me how my lesson went and paused when I just said good. She asked if I was okay, but I didn't say anything for a long while. I guess I was in shock after what just happened. Finally, I just said, I hate swimming. I don't want to go anymore. And we never did. My mom pulled me out of those swimming lessons, and I never went to another trainer again. Hell, I didn't even touch the idea of swimming or going into any water after that, even public pools in the gym or otherwise. I just kept seeing Mark's face after he pushed me under the water, or feeling his hand on the back of my head, feeling my lungs still burning whenever I looked at a body of water bigger than a puddle. I've had my wife look over this, and she thinks it's sad and really well written. She hugged me for a long time after I finished writing it, and I'll thank her forever for urging me to go to therapy. I'm not on a complete road to recovery yet, but I know I'll get there someday with her support. I don't know where Mark is now or if he's still teaching kids, but I hope he had his head held underwater at least once, just so he'd know how it feels. The saying, blood is thicker than water, is a familiar one. It means your blood relatives or family unit should be your only loyalty, and giving them up for anything outside of it should be highly frowned upon. That being said, there's another phrase I can coin that means something more to me, associated with an event I'll never forget no matter how long I live. Blood is thicker than oil, both in the metaphorical and literal senses. It all started on the day my parents told me they were getting a divorce. We lived on a huge property by a lake at the time, in a huge log cabin style house. They hosted parties every summer, with friends and neighbors out on the lake. There would be music, the smell of hot dogs and hamburgers on the grill, and the lake looming over the horizon, reflecting the firelight and whatever color of fireworks we chose that night. It was at one of those parties that my parents started acting really strange. They were usually on opposite schedules throughout the week, but on these weekend parties they reconnected, laughed, and danced with each other as if they were together 24-7. But that night they seemed to be on opposite sides every time I looked for them. Whenever I asked if they were going to dance tonight, my mom just straightened her mouth and didn't say anything. My dad would shrug and say he'd catch up with her later. At 13 years old, I knew something was off, but I couldn't think of anything to try and fix it. Different neighbors milled in and out of our house for water and snacks and to use the bathroom as the party went into the later hours. The breeze was still lukewarm, but eventually I had to go up to my room to get a jacket. Our house was very large, and my room was at the end of the hall at the right, on the side of the house that faced the lake. I passed a few people who smiled and waved as I went up the stairs, but aside from the top landing where the bathroom was, the upstairs was really quiet. I usually go inside once or twice to give myself a moment to breathe and decompress from these parties. I have sensory processing issues, and excessive chatter for too long makes me disassociate. That's definitely what I needed tonight. I was already feeling not all there from all the noise outside, and just needed five or ten minutes. That's all. But five or ten minutes was all it took for my life to change. I got to my room, shutting the door softly behind me, and taking a seat on my bed. I left the lights off because I felt particularly light-sensitive that day. I lay there in the dark for a few minutes, breathing and not thinking much about anything. The quiet felt like swallowing a spoonful of warm honey. It was really good and relaxing. My quiet moment was shattered, though, when I heard splashing through the open window. Not the regular kind of splashing, either. Frantic, desperate splashing that sounded like a little kid had fallen in or something. My trance broken, I raced to the window to look out. 
I still felt disconnected to my surroundings, but I was there enough to be able to see what was going on. I almost didn't want to believe it. Down there in the dim glow of the moonlight and light from the bonfire around the corner, I saw my dad. He was bent over waist deep, wrestling with something. At first, I thought he was play wrestling with his brother or playing chicken or something. He was childish like that even at 40. But I quickly realized that wasn't the case when a man I knew popped out of the water trying to punch my dad and get ashore. But my dad snatched him back and tackled him back in, pinning his head under again. It was Mr. Welsh, our next door neighbor, a man we'd had at those parties every weekend. He and his wife often babysat me when my parents went out to dinner. He repaired our plumbing when I flushed Legos down the toilet. Everything neighborly you could think of. And there my dad was trying to drown him right in front of me. Not that he knew I was there, but I think he would have done this even if my bedroom light was on. I watched as they continued to struggle. When Mr. Welsh didn't come up for a minute and his body stopped moving, I couldn't take it anymore. I ran downstairs out the front door. People stopped to talk to me, all smiling, but I ignored them and ran past. I turned the corner of the house. My dad was there coming out of the lake, but Mr. Welsh was nowhere to be found. I looked frantically out at the water, but I couldn't see him anywhere. My dad just looked at me. His shoulders sagged. I could swear something broke inside him. He collapsed to the ground and sobbed into his hands, repeating the same thing over and over. I fucking killed him. I killed him. My parents sat me down later and told me they were getting a divorce. The meeting was closely monitored, of course. The jail guards weren't going to let a kid near an alleged murderer alone, even if he was his son. I learned that apparently my mom had been having an affair with Mr. Welsh, one that lasted for years before my dad found out. He was devastated and confronted her a few days before the party. When she refused to leave Mr. Welsh and asked for a divorce, my dad took his rage out on the only thing he could think of, Mr. Welsh himself. He'd seen him talking and dancing with my mom at the party, and something inside him snapped. He asked Mr. Welsh down to the lake around the side of the house to look at the dock. When they were all alone, my father dragged him to the water. I still don't know how to feel about either of my parents. I was sent to live with my grandparents in another town as everything played out, and only saw them on supervised visits. I know I can't forgive my mom for what she did to my dad, but I also feel weird around my dad, too, for the awful thing I saw him do. His anger was understandable, of course. It's what he did with it that makes me so unsettled. He's told me he still loves me a lot and will be there for me when he gets out. I believe him. I just don't know if I'm ready to accept everything yet. Mr. Welsh's body was never recovered. My dad was convicted purely on circumstantial evidence. Some days, I think of driving out to the old lake house where I grew up, and my innocence was lost, and looking out at that great expanse of water. Maybe one day, Mr. Welsh will finally be found in that lake. Or maybe he never will. I work summers as a camp counselor in northern parts of Ontario, Canada. On the date this particular incident occurred, I was camping with a group of 10-year-old boys on the same lake the summer camp was based on. Like a routine camping trip, we canoed out to the site and set up our tents. Me and my co-worker Mike took turns supervising the kids while we swam, built forts, and played games. We cooked some food over the fire, sat around, and told stories cooked s'mores, the typical Canadian camping experience. At around 9.30, I tell the kids it's time for bed, and they head off into their tents, which were positioned a small walk away from the shoreline, but still within line of sight from where we had the fire pit. Me and Mike were shooting the breeze by the water, smoking a cigarette, and basically just hanging out, before we decided to head into our own tent and call it a night. What happened next still troubles me to this day, and remains my go-to scary campfire story. We were both gazing into the pitch-black night water, when we saw a small light approaching us slowly, 
slightly above water level. We speculated what this could possibly be for a few moments before it came close enough for us to see. The light was mounted on the front of a kayak and someone was approaching our campsite. Now, it's important to note that as a camp counselor, part of our training goes over how to deal with stranger encounters in an environment where we're responsible for a group of children on public property. I was prepared to give this mystery paddler the typical speech about how we were camping with a group from a recognized organization and we were respectfully asked they find another campsite. This person's appearance shook us to the bone, though, as the light drew nearer. Paddling this kayak was a woman who looked to be in her 60s. She had incredibly long wisps of gray hair that was trailing off into the water. Her skin looked like old leather, and her dead-looking eyes were tough to spot underneath all her wrinkles. She looked directly at me, and she spoke. I realized she was missing most of her teeth. Oh, are all the children safe in bed? She asked me, pointing in the direction of the tents, not really knowing how to respond, and quite frankly crapping myself. I responded by telling her we were fine, and she had to leave. That's good, just as expected for this time. She smiled and then turned her kayak and paddled off into the night. At this point in time, myself and Mike were legitimately very creeped out. Not only because the appearance of this mystery woman, who resembled a corpse, but because of her inquiry on the whereabouts and safety of the children we had brought on this trip. Not knowing what else to do, we grabbed our hunting knives and sat by the fire after checking on the kids once more. A half hour later is where things really started to get creepy. Across the lake, a female counselor was leading another trip for kids the same age group. She sent me a text which read something along the lines of, Hey, Sean, stop screwing with us. This isn't funny. My kids are really creeped out. I instantly called her and let her know I had just seen someone near my campsite that seemed eerie and suspicious, and I was not trying to play any jokes. Apparently, one of their kids had opened their tent door to take a piss and seen a woman with long hair standing with her arms open toward them near the shoreline. I live in the countryside in an idyllic village where half the houses are vacation homes. Not much happens here, but if you enjoy nature, it's a pretty great place to live. I'm an outdoorsy kind of woman, with my favorite element being water. I do kayaking, diving, swimming, anything water-related I can get my hands on. I was on my way home from my night shift. I had this job just for one summer at a halfway house. It's a home for eight recovering addicts, and there has to always be two people working there at night, just in case. It's usually very calm. We play cards, watch TV, cook. It's pretty easy money. Back on topic, I was driving home, and as I always do, I stopped at the little secluded lake for a swim. I can never resist a good swim, and always got a bikini in the car just in case. This lake isn't very large, but it is crystal clear and surrounded by a beautiful forest. You would never even know it was there if no one told you. The little road that leads down to the beach is fairly narrow and well hidden. As a result, there's almost never anyone there, aside from the occasional dog walker. I had only just started to swim out into the lake when I felt that my car key, which I kept tied onto a piece of string around my ankle, didn't feel quite tight enough. I was afraid it would slip off and be lost in the water. Instead of swimming straight out into the lake, I quickly made my way around a little rocky part of the headland. This area was slightly L-shaped. I was in the angled portion and could see through to the beach and the car as I fastened the string better. I just so happened to look up towards my car. My spot was slightly hidden, not far from the beach or the car, behind the corner of this area. As I watched the car, I didn't notice him at first, 
I had to really squint to make sure what I was seeing wasn't an illusion or a trick of my imagination. But as I looked closer, I saw that squatting behind my SUV was clearly a man. A man in a bright yellow hoodie. I didn't see his face, of course, and it was too far away to actually see who this was anyway. But I recognized this person's hoodie. This guy must be Creepy Freddy. He was only 17, but he was very unstable. He never returned from his visit to his parents the day before. We called the police, of course, but since he usually turns up on his own after a few days of freedom and drugs, the police often advise us to just wait and see. He'd earned his nickname of Creepy Freddy. After assaulting a girl for no other reason than that he felt she was too beautiful, Thankfully, she hadn't been injured badly, but it was still extremely creepy. Indeed, he had a very long history of drug-induced violent outbursts. Even if he was nice enough when he was sober, he was a nightmare when he wasn't. I thought about trying to get up, leaving the car behind, and trying to walk towards the main road. But what if he spotted me and chased after me? I had no idea if he was in a fit state or not. I was also barefoot in my orange bikini. I would be very easy to spot. I decided against the risk of enduring a face-to-face -face encounter with a possibly drugged up and possibly armed Freddy. That was too big a risk. I considered my other options, and I realized there was only really one. To swim across the lake and reach the little cluster of vacation cottages that occupied the opposite beach. As quietly as I could, I started to swim over. The swim took me over 90 minutes. I kept turning around to see if I was being followed. When I reached the other beach, I was completely exhausted and cold. I walked up the sandy beach as a young mom and her kids spotted me. I explained the situation and she phoned the police and fed me some scones and coffee and the best waffles I ever had. The police arrived only to find Freddy gone. All four of my tires had been slashed. I resigned from my job at the halfway house where he stayed soon after, and Freddy is, as far as I know, still not found to this day. It almost felt like a dream. I woke up to my dog Lucy barking. She was upright on the bed, where my husband and I were sleeping with our 22-month-old daughter. She was staring at our door like an unknown stranger was out there rummaging around. I thought she was just freaking out over a house noise. We'd only had her for three months at this point, and she was still a puppy. Really, she could have been barking at anything. Our roommate, a creak from the house setting, the awnings moving outside in the breeze. I wasn't too concerned initially. I decided the best thing to do would be to open the door and show her that nothing was there. It sounds a bit silly, but that's what we do with our daughter when she gets scared. And I figured it would work with a young puppy, too. I opened the door and she raced to the front door. She stood there and did this gnarly, angry, and violent growl, one I had never heard her make before. I looked groggily at her and opened the baby gate blocking the doorway. I leaned over to open the door and show her that everything was okay. The second my hand reached for the deadbolt, though, Lucy went wild. She started barking and jumped towards me. When I touched the metal, she suddenly changed her temper. She whimpered almost like she was afraid of backing down. As her mannerisms changed, so did mine. I wasn't calm anymore. My heart was racing and sinking at the same time. I had been flooded with a mixture of fear and dread. I looked through the peephole. I can't explain why I decided to look, but as I did, I could see that outside were two children. One was only a smidgen shorter than I and didn't look much younger than I am. I'm 21 and this girl looked to be around 16 or so. She was slender and pale as well. Her hair was a shade of honey blonde. She wore it long about mid-back, with long, thin, blunt bangs in the front that covered most of her face. 
she held the hand of a smaller girl who looked to be around the age of four or five. She had the same style of clothing, jeans and a buttoned-down ivory cardigan. The smaller one looked down at the floor shyly. They had the same shade of hair tied back in a ponytail. Had it not been for the overwhelming dread and fear, I probably would have asked these children to come in, as well as given them a hot beverage to get them out of the bitter cold. Something about these two seemed off, though. I hadn't made any noise, hadn't hushed the dog or grumbled or nothing. I hadn't turned on any lights, either. These kids had no indications that anyone was at the door, yet the older one spoke. She had a voice that was mature, confident, and strong. She held her head tilted downward, and I couldn't see her face, really. We have to use your phone, ma'am. I stood frozen in fear. How did she know that I was there? She raised her head to face me directly, and that's when I saw her eyes. There was a reason I couldn't see them through her bangs before. Her eyes appeared to be black, midnight blue, or another dark color indistinguishable in the darkness. Nonetheless, they were otherworldly. She told me, Our mother is worried. As someone who's always been interested in creepy stories, I knew what this was the second she looked at me through the door. I had never been one to believe in these things, as a staunch atheist and skeptic. I had always written off many a ghost story from my family member and friends, eager to share their tales. I didn't believe, but I couldn't deny what my eyes were seeing. I was standing with nothing but a thin wooden door between me and a black-eyed kid. There was no questioning what was right in front of me. I didn't answer her. Slowly and silently, I backed away from the door, Lucy still cowering at my ankles. She kept talking. Just let us in. We'll only use your phone. I took another step back. She'd seemed at first too polite, but when I took that second step back, she became commanding, almost hostile. We're not going to hurt you. If we wanted to do that, we would have broken in by now. I'll ask you again. May we come in and use your phone? Lucy snarled at the door as we inched backward. I went to my room and covered up the window. I locked the door and sat in the dim light of the nightlight. I heard the girl calling through the door once more. Then there was quiet. I didn't go back to sleep that night, and I haven't slept right since. I know from reading about BEKs that they don't come in without permission. I know there haven't been any reports of them hurting anyone either. But I fear I would have been the exception. This lingering feeling of sadness. This dread when my house is silent at night. This fear of a knock at the door tells me otherwise. This happened to me last night. I live in a sketchy neighborhood in an old house with two other roommates. One of my roommates was at work that night, and the other was with her boyfriend. That meant I was home alone. Normally, I'd stay up until about 2 or 3 a.m., but because I hadn't slept well the night before this happened, I crashed at around 12 this night. Since our house is old, it has a few defects. One of them is a front door which jams when it's locked, and takes forever to unjam once it's unlocked. To avoid this, we just don't lock the door. This is clearly a dumb practice, but my roommate who's lived in this house for five years now claims to have never had a problem with anybody breaking in. At around 2 a.m. or so, I woke up and noticed a silhouette standing about two feet away from my bed. Whoever this was appeared to be a man about six feet tall, wearing a hoodie, he was holding his cell phone towards me with the flashlight on my face. My sleep fog brain tried to rationalize what the heck was going on. First, I thought maybe my roommate and her boyfriend had come home and needed something from me. I called out hello and then remembered that my roommate's boyfriend was much shorter and more slender as well. It began to dawn on me that this person obviously was not supposed to be in my house. I started asking, who are you? The man remained where he was, still watching me, 
taking pictures and recording me, or whatever the hell he was doing with his phone. I asked him again, and started to get up now. The man just turned around and briskly walked out of my room. I heard the front door close behind him as I tried to follow. By now, I was fully awake and freaking the fuck out. I frantically called my best friend Melody and told her what happened. She called the cops while I was on the phone with her. The cops came and took some fingerprints, but couldn't really go looking for the guy since I didn't have a good description of him at all and they weren't able to get much evidence. They told me to call them if anything else happened and then they left. Needless to say, I didn't sleep well for the rest of the night. When I was about seven years old, my dad bought a few hundred acres in southern Mississippi, about one and a half hours west of Mobile, Alabama. He built a small cabin on top of a hill that was in the middle of a large field surrounded by woods. This house was about five miles from a paved road to get to our land. It took nearly ten minutes of driving down dirt roads from the main highway, which was south of the house. About a quarter mile north from the house, he had built a small lake, more like a pond, really. It was about as long as a football field, and slightly wider. To get to the lake from the house, you could take a route which was a hard-packed dirt road that was lined with dogwood trees. It was beautiful in the spring. Route B was about a hundred yards east of Dogwood Lane. We named it Vampire Trail because it was always so gloomy. The trees blocked out the sun on the brightest days. It had a slight decline as you walked toward the lake. I say walked because this trail was definitely not for vehicles. Thick woods filled the area outside and in between both trails. One morning during the fall, my parents and little sister had gone to get ice cream and do some shopping. This trip would take them at least an hour. I was ten years old. I decided to go fishing while listening to Bama play the game. The game was the usual Bama win, so I thought I would ease the boredom of a blowout by fishing in the well-stocked lake. I carried my pole and small radio, as well as my small ice chest. I had an Airedale Terrier named Bully that never left my side. It was on this day I realized how awesome he really was. On to the lake we went. Picture a large oval roughly the size of a football shield but larger, with an I-shaped pier in the southeast corner. Vampire Lane opened up to a more severe decline on the shore. Then the small pier across the lake on the west side. There was a narrow tree line that separated the shore from Dogwood Lane. The north side of the lake was the dam, and the south end ended in thick and swampy woods. Fortunately for me, I realized this later. Five minutes after I threw out my line and two Bama touchdowns later, I got that feeling. It's a feeling I've come to recognize well, and it may have saved my life this day. The feeling of being watched by something dangerous. Bully was alerted too, because a few seconds later I could hear him growling low and staring across the lake to the west to the tree line that separated Dogwood Lane from our area. I turned my head in that direction. Almost immediately, my eyes lit upon what I thought to be a silhouette of a large man hiding behind a tree. It was too far to make out details, but close enough to be sure of what I was seeing. Almost five minutes went by, and right before I scolded myself for an overactive imagination, the half-silhouette moved behind the tree slowly. Bully stood his ground even louder, and I told him quietly to stop. I turned my head north towards the dam, while keeping my eyes and attention rooted to that tree. Over the next ten minutes, which felt like hours, I watched while this figure slowly moved from tree to tree, always north, and always facing me. The saying scared stiff was something I found to be true in that moment. For some reason, I thought it important that whoever or whatever this was did not know that I was aware they were there. 
I finally realized that this thing's path was bringing it closer to the dam, which would in turn make its path to me shorter and easier. My paralysis broke, and I casually put down my fishing pole. I started to walk towards Vampire Lane. As an adult, I was in the army for 11 years as an MP, but not turning to look over my shoulder during that walk was the hardest thing I've ever done. In my mind's eye, whatever it was was screaming across the dam towards me. When I hit the tree line, I broke into a run. As I was running, Bully dashed ahead of me. My anger turned into admiration as he stopped 20 yards ahead and faced north until I passed him. He continued this action the entire run home. My dog was watching my back. It was epic. Although I can grasp the awesomeness of this now, at the time I was so scared that I was literally sick. Even at such a young age, I knew that a large man watching and trying to creep upon a ten-year-old boy was no good. When I reached the cabin, I immediately locked the door and got one of my dad's shotguns as well as his thirty-eight revolver. I sat at the large front window, my eyes glued to both trail openings and woods between them. My family returned shortly after, and for some reason I didn't mention what happened. I never felt safe there again. When me and my friends or my little sister wanted to go anywhere other than the area around the cabin, I made sure my parents were with us. What scares me the most, though, is the fact that our neighbors were about two miles northwest of us, with thick woods in between as the crow flies. Who or what was watching me from the woods that day, I guess I'll never know. Sometimes I wish I could go back to then as a grown man with military training, as I am now. Bully lived the full life and was put to sleep peacefully as a very old but great dog. The best dog I've ever known. So I just started dating my current girlfriend around a year and a half ago. I decided to take her to a small beach on a lake in a neighboring town. We went to talk and look at the stars. We left my house and drove to the lake, parked my car, and walked the fourth mile to the beach. We talked, laughed, and kissed for about an hour when I suddenly started to feel uneasy. This was quite strange, as I didn't usually feel this way. I looked up to the tree line on the beach, and would you look at that, there was a man standing near a tree, staring towards us. I didn't say anything yet, as to not scare my girlfriend. I kept watching him out of the corner of my eye, and noticed he was inching closer. He was still 100 yards or more away, when I saw the moonlight reflect off something in his hand. It took me a moment to realize this was a deer knife. I very calmly turned to my girlfriend and said, We need to leave now. We started to walk quickly to my car. I glanced over my shoulder at the man three or four times, but he didn't seem to be moving towards the road where we'd parked. Finally, we jumped in the car. She asked me what all that was about. I told her there had been a man with a knife watching us and began the drive home. About two minutes in, I called the police to give them a heads up about the man. I can't imagine what would have happened if I didn't notice him and get out of the area right away. This happened a few years ago, when I was about 13. My best friend and I were at a lake in the middle of Georgia, trying to fight the almost 125 degree Fahrenheit weather. We decided to swim to our secret spot. It was really just a sort of cave made out of fallen tree roots. We did the routine snake check and swam in, climbing onto a rock to get inside. We started talking and gossiping, and all was normal, until about 45 minutes later... We heard a truck pulling up and the sound of someone getting out. We guessed it was some people going fishing, since the lake was full of bass and other big fish. We started whispering, hoping the person wouldn't find our hiding spot. 
We heard the splash of someone getting into the water. We brushed it off again until we saw a man about 50 to 60 years old swimming over to our spot. We both looked at each other but didn't move, frozen with fear. He came closer and started treading water about three feet away from the edge of our rock. He asked us our names and we both replied with fake ones. We weren't entirely stupid. He told us they were pretty names, and then in the creepiest voice I ever heard, he looked us both up and down and whispered, We have some very beautiful young ladies here. Someone like me could easily take advantage of you. He climbed up onto the rock. We then saw he was completely naked. We screamed as he lunged at us. We both dove away into the water. He managed to grab a hold of my friend's bikini top and ripped it off as she dived in. We were both fairly fast swimmers, and we hightailed it back to my friend's mom and explained what happened. While we were in the middle of explaining, the man swam up and started to walk towards us. That was until he saw my friend's mom was there. He quickly ran off into the bushes. His truck drove by a few minutes later, but we couldn't get the tag numbers because he was going so quickly. We called the cops, but from what I've heard, he was not caught. I haven't heard anything else about it since. I moved across the country, but this experience will likely never leave my mind. I'm a workout addict. I love to lift and run. I run about 12 miles a week, typically. Three miles, four separate days. Every day that I run, I take the same trails that surround the lake in my hometown. These trails are relatively secluded. However, usually they have fellow runners and wanderers scattered throughout. That means there's usually people most times during the day and in the early evening. I always, always run a particular trail that's my personal favorite. It's very nearby my home, not even a half mile away. This entire past week, my local gym was closed due to renovations, so I filled my week with about twice the amount of running as usual. I couldn't lift, so I had to get that extra exercise in somewhere. Because of my sudden increase in running, though, my tendonitis flared up. I always get overzealous and tend to do that to myself. This will come back into play in a bit. Now, I'm hoping I'm able to describe this little picnic area and make some sense. At a certain point, the trail guides you to this adorable picnic scene. There are parking spaces and picnic tables equipped with grills scattered throughout the lakeside area. Families are always grilling here constantly. It's lovely. Behind a certain table, often one of the more secluded areas, there's a great little dirt trail leading to a lovely cliff overlooking the entire lake. I always loved to go out here alone since my childhood, as it's always been a rather safe area. I was finishing up what would be my last run before my tendonitis flare-up, forcing me to rest more or less. It was dusk, and I was just about to cross the adorable park and go onward through that trail towards home. When I hit the park, though, I stopped, thinking I might as well head towards my belovedly hidden trail to take a brief rest on my favorite cliffside. I'm not one to be paranoid, and I'm quite adventurous. After many hours listening to these types of stories, though, I decided to maybe not. I picked up my speed when I noticed a van parked. There usually were people there though, so I didn't think much of it. Maybe a fisherman. I moved along. Thanks to all that working out though, the next day I had such brutal pain from overdoing it. I could hardly walk, let alone run. I took some time off that morning. I slept in late and woke up to a news update for my news app stating the police were investigating a burned and dismembered female body found at the lake just a few hours before I had woken up. I opened up the article to find the worst news. Where the body was found burned and gruesomely chopped to pieces was in my favorite trail, right between the picnic table and my beloved cliff, less than one mile away from my home. 
the area I run through four times a week. The same area where I almost explored just a day or so ago, as I had done since I was in elementary school. The same area that these kinds of stories created a paranoia of and averted me from visiting that evening with a sketchy gray van. They're still investigating, but nobody has been caught yet. I'm less than a mile away from there, sitting in my dark house, praying that whoever did this gets caught real fast. All I can say is how thankful I am to be safe and alive. I'm grateful for not being that poor soul to discover the body either, because that very easily could have happened to me. That's how much time I spend up there, and that's how close this all is to me. I still don't have a clue if that van truly was involved, but it seems very odd. Especially because I have a couple of friends who run in the same area, but stopped after weeks of seeing a gray van driving by each time they went out to run. So my family owns a cabin on a small lake in New Hampshire. We go there every summer. It's basically our home away from home. There are other houses on the lake, quite a few near us, but beyond that it's a pretty rural area. Miles of woods stretch beyond those lake houses, so there's really no reason to be in the area, unless you were hunting, staying in a lake house, or visiting the lake itself for whatever reason. So, one night, maybe six years ago, it was pretty late, probably around midnight or so. My ex and I were just lying in bed, chatting about whatever. All of a sudden, we heard footsteps outside the open window. The window lays only about halfway up on the wall to the side of the bed. It was situated so that it opens right at the bottom of the bed where our feet are. The ground around my house is covered in a layer of pine needles that drop from above so it's pretty hard to walk quietly around it. The footsteps sounded like whatever was making them was trying its very hardest not to be heard. They sounded relatively close by, too. We rationalized to ourselves that they were probably being made by some sort of animal. A couple of minutes go by, and we hear them again, except this time they seem much closer. They seem to be right outside the window, still trying to move quietly at this point. The two of us were starting to get a little bit freaked out. To our mutual horror, we look down and see a hand slowly coming through the window. Obviously, we screamed and woke up the entire house. My parents came running out of their adjacent room and we told them what happened. My father just rationalized it as the event being a figment of our imaginations. To this day, I still don't know if he was right. The weird thing is, though, both my ex and I saw the exact same thing. How could it just be our imaginations when we were so in sync about all the details? I still feel uneasy, staying in that room, and I always make sure the window is shut and locked before I go to bed. About four years ago, I was walking my dog around 9 to 10 p.m. It was the middle of summer, and the only time I could walk her was at night, so she wouldn't get too hot. My area is a very small suburb where nothing ever happens usually. People there are very friendly. I rarely see anyone else when I'm walking at night, though. In my town, there's a small lake surrounded by woods, and there's a path that goes through those woods to lead around one side of the lake. It brings you out to a big clearing on the other side that's used as a park with picnic tables, benches, and lights on at night. You can see the clearing from the other side of the lake because of this. When you go first into the woods, there's a smaller clearing. My dog loved to walk on that path, so I decided to take her there. We get to the opening of the woods, where the path starts, when my dog stops dead in her tracks. I tug her leash a bit and tell her to come on, but she just won't move. She isn't sniffing or anything, just, just standing there looking out into the woods, looking scared with her ears back and her tail down. 
She did tend to get scared of little things, so I figured she'd heard a noise or something out there and was just overreacting. I kept trying to coax her to move. She'd glance at me when I called her, but for the most part, she was just frozen staring at the woods. Finally, I got her to go forward several steps very slowly. We were only a couple of feet from the entrance to the woods now, when she suddenly stopped again. I was getting more than a little annoyed with her. I looked down at her and told her to come on. I see that she's looking out towards the lake. Again looking frightened. I follow her eyes to the clearing on the other side, when I see a figure sitting on top of one of the picnic tables. It's not unusual to see other people at the lake, although I'd never seen anyone at night before. The person I could see was dressed all in black, hood up with his back to us. I was fairly certain this was a man. I did get a little bit nervous, but I didn't really see it as a big deal. It wasn't that late, and other people like being out at night too, so it's not that weird. My dog was always friendly though, and never afraid of people. I was wondering what exactly was freaking her out here. I decided to keep walking through the woods, then cut to an area a little ways ahead where the trees weren't very dense. I called my dog quietly. She moved on another several steps, so we were in the middle of the clearing. It was pretty dark. There was just a street lamp from behind us adding some dim lighting to the area. My dog stopped again and looked back towards the man, then quickly turned around and started pulling to go back in the direction we came. She was very freaked out, tail tucked between her legs, ears back, panting hard. I looked back to the other side. The man was now facing me. He seemed to be looking right at me. I looked back at him for a few moments. Then, getting intimidated, I turned back to leave the woods the way we came. My dog was tugging so hard, I could barely hang on to the leash. She kept trotting ahead of me, until we were about a block away from the woods. That was when she finally slowed down. We kept going for a few minutes, when she suddenly got that same panicked look on her face. She turned and yanked me down a side street that was a shortcut to my house, going as fast as she could. I got an uneasy feeling. I looked back, only to see the man in all black on the street we'd just come from, watching us. He was standing there with his hands in his pockets, almost casually. He was smiling slightly. I turned around and didn't look back again. I started jogging towards my house with my dog. I let her leash go when we got to the driveway, and she took off running to the backyard. I still walked my dog at night after that. But I never took her back to that lake area except during the day. I had nightmares about that man for a while. It always unnerved me. Just how had he so quickly caught up to us? There are some shortcuts he could have taken to get to the other side of the lake without going all the way around the path. But he still made it there in just five minutes. He had to have run or something. I've never seen my dog so scared of a person. And I've never seen her like that ever since. This happened to myself and a close friend, both 23-year-old males, just last month. We decided to go on a two-night backpacking camping trip in the Adirondack Mountains of New York. We were both very comfortable with nature and spent a lot of time camping, hunting, and fishing. We hiked about five miles up to a small lake and set up camp on a small beach that was not heavily trafficked. We didn't expect to run into anyone our first night there. As we were sitting around the fire, we saw a flashlight moving on the other side of the lake. It was at around 10.30. This was fairly unusual. However, we didn't give it too much thought. As time went on, though, this flashlight kept moving around the lake, getting closer and closer to our campsite. We kept discussing who could possibly be wandering around the woods in the middle of the night. We didn't particularly want an unwelcome guest. Once it was clear that the person or people were headed towards our campsite, we moved off into the woods nearby to see who would wander up. I took a small axe with me, and my friend had a 22 rifle. 
Now, we weren't expecting trouble, and we certainly didn't want to make any ourselves, but we figured we might as well cover our bases. Now, the moment of truth. The flashlight neared the light of our fire, and we could see it was a lone man. He had a beard, and was probably in his mid-forties. The scary part was that he was carrying what turned out to be a pump-action shotgun. He walked around the campsite a few times, then proceeded to enter the tent. After rummaging around for a minute or so, he came out yelling, I know you're out there. Why don't you come out and say hello to my friend here? I remained motionless under a hemlock tree about 50 yards away. This is when the man proceeded to randomly fire his shotgun into the woods. It was not far from where we were. He also swung his flashlight around several times. After what felt like hours, he grabbed my friend's backpack and a few articles of clothing drying off near the fire and threw them in to burn. My friend trained the 22 at the man and asked if he should shoot him. I told him absolutely not unless he spotted us. He started to point the gun in our direction. Thankfully, the man moved off to where he had come from just a little while after. We waited until his flashlight was on the other side of the lake. We ran out and grabbed everything we could fit in my pack and took off soon after. It was now around 2 or 3 a.m. We ran out of the trail with flashlights and made it back to my car. The sun was coming up now. We immediately went to the police department and reported it, where we also spoke with some forest rangers. That was it. We haven't heard anything back from the police. It wasn't that mysterious. However, it made me feel fear that I had never felt before in my entire life. I recently moved into a big house just temporarily. It's kind of a complicated situation. The house belongs to a family member, and they were going to be gone for a few months on end. That sort of thing. I was going to be there all on my own. So obviously, my first thought was, what if it's haunted there? There wasn't anything in the house when I moved in. There is now, though. I was in the main hallway unpacking some stuff when the doorbell rang. That put me on edge right away. Because this house was at the end of a very long driveway, and it was really out of the way as well. You'd have to really go looking for it to find it. There was an old woman at the door. It was broad daylight, but there was still something kind of off about her. This woman was pretty tall, almost a full head taller than me. I thought there was something weird about the way she looked as well. It was like none of her clothes fit properly. She took my hand and smiled really wide. She told me she was from the neighborhood council or something like that, and asked if she could come in and talk to me. My gut reaction was to say no, but I couldn't really think of a reason as to why. After all, this was just an old woman. What was she really going to do to me? I wish I had just slammed the door in her damn face. I brought her into the living room, and she sort of tottered behind me, like her feet didn't quite fit into her shoes properly. She sat down without asking, and grinned at me until I took a seat across from her. For about half a minute, she didn't say anything. She just smiled and stared at me, while it got increasingly awkward. Just as I was about to break the silence, she fished in her pocket and pulled out this really big, old-fashioned suite, the types that come in that see-through wrapping. Here you go, she said. Yes, I should probably point out here that she spoke really quietly, so it was difficult to hear anything she was saying. I accepted this suite, kind of taken aback. I unwrapped it. It was dark red, almost black. I popped it in my mouth because she was still grinning at me, nodding her head back and forth. Have you ever walked around behind a supermarket where they keep those big bins? They throw out all the meat that's gone bad in those bins. Imagine that rancid smell, but on a hot summer day, so thick you can almost feel it in the air. That's what this sweet tasted like. I almost spit it out on the floor, but wanting to be nice made me chew the thing and force it down my throat. The woman was talking all the time, but between the taste and her quiet voice, I could barely hear what she was saying. 
My whole mouth tasted like rotten meat. I politely told her I was going to get some water and ran into the kitchen. When I came back, she was already gone. I had only been there for less than 30 seconds. My first reaction probably should have been to assume that she went to the bathroom or had to leave in a hurry. Instead, I searched the entire house. I went through every single room, convinced I was going to open a closet or look under a bed and see her stuffed in there grinning at me. That didn't happen, obviously, but I was still extremely on edge as the sun started to go down. I felt like I was turning off the light in my bedroom after spotting a giant spider in there. That night, I propped a chair against my bedroom door. Because even though it didn't make any sense, I couldn't shake the feeling that woman was still in the house somewhere hiding. I woke up around 2 in the morning and heard creaking of floorboards downstairs. It was an old house and unfamiliar. I kept telling myself that until the noises stopped. When I woke up the next morning, though, there was a red suite on the living room table. I'll tell you the same thing I told the police. No, I can't be absolutely certain the suite wasn't there the day before. Maybe I had just overlooked it, but I didn't think so. They told me the organization the woman claimed to come from didn't actually exist and clearly thought I was wasting their time. After they left, I searched the entire house again, and then the grounds as well. I searched them over and over. By the time I was finished, I'd managed to calm down a bit and looked at the situation rationally. The woman probably left that suite there the previous day, and I just hadn't noticed. I had searched the whole house twice by now. There was nowhere she could possibly be hiding. She was probably just some old lady who wandered off while I was in the kitchen. As I prepared to go to bed, I had managed to fully delude myself into thinking nothing strange was going on. I decided not to do anything childish like blocking my door, because what was I afraid of, even? If she was somehow still inside the house somewhere, what was she going to do? At some point in the middle of the night, I woke up abruptly, knowing in the back of my mind that something was wrong. I guess I must have heard something in my sleep. I turned over onto my side and reached out to turn on the bedside lamp, groping around because I was in an unfamiliar room. When the light came on, I saw the old woman standing right next to my bed. I only got a brief glimpse of her though, because as soon as I screamed, she scuttled backward out the door really fast. I only got the briefest glimpse of her before she vanished into the unlit hallway outside my door. I now believe that the human brain has a special compartment for dealing with experiences far outside the realm of natural or something. If I had woken up to find a burglar in my room, I probably would have gone numb with panic. If there was a lion at the foot of my bed, I would have been too paralyzed with fear to do anything. But as soon as that woman was gone, that special compartment took over. I jumped out of bed, slammed the door shut, and shoved a chair against the handle. Then I dashed for my phone. No signal and no internet. I later found out there was nothing wrong with the phone or the local service at the time, so that woman must have been interfering with it somehow. The drop from the bedroom window wasn't too high if I landed just right. I would probably avoid injury, but what would happen if I sprained my ankle or broke my leg? I suddenly had a vision of pulling myself across the dark garden while the woman sprinted after me. I decided I didn't want to risk it. That gave me two options. Wait out the night in my bedroom or try to get out of the house right now. I went for the second one. I was thinking this flimsy barricade wouldn't hold if this woman decided she wanted back in. I broke one of the chair legs off and crept slowly into the hallway, reaching carefully around for the light switch. When I pressed it, the lights came on for a second, then faded out. I flicked the switch a few more times, noting some gut instinct that told me she must have sabotaged them in some way. I used my phone for light. As I slowly and quietly crept along the upstairs hallway and down the stairs, the light barely traced the shapes of the walls and the dark yawning frames of open doorways. I jumped at every single shadow, an unidentifiable shape. I was certain that at any second that grinning face would appear from the shadows. I got downstairs to the front door, 
I had double locked it and put the chain in place. Just as I was reaching for the first lock, I heard rapid, uneven footsteps at the top of the stairs, approaching swiftly. I undid the first lock, and as I did so, a high-pitched shriek came from the hallway. I screamed as I undid the second and wrenched the door open. It stuck fast. I had forgotten the chain. I glanced behind me and saw the tall, spindly shape of that woman, half running and half falling down the stairs towards me. She had lulled her head backward, and her mouth was hanging open with her tongue sticking out. I can't even remember getting the chain off. I might have actually just yanked the door open so hard it broke. In any case, the last I saw of that woman, her face was mere feet away from me. As I slammed the door shut, I sprinted to the nearest house. They eventually called the police. Possibly because I was half delirious with fear and babbling incoherently, the police once again failed to find anything unusual. It's been a week. I'm staying at a friend's place, sleeping with the lights on, and the bedroom door barricaded. The house's real owners aren't back yet. I'm not sure what I'm gonna tell them, but I have to stop them from going back there somehow. It's definitely not a haunting. I can't stop thinking about all the holes in our defenses. The windows and doors we carelessly leave open, the strangers invited into our living rooms. I hope to God it's just the house that woman wanted, and not me in particular. I'm a female, and at the time I was approximately 18 or 19 years old. My youngest brother was in 8th grade, and was due to be confirmed at the end of the year. For those of you who are unaware of what that is, it's a ceremony performed in Catholic elementary schools that sort of confirms your faith and dedication to the religion before sending you off to high school. For this ceremony, the person being confirmed has to have a sponsor that's 18 years of age or older, and also has to be Catholic themselves. Therefore, my brother chose me. Personally, I had moved on from Catholicism, as I did not agree with a lot of what I had learned. I accepted my brother's request, though, as it was very important to him. Fast forward to the day in which my brother was being confirmed. As a sponsor, my role was significant, but fairly short-lived. From what I can recall, we simply placed our hands on their shoulders while they made their promise to God and the religion itself, and promised to support them on their journey. I may be missing a few minor details, but that's the basic gist of it. Thus, after our portion is complete, they request that we leave the stage and join the crowd to watch the remainder of the ceremony. Due to the fact that the church was quite packed, my family was standing along the back wall. I walked off the stage and through the crowd to join them. There was not much left in the ceremony at this point, so it ended quite quickly. The students and priests began to leave the stage. They had to venture around the crowd, thus walked along the walls, as opposed to going through the middle. That day, I was wearing a bluish-colored high-neck blouse, a black knee-length skirt and gray nylons that had a black velvet rose pattern on it. As I mentioned, my family were up against the back wall of the church, preparing to move ourselves out of the way, to make room for all these students and priests that were making their way towards us. We congratulated them all as they passed by, and began saying our hellos to the priests as they made their way towards us. The very last priest in the line, though, looked to be about 80 years old or so, stopped dead in his tracks while in front of where I was standing. The priest then proceeded to slowly look me up and down twice with a very unnerving smile on his face. Following this, he leaned in and whispered the words, I like your pantyhose. I was immediately on edge and moved in closer to my family. He continued to follow the line after a few minutes. My mom turned to me and asked me if I was okay. She saw the expression on my face, and I advised her as to what had just happened. She was completely disgusted. My mother thought about saying something, but I advised her not to do so, as I didn't want to ruin my brother's day. She reluctantly agreed. As soon as we were able to, we made our way out of the church and decided at that moment we were never going back.
I'm a fairly uninteresting man in my late 20s, with a stable job and a happy family. I've never once entertained the notion that I might one day be the target of a stalker. So here's my story, as a warning to everyone. You don't have to be a pretty young lady to catch the eye of a crazy. I don't know if this will make sense, but I'm a habitual yet very casual Facebook user. I don't post a lot, but I do check my news feed very often. One Saturday night, I was doing a quick round before I went to bed. When I received a friend request, I accepted it without hesitation. Just about every friend request I received gets accepted. Because I don't post anything very personal, and I don't have any information on there either. As I said, I have a very casual approach to social networking. I do a quick glance on the profile that had befriended me, and saw it was obviously a fake account. Not thinking much about it, I put my computer away and fell asleep the next day. I was having lunch at a friend's house, having completely forgotten about the friend request from the night before. My phone buzzed, and I saw I had gotten a message from a co-worker of mine named Maya. Although Maya and I worked together, and had a few mutual friends outside of work, we didn't communicate much other than when it was about work itself. I checked it, assuming it was work-related. I guess looking back, you can say it sort of was. I get the gist of it, though. The Facebook account that had befriended me was also friends with Maya, and had bombarded her with accusations and insults of being a bitch and a slut and every other name in the book. The person took it a step forward as well by messaging Maya's husband and saying she was cheating on him with me. Maya wanted to know if I knew who this person could be. I explained to her how I accepted every friend request and had no idea who this possibly was. I then proceeded to unfriend the profile in question. Maya explained to me that she already had some suspicions on who it was and just wanted to see if I could confirm. Let's rewind a few weeks earlier. I had received a friend request from a girl named Carrie. It struck me as odd because although we worked at the same place, we'd never actually met or even spoken a single word to each other, not even made eye contact. We worked in completely different departments. I had to walk through her area to get to our lounge, but that was the furthest extent of our interactions. In fact, I only learned her name when she added me on Facebook. I recognized her picture. I'm not sure how she found out about my name. Carrie had also friended my wife, and subsequently started sifting through my wife's posts and photos, liking and commenting on several of them. She began interacting with a few things I'd posted as well. She talked as though we were the best of friends. I would walk by her as usual at work and still had no interaction. I found this odd, but I didn't think too much of it. The mysterious Facebook account continued to harass Maya until she told the person that she knew it was Carrie and was going to call the police. I thought that would be the end of things, but I was very wrong. Over several weeks, I began getting more friend requests from girls looking to hook up with me. Obviously, I knew they were all fake, and for the most part, I ignored them. I also began getting notifications from different accounts about suspicious activity on my profile. Most of the time, it was warnings for failed login attempts. I specifically remember once that my Facebook account had been logged into from somewhere unusual and asked whether or not it was me. I should have been more concerned, but for some reason, I didn't really care that much. That's pretty stupid. Even after that, I didn't bother to change my password. At the time, I viewed all these activities as random isolated incidents. I had no valuable information on there anyway, and I didn't have any private secretive messages, so what harm could a potential hacker do? A few months passed when one day, my wife gets a message from Carrie, stating she had a high-end video camera and was looking to start some amateur filming. She wanted to know if we would help her by letting her film our family for a day. Remembering what Maya had said about her, I was reluctant. I wanted to give Carrie the benefit of the doubt, though, so we agreed to tell her that we would schedule a time for whenever we weren't busy, and left it at that. Once again, I had yet to actually meet Carrie. More weeks passed by, and we'd obviously completely forgotten about scheduling with Carrie. 
She messaged me about it, and I apologized about forgetting, then turned her down when she asked to reschedule. I was feeling very uneasy about this whole thing. Then things got weird. She started to send gifts of stick figures doing sexually suggestive motions. I didn't respond. She asked, funny, isn't it? I immediately texted my wife to log into my Facebook profile to observe the messages. Not wanting to be rude, I agreed and carried on the conversation. She proceeded to send me old photos from my abandoned MySpace account that I had completely forgotten about. It was around this time when MySpace had been revamped and a lot of people lost a lot of cherished memories. Somehow she dug up all my old stuff though and decided to share it with me. Things escalated quickly from there. She began talking about her body and how she wasn't attractive, trying to bait me into complimenting her looks. I wasn't falling for it though. She hit me with something out of the blue. She asked me about my dick and suggested it was probably really big. I decided enough was enough. I stopped responding. My wife was reading the whole time and we were kind of texting back and forth about how funny and weird this girl was. I continued to go to work and still awkwardly never actually met her. I especially didn't want to strike up any conversations. After that, Carrie messaged me one final time asking me for a favor. Maya had blocked her profile and Carrie suspected she was saying bad stuff about her, so she wanted me to spy on her a bit. I confirmed to her I was not going to do this for her and that I would leave this just between us. I did check though just to see for myself. I know Maya couldn't care less than to waste her time talking about Carrie. Around this time, my wife started getting texts from an unknown number. The person knew her name and was trying to remain anonymous. They were also trying to flirt with her. We were with a bunch of friends at the time, and we all thought it would be funny if we all text flirted with this person. Once again, I never thought to connect any of these occurrences. Carrie eventually quit work, and I continued to get suspicious activity that I stupidly continued to write off. I had pretty much forgotten all about Carrie. Then, I would say over a year later, my wife dropped a bomb on me. A good friend of ours started texting my wife, saying I was sending very inappropriate messages to them on Facebook. I had been busy running errands all day though, and hadn't really checked my account at the time. When I tried to, I found my password had been changed. When I finally managed to get back in, all my messages had been cleared. I had no idea what had actually been said until I started hearing from more people. Apparently, I was being very suggestive and nasty to them. The thing was, these were not random women on my friends list. They were all targeted at women that were close to me. Good friends. My wife's sister. My friend's wives. These messages weren't holding back either. They went completely all-out graphic in detail about what I wanted to do to them. Everybody felt completely violated and humiliated. I couldn't imagine how the woman felt. My wife and I were really close to our families and friends, and every other week or so our friends would get together and drink, barbecue, watch movies or sports and hang out. We had several families over and told them about what happened. They said they understood, and they knew it wasn't really me. I could see deep down, though, they felt it was a possibility that it really was me. Over time, more and more of them stopped coming over, to the point where my home started to feel empty. I confided in my wife about how I felt they all thought it was really me, and she said I was just being paranoid. She argued that my friends were just busy with their lives and would eventually come over again. I learned that someone had created a Facebook account using my name and picture and continued harassing the same woman. Some of them posted a picture of the conversations with me on Facebook. She commented it really could be me because that mystery person talked just like me, using the same vocabulary. She also stated that the person knew my friends and family extensively. My heart instantly shattered after reading that. I quit checking my Facebook for the longest time. I guess I fell into a mild depression. I felt miserable and told my wife I wanted to disappear. I strongly considered quitting my job of seven years and moving away to start over. I know now I was being quite irrational and thankfully my wife stayed strong for me through it all. 
I felt I needed to defend my honor and started gathering alibis of times, people, and places I was around during the time of many of those messages. My wife brutally told me she couldn't believe I was weak enough to let a no-life dumbass on Facebook put me down and make me feel that way. I guess that's true. I am and always have been a mentally strong person. I always look for the best in a bad situation, but for some reason, this affected me differently. I can't explain why, but I felt extreme shame and guilt for something I didn't even do. Without my wife knocking me back to reality, I don't know what would have happened. We advised our friends to just ignore this person, and eventually everything stopped. From time to time, I still get random friend requests, but I don't accept them anymore. I don't have any proof that this was all the work of Carrie. It all just happened during a time she injected herself into my life. My friends have started coming over again, but it hasn't felt the same ever since. I don't know if it's them or just in my head. My wife and I came to the conclusion that Carrie reveled in the misery of others. After tormenting Maya, she moved on to and targeted me, trying to ruin my marriage and distance me from my friends. She did this for no reason, other than the fact she enjoyed doing it. I'm pretty sure she hasn't stopped. She left me alone only because she found a new victim to harass. When I was 15 years old, I started a live journal account. At the time, a lot of my friends were also using the platform. It was basically early social networking, where people with similar interests would come together and read each other's blogs. I had only been posting for a short while when a guy began to comment on all my entries. He said his name was John. It really should have made me more suspicious that there was a grown man trying to reach me through the internet. He claimed he knew my friend Dale, who was two years older than me. We attended the same high school. I contacted Dale and asked him about John, to which he replied, Oh yeah, John's awesome. We met on LiveJournal. He talked the guy up like he was super cool and I should totally interact with him. John continued to leave comments on my journal frequently, but in addition to that, he began to email me as well. One of the first things he sent me was a screenshot of his computer desktop where he had assembled a collage of pictures of me. He had copied them from my live journal account, which made me super uncomfortable. I told Dale about this, but he just laughed it off, saying John was just fucking with me. I decided to let it slide, because I trusted Dale. After about a year of awkward emails from John, a woman named Jillian contacted me. She claimed to be John's sister. There was some made-up convoluted story about how they weren't actually siblings but were raised together. I can't really remember all the details. She began to send me extremely vicious messages though, followed up almost immediately by apologies every time. She would talk to me like I was a puppy, saying cutesy shit like, Darling, how precious. It was about a week after that I began to suspect that Jillian didn't exist at all and was simply a creation of John's to further harass me, maybe make himself look better. Shortly after that, John began sending me into racial porn constantly and made extremely racist comments about them. That was enough for me. I blocked both him and Jillian. In retrospect, it was right about then I should have informed authorities. John eventually found a way to contact me with another email address. I'm not sure how. Maybe Dale told him. He tried to apologize for his behavior, but I just ignored him. I'd had enough of this craziness. Around this time, Dale moved to another city with two of our mutual friends, one of whom I've kept in contact with. He warned me that Dale and John had started talking a lot on the phone, and he suspected John was supplying Dale with pot because Dale had started smoking constantly. The idea that Dale and John were becoming so close made me very uneasy. Dale knew my home address, phone number, and all kinds of other personal information. Shortly after, my discomfort was validated when I received an email from John stating he was visiting my hometown soon. He intended to swing by. I emailed him back and told him that if he ever contacted me again, 
I would go straight to the police and press charges against him for harassment. I had saved every email I ever got from him or Jillian. Shortly after, I received a call from Dale. Apparently, he had received a call from John, who was enraged after I sent him that email. I decided I had to cut Dale out of my life as well. He had become untrustworthy and was letting his own life fall apart. All he ever did was smoke pot and play video games, mooching off his roommates and other friends for money and food. After a few months, his roommates kicked him out after an incident occurred at their apartment where someone tried to break down the door looking for Dale, who owed them money. Apparently, having nowhere else to go, Dale moved in with John, who turned out to be a 50-something-year-old trucker. Obviously, he didn't have a sister named Jillian. Turned out John wasn't even his real name. As far as I know, they're still living together to this day. I have no idea what motivated John to keep contacting me. I just know I dodged a bullet. Had I been less receptive or less cautious, he may have drawn me into his web of drugs and lies and ruined my future. Sometimes I do feel bad for Dale, but honestly, it's his own dumbass fault. I do hope that someday he turns his life around. I know John and I never officially met, but as far as online communications go, I hope I never receive another email from this deranged man again. This happened when I was around 12 years old. Me and my family lived in a small apartment, but it felt cozy to me. We knew some of our neighbors and would sometimes even invite them to our house. All of them were pretty great people. At the time, I used to sleep next to my brother's bed and felt safe with his presence, like nothing bad could happen to me. The only thing I can really say was bad about this apartment was that our bedroom was right next to the bedroom of our neighbor, which was a little higher up than ours. If you wanted to see their room, you could do so by getting on top of a chair, while they could see directly into our entire bedroom with no effort. Despite it being somewhat freaky, I didn't think much about it, since, like I said, I had my brother sleeping in the same room, and what could possibly go wrong with him there? Oh, how innocent I was. The day everything started, I had barely finished my dinner and decided I would like to go to sleep early. My brother was not in the room at the moment because of this. Everything seemed fine until I woke up and saw something that still gives me chills to this day. What I saw was a silhouette of a person right next to the window. While I couldn't see their face at all, I knew they were staring at me. I remember screaming as loud as I could and running desperately to the living room where my mom was watching TV. I explained what happened to her, but she didn't seem very bothered at all. She simply said, oh, okay, and continued watching TV like nothing had happened. A few days after that event, I was feeling way better about things, but even then I decided to keep the curtains closed just in case. That was until one day, when I woke up in the middle of the night for some reason and had the idea of needing to open the curtains. As you already expected, she was just staring right at me once again. Like the first time, I couldn't see her face at all, just a black figure. I don't know how many times she'd done that, but for the following days after, I would wake up two to three times every night. Well, this time I kept the curtains closed, I could tell she was there trying to watch me sleep. A few days later, I decided to tell my parents the full extent of what was going on, and that's when things got even creepier. They said that on that side, right next to our apartment, lived an elderly woman who was sick and had her son taking care of her. They said that they would leave to take out the trash, and she would sneak up behind them while patiently waiting for them to turn around. I tried telling them how I felt so paranoid that she was always watching me. She's just a sick old lady. Scaring people is probably the highlight of her week. Come on, just ignore her and go back to sleep. While well, nowadays, I don't care much about that. I remember being very angry with them at the time. Why weren't they trying to help me? I did exactly as they said. 
I just tried my best to ignore her staring every night while keeping the curtains closed. It took some time, but I finally started to forget about this experience. That was until a few weeks later, when things took a turn for the far worse. From my mother's perspective, our family was always different from others. My mom was the one working all day, while my dad would be at home with us. So he would always bring me and my brother to school, then go pick us up when it ended. One day, I was at school waiting for my dad to arrive, when a friend came up to me and said she could bring me home with her dad's car. I completely forgot my father was coming to get me, so I said yes and went inside. When I got back home, I knocked at the door, but other than my two dogs barking, there was no response. I started to get anxious, so I kept knocking over and over until I heard a big sound coming from the old woman's apartment. That's when I realized I had made a big mistake. As soon as I heard that sound, I ran to the elevator and clicked the buttons as many times as I could. Our elevator had a window at the center, so I was terrified she would show up in it. Thankfully, she didn't. After I left the building, I decided to lay down on the street trying to process what happened. My friends saw me and invited me into their house. I watched cartoons while her dad called mine, explaining why I was not at school. When my dad came back, I ran to him and gave him a big hug while crying. My brother's class usually ended about 30 minutes after mine, so we had to go back to school together and get him. The entire time, I was expecting my father to scold me, but instead he was very calm and even told me he was thinking of buying a cell phone so I could message him if anything happened. After that experience, I was even more terrified of the old woman. I kept the curtains closed like usual and kind of got used to it. Eventually, we moved to a different house and I never saw that woman again. Not that I would be able to recognize her really, since every time I saw her at the window, her face was completely black. That's how my story ends. Thankfully, I didn't get to see how crazy she looked. I realize maybe this story is not as scary as some others you've heard, but in any case, I hope you enjoyed it. This happened to me when I was 17 years old. I was just about to graduate high school. I was homeschooled and very encouraged to pursue entrepreneurship. I was trying to establish a photography business that I could run after graduating. In order to build up my portfolio, I decided to ask a few friends and acquaintances to model for me. I asked a girl I worked with if she and her husband would like to model a couple's session with me. It would be a win-win, since they would receive free photos, and I would get to add them to my website as sample work. We planned a day to meet up, and I asked them to meet me at a local park one evening. Something you should know about this park is that it's pretty far out in the country. It has soccer fields, baseball fields, a golf course, and walking trails, so it's a fairly large plot of land that's also fairly secluded. The only house in view of the entire park is the caretaker's home, directly across the street from the entrance. Unless there is an event or a weekend, there's usually not many people there at all. I felt pretty confident about meeting up there, because I was only planning to arrive about 15 minutes early to set up. I wouldn't be alone there long. The park has an entrance where you can drive down a road into the parking lot to get to all the sports fields, playground, and also the pond. The front of the park had a large grassy strip, which is where I was planning to set up for my photos. I bypassed the entrance and pulled into a little dirt section at the front of the park. I began to unload all my props. I was always taught to be a cautious person, especially as a young woman. I took a quick glance around to see if anyone else was around. I saw one car in the parking lot and two guys tossing a ball in the baseball field, along with their dog. Across the street, I could see the caretaker out in her yard, so I felt a lot better about things. I would keep an eye out, but I continued to set up my things fairly peacefully. I would glance up every now and then and see the two men were still on the baseball field. I had no reason to believe they would bother me, but something in my gut told me to just keep watch. 
The couple I was waiting on seemed to be running late. I finished my setting up and glanced up to check on the two guys. To my horror, they were gone. The car was still there, but the men and their dog were nowhere in sight. There was a bit of a hill in front of me that blocked some of the park entrance from sight. Maybe they had decided to walk one of the nature trails. Something in my gut, though, was telling me that something was wrong here. I looked at the caretaker's house, and she had gone back inside. I was all alone now. I couldn't get everything back into the car quickly, so I just grabbed my camera equipment and hopped inside. I locked the doors, turned on the ignition, and got my phone out. Literally, as soon as I got in my car, I could see the two guys running up over the hill towards me with their dog. I felt my gut feeling melt into panic. You have to understand, there was no reason for them to be running at me like this. It was literally just an open grassy yard. If their dog needed to relieve himself or something, there was plenty of woods at the edge, or the nature trail itself. Heck, the walk to the pond, all of which were way closer to them than where I was. They walked around my setup, and when they got to my car, one guy went around the front, and the one holding the dog on the leash circled around the back. I assumed they realized I had already noticed they were coming, and I was no longer vulnerable. They continued to circle me for a few moments, before they rejoined together and walked further down, up and around the soccer field. Once I felt like I was no longer in danger, I glanced down at my phone, only to see the couple I was supposed to meet up with had apparently forgotten our appointment and were at the beach right now. I was so fed up at that point I jumped out of the car, snatched up all my props, and shoved them inside. This was my first experience of how scary it can be to be a female out alone. I've had multiple experiences since then, but this is the one that sticks out to me the most. I'm absolutely certain those guys intended to do me harm. What kind of match would a 17-year-old girl be against two grown men and a pit bull? One thing's for certain, I'm not going back to that park alone. Some context first. This story took place in 2020, when I was 18 years old. I lived in a relatively safe neighborhood, but my country does have a high crime rate in general, so take that with a pinch of salt. My dad had passed away earlier in the year, and I have no siblings either, so my mom and I lived all alone in our house. The COVID lockdowns were still in place, but as certain restrictions were lifted, People were starting to return to work. Between my house and the train tracks was a big stretch of empty field. It became a safe, quiet space for me to escape to whenever I needed to get out of the house for a while. I would normally sit there once a day for a cigarette or two, sometimes having my own little picnic. My home situation was complicated to say the least, and due to the pandemic I had nowhere else to go. On this particular day, I went there for a few minutes to smoke as I always did. I was about halfway through my cigarette when I noticed a young man walking along the train tracks on the other side of the field. He was barefoot and wearing dirty, worn-out clothes. The man noticed me and made a hand gesture suggesting he was asking for a smoke. I should have just left, but as a teenager, I found it quite difficult to say no to people. I walked a bit towards him and offered him a smoke. He took it from me, but immediately I felt uneasy about the way he was looking at me. The man asked me, Don't you live in that house right over there? He pointed right at my exact address. I avoided answering his question, and at this point I realized I needed to leave right now. I had left from my front gate that day. For him to know where I lived, he must have watched me leave from the back gate before. I told him I needed to get going. He started insisting on giving me a hug to say thank you though. I declined several times, and at this point I started backing away quickly. I didn't get very far though. The man easily caught up to me and wrapped his arms around my waist. I panicked not knowing what to do. All I could think of was that I needed to get away from this man. As I tried to start running from his grip, 
He grabbed me harder from behind and started dragging me towards the row of houses where the view of the road was completely blocked off. The fences were high, too, so no one could see that area from their backyards. We were completely isolated. I was kicking and struggling, desperate to get out of his grasp. He ended up throwing me against the ground, with him jumping on top of me still holding on. In a split second, my life flashed before my eyes. That feeling that something terrible was about to happen came over me. I couldn't escape. This man was too strong. My arms were trapped by his, and he was holding me down so I couldn't kick him. I did the only thing left to do. I started screaming desperately for help. Suddenly, I was free. I could move again. He had let go and jumped off of me. He ran away so fast I could barely even register it. My heart was pounding furiously. I was shaking in shock from what had just happened. He disappeared into the industrial area on the other side of the train tracks. I immediately ran towards the road. As I reached it, I noticed it was empty. There were no cars parked in my neighbor's driveways either. No one heard me screaming, and had he realized that, that day would have had a far worse ending for me. He clearly knew where I lived, and I was terrified of him returning. For months after, I had panic attacks and nightmares, and I could barely leave my house without breaking down. I moved away from there a year later, but I still sometimes get scared when I'm home alone or when I have to walk around town. I never tell anyone this story, but reading all the stories on here, I feel like I need to post about it. Because of this, I don't go on walks alone, or even with friends, unless it's a very public place. Even then, I'm somewhat paranoid. With that being said, my friends and family had just moved to a new town 15 minutes from where I lived. It was a complete ghost town, with one tiny grocery store, a single post office, and a school. This town was so secluded and quiet that I rarely ever even saw cars drive by. One night, as we were unpacking boxes, we heard a knock at the door. It was a big, tall man with a shotgun in his hands. Being from Oklahoma, this could mean either you're meeting your hick new neighbor, or that it's actually someone wanting to harm us. Turns out it was just the hick neighbor coming to introduce himself. He was also fairly nice. He told my friend's mom about the lack of police and how everyone needs to carry their own guns in order to protect themselves. The police are usually of no help, being so far away. He talked about how these areas can be dangerous and advised my friend's mom to get a gun and keep it with her. At this time, I was 13 years old, and knowing this information, you would think I would simply stay my ass inside and not wander about the streets of dangerous hillbilly ghost town. But that's exactly what I did. There was no service, no cable, and nothing to do except go outside. We would walk to the store and get snacks, walk to the school and play on the playground. The majority of the time, we wouldn't see a single car or person. The same clerk was in the grocery store on every walk we took. There was a day my dad had brought me to her house, and right off the bat, we walked to the park. That day, I was sick to my stomach, but I was so eager to see my friend that I went anyways. I had a terrible feeling, and now that I'm older and have experienced bad anxiety, I can now say that day I was experiencing some pretty severe anxiety. I didn't know why I felt this way, though. When we got there, we actually ended up hanging out with an old friend who had transferred to the school a year prior. After he left, we sat down on the bench for what felt like ages, taking selfies and talking. All of a sudden, a stereotypically creepy van pulled up to the park. Now, my friend was and still is braver than I was or will ever be, and she was always the daredevil one in our friendship. For some reason around this time, I just assumed it was a family coming to play. My anxiety was gone, but my friend was real scared. She immediately got a bad feeling when the van pulled up, and I could tell she was ready to leave. We decided to stay, though, and see who this was before just running off. 
Of course, like something out of a movie, two giant men jumped out and literally started barreling over to where we were. We immediately started to walk away, but they tried to follow and grab us. At this point, we began to run. They jumped back into their van and started to follow us. I have no idea how they didn't catch up to us, but we ran as fast as we could up the road and straight to the grocery store. I was so horrified when we got inside, I couldn't even speak. That sick feeling I felt on the way to my friend's house made complete sense to me now. My mom was always watching true crime growing up, and sometimes she would even have me watch with her. I was already really scared to walk around because of that, but even with all that fear, I never thought it would happen to me. The van parked outside across the street while we stayed in the store, but eventually they drove off. We walked home with no way to call anyone, thinking they could be waiting for us around every corner with absolutely no one around to help us. That was the scariest day of my life. I didn't tell anyone for years, which was kind of stupid of me, but at 13 years old, I didn't exactly know what to do in this kind of situation. I'm turning 21 soon, and this story still keeps me up at night sometimes. I can't help but imagine what would have happened if they had captured me and my friend. Where would we have gone, and what would have happened to us? When I was a kid, there was a family of borderline mentally challenged people in my dad's small church group. I mean, the husband and wife were both very simple, as were their two kids as well. He was a diligent and careful truck driver. That job was his life, and he was so proud of it because he was a useful contribution to society instead of sitting around on disability pay. I guess a woman committed suicide by driving across the interstate median and running head-on into his truck. I remember him talking to my father right after it happened. Everyone still thought it was an accident at that point, and he kept stressing on how he had tried to avoid her, but it seemed like she was actively steering towards him. Lo and behold, a few weeks later, it came out the woman really was suicidal. She left a note saying something to the effect that she was leaving and never coming home. She had hit him on purpose. He was cleared immediately of any disciplinary action from his company, but he never worked again. I heard his family was evicted a few months later, and he was in a mental hospital because of his fragile psyche, which was done in by this incident. This was 20 years or so ago, so I don't know what happened to him in the end, but I hope one day he got better. When I was pregnant with my first child, I worked the overnight shift at a gas station near my house to pick up some extra hours. I know this may not sound amazing, but this gas station was beautiful. It was one of those full market gas stations and in a really nice section of town. I know most stories that take place in these sorts of 24 hour settings are usually in dark and eerie places but I never once felt that way about this location. Usually, after 11 o'clock at night, it was slow. I would spend most of my shift watching YouTube or Netflix on my phone, talking to my fiancé or stocking all the shelves. There weren't even all that many overnight truck drivers buying coffee or snacks or anything. The gas station wasn't that close to any nearby highways. It was an easy job, especially being pregnant, and it paid quite well, which was the main reason I had this job. One night early in my shift, a taller man came in. I called out from behind the counter. Hey there, how you doing this evening? The man didn't respond, didn't even look in my direction. He just walked straight into the bathroom. That wasn't alarming to me, though. If I'm being honest, I knew better than most at this point that you kinda gotta go when you gotta go. I just figured he really had to go badly to the bathroom. After nearly 20 minutes had passed, though, I realized they had never come out. I was a little bit concerned and was thinking about knocking on the door to make sure he was alright. I slowly started making my way to the bathroom and saw he had finally come out. 
I got a good look at his face at this point. He was normal looking as could be, clean shaven with a tan complexion. He had short gray hair that was parted and combed nicely. Even though his hair was gray, he couldn't have been older than 40 years old. He was wearing jeans, a flannel, and work boots that looked really beat up. I got the impression this guy must be some kind of blue collar worker and was just stopping in to use the restroom. He walked right by me again and didn't say a single word. He walked outside, but didn't get into any vehicle. He looked like he walked to the side of the building. That's when I noticed there were no vehicles out there whatsoever. Whoever this strange man was, he must have walked the entire way here. That ordeal was a little bit off-putting, but overall I stopped thinking about it just a couple of minutes later. It was an uneventful part of working these late night shifts. You get your array of strange individuals, and usually nothing ever comes of it. As the night continued, I ended up calling my fiancé. We were talking on the phone, passing the time. It had to be at least an hour later. The door opened, and to my surprise, it was the same guy. I didn't say anything to him, figuring that maybe he spoke another language or something. Well, that theory went out the window instantly, because instead of walking to the bathroom this time, he walked right up to the counter and asked me in a very polite voice, Hello, ma'am. You can say hello to me now. He smiled as he said it, indicating to me that he was joking around. I nervously smiled. Sorry about that, sir. Hello. How are you doing this evening? He smiled and only responded with one word, in an abrupt tone. Jerky. I jumped back a little bit and said, Excuse me? The man then leaned in toward me, and his polite voice changed into a more aggressive tone. I want beef jerky. Where is it? I pointed over to the rack, where all the jerky and Slim Jims were located. He smiled at me, and now in a polite tone once again, he said, I thank you, ma'am. He slowly walked over to the beef jerky and stopped once he got to the rack. He was standing completely still when he said to me, You know, you look just like a Disney princess. I was a bit creeped out, but said thank you anyway, figuring he was just trying to be nice. I look like a lot of things, sure, but one thing I definitely do not look like is a Disney princess. Trust me. Without grabbing any of the jerky, he marched back over to the counter and started to stare at me. I know staring on its own is harmless, but this stare was so intrusive and made me incredibly uncomfortable. His eyes were flying around like ping pong balls. Yeah, that's it. Disney princess. See it now? I gave a little half smirk, but apparently that wasn't good enough for this man. He started to shout, and I mean quite literally starting to scream. What, you don't like Disney? I didn't even have time to respond before he started to shout again. My daughter used to like Disney, and now she's just like you. I started to gather that clearly this man was not right in the head. I had no idea what that statement was even supposed to mean. His daughter is just like me? As calmly as I could, I said, I'm sorry if I offended you. I'm just... He cut me off and started to scream uncontrollably. At this point, he wasn't even saying anything that made any sense at all. It was just a lot of gibberish and nonsense. Saying things like, Instead of princess, you all want to be heroes. And even more strangely, I could be a king, and instead I'm here. It was clear to me that this man was having some sort of breakdown. Thankfully, I'd never hung up on the phone with my fiancé, who was witnessing this entire unhinged conversation. He felt like something was clearly not right, and he didn't want to take any chances. He called the police and told them I was dealing with an unhinged, unruly, and potentially hostile customer. Well, I've never been more thankful for my fiancé, because during the man's rant, he did indeed start becoming hostile. He stormed back over to the beef jerky and knocked over the entire display. Even though this guy was clearly not right, this was the first moment I actually felt physically unsafe. After knocking over the display, he turned and looked at me. His eyes were almost indescribable. They looked void of any emotion. In that moment, two cop cars pulled up, but the man didn't even flinch. He just stood over by the rack and continued to stare at me. 
The cops walked inside, and to their credit, they didn't overreact at all. They remained very cool. One of the officers came to me and made sure I was all right, which I was. The other officer went over to the man and was talking to him quietly. I couldn't make out any of the words the cop was saying to him, but the man looked very upset. He didn't lose his temper as he did moments ago, though. The officers escorted him out, not in handcuffs or anything. Literally just walked him outside and had a conversation. It lasted a good 20 minutes or so. One officer left with the man with the other hanging around at the gas station with me, making sure the man did not attempt to come back. I have no idea what would have happened if my fiancé wasn't still on the phone and called the police. The man was becoming more and more enraged with every moment that passed by. I never saw the guy again, and I never placed any official report really after this night. I didn't work another overnight shift. I know some people may have had far worse and more terrifying stories of working overnight. I truly do feel for those people. However, this was the worst thing that ever happened to me personally, and even though I was left with no physical harm, the fear I felt that evening, looking into the eyes of this crazed man, is something that will always be burned into my brain. Anybody who's ever worked at a fast food restaurant overnight knows just how unique some patrons can be. To add another variable to this already great combination, I worked at a 24-hour McDonald's that was directly off an exit. It was a frequent stop for truckers, cops, drunks, and anybody looking to get hot food in the middle of the night. As you would expect, I met countless characters I could describe. I could write a book about every strange and unique human being I met while working at that job. I've even had some wild experiences with people who decided to have an all-out brawl right in the middle of the restaurant. But none of those experiences were as scary or crazy to witness as this one. I guess only once in the two years I worked at that restaurant did I really experience something that horrified me. It started like most nights that I did the overnight shift. I got there at 10 and it was extremely slow. It was always really slow at that time. Then you would get a rush from about 11.30pm to 1.30am. Then, depending on the day, it would be very sporadic throughout the night. On this night, I was hoping for a slower night. It was just one of those days where I was not really feeling it at all. My car wouldn't start in the morning, my husband tried to figure it out, but unfortunately cars aren't his strong suit, so therefore I was left without a vehicle. On top of that, I felt under the weather. It happens to me every fall season. I felt like a house was crushing down on me. I just wanted to climb under a blanket and pass out, but unfortunately I got bills to pay. Unless I was extremely sick, calling in was not really an option. Thankfully, I was able to take my husband's Silverado truck to work. A little after 2 a.m., my co-worker and I were just hanging out. I ended up getting my wish, with it being slow that night. It was one of the slowest nights I could ever remember working. My co-worker went into the office to do some paperwork. I think that was really an excuse to go take a nap or something, though. I didn't have the energy to call him out on it. When I was alone at the counter, listening to YouTube on my phone, I heard the bell for the door ring. It was a peculiar-looking man walking inside. He wasn't an old man, but he wasn't exactly young either. Maybe mid-40s if I had to guess. He looked homeless, but not grungy or dirty. More like he was just not put together right. He was shorter than me, but I'm fairly tall for a woman. He couldn't have weighed more than 130 pounds. As he slowly approached the counter, I called out to him. Hey there, sir. What can I get you tonight? He just looked at me and smiled. I wish I could have a picture of that moment. The look he was giving me as he smiled made me so unsettled. Something about the way he was looking at me was just not right. It gave me the creeps before he even spoke. His eyes were so dark they almost looked black, and his mouth was just open enough with a smile that I could see his yellow teeth. Finally, he spoke after what seemed like an outrageous amount of time. 
I was surprised at the deep southern voice that came out of this little man. Wow, aren't you gorgeous? I thought I wanted fries, but maybe I'll order something else. Yeah, I know, that's weird and creepy, but working this graveyard shift at a restaurant that gets a lot of customers who are under the influence, I'm used to weird attempts at flirting. I just smiled and said very politely, Okay, sir, well, when you know what you want, just let me know now. The man grinned from ear to ear, flashing his full set of yellow and gray teeth. He slapped his hands down on the counter, and all I could see were his long, dirty fingernails. I tried not to look visibly disgusted. He spoke up again. Forget the fries. What time are you done? Usually, something like this, I would just smile and say I'm married and move on with my life. I don't know if it was because I didn't feel good, or maybe because this guy gave me the creeps from the start. Instead, in an annoyed and aggressive voice, I responded with, If you don't want to order any food, you can leave right now. The man just started to laugh, as if I just told him a real great joke. Before I said or did something I would come to regret, I turned around and started knocking on the office door. When my co-worker opened the door, he could tell I was visibly shaken. I told him about this creepy guy, who was clearly in sight. He smirked because he knew right away what I was dealing with. He told me to go take a break and that he would take care of this guy. Without even thinking or looking back, I grabbed my coat and went outside and sat in my husband's truck for 15 minutes. I just listened to some music. I'd almost forgotten about that creep, up until right before I went back inside. I noticed him wandering on the far side of the parking lot with a to-go bag in his hands. I was relieved my co-worker was able to get rid of him peacefully. I decided to wait in the truck for another five minutes just in case. I didn't want this creep to know which vehicle was mine. When I finally went back inside, my co-worker looked more than a little bit freaked out. I asked him about his interaction with that freak, and his answer freaked me out even more. He said in a tentative voice, I don't know if I should tell you. I started to jokingly hit his arm, and I told him to tell me what happened, to which he complied. He said the guy was absolutely crazy. When I came out to take his order, he just kept asking where the girl was, so I told him you went home for the night. He started losing his mind, screaming and swearing. I ended up just giving him a free medium fries just to shut him up and get him out of here. Then he turned around as he was walking out and said, Tell Monica I said goodbye, and I'll see her soon. This little story almost made me faint, mainly because I don't even wear a name tag at this job. I have no earthly idea how this man could possibly know my name. For the remainder of the shift, I couldn't focus. I just kept looking over at the door, expecting this man to stumble back in. But thankfully, he never did. Close to 4.30 in the morning, I asked if I could leave early. He knew I wasn't feeling well, especially with that creepy guy in mind. He knew I needed to get away, just to make my night a little bit enjoyable. As I was leaving, it started to snow. It was the first truly hard snowfall of the season, even though fall had basically just started. I was thankful to have my husband's truck once again. I figured if I took it slow, I'd be safe. I couldn't have been more wrong. Only about a half mile from work, I ended up sliding into a ditch because I couldn't see the road from all the snow falling. It was alright. It didn't seem like too much damage was done. But of course, I couldn't get myself out of the ditch by myself. I called the police, and surprisingly, the cops were there in only a minute. I got out of the truck to greet the cops, and that's when it happened. From the bed of the truck, the man from the restaurant jumped out and started to run full speed into the night. I screamed and was at a loss for words. The cops didn't know what to do and started to yell at me to tell them what was going on. I told him and he radioed some other cops, but they never caught the man. We eventually went back to the restaurant. I gave the police my entire story. They looked at the cameras, but it wasn't enough to ever actually catch the guy. The worst part was watching the video of the man climbing into the bed of my truck to hide. It was no more than 10 minutes after my break had ended. He'd come storming back into the parking lot with his food bag still in his hands. He looked around for a few minutes, tried all the doors, and when he realized it was locked, he jumped into the back. 
I'm so lucky I drove into a ditch that night, because if I hadn't, who knows what would have happened to me. The bag was left in the back of the truck with the fries still inside. This guy never even wanted the food. He knew my name from the start. He knew when I worked. And he knew my exact vehicle I would have. This happened several years ago, and I'm still not quite ready to work overnights again. Always lock your doors, and please be careful. Some people really are monsters. I'm a detective, but not like the ones you'd see on TV and in the movies. I'm more of a private detective. By that, I mean I don't get involved in any murder cases or anything like that. Most people hire me for family affairs. I get a lot of work from investigating cheating accusations or locating missing or stolen pets. I'm sometimes asked to gather evidence of bullying at schools as well. I had a call one afternoon last summer, and I've told some of my friends about this experience. They've encouraged me to share it. It's the strangest and frankly most disturbing case I've ever handled. So I got a call from a client who was a woman in her 30s. She made arrangements to meet me in person to speak to me about her request. I was taken aback by her beauty when I first laid eyes on her. She was a very, very talkative woman. It was as if her tongue was afraid of the dark or something. She was very warm and open, and she had come to ask me to find out if her husband was having an affair. I thought to myself, now who the hell would want to cheat on this woman? She had grown suspicious of her husband, though. He had started coming home later and later from work. She guessed he was meeting up with someone, based on how shifty he had been acting. Whenever she asked him where he had been, he'd just brush her off. She thought he had been cheating on her for about a month or so. I took the job and told her I would trail him when he finished work. I got to his work address and waited in my car until I saw him leave. I was honestly hoping this guy was just trying to put in a few extra hours for his wife and potentially their future. You never want to see anyone actually cheating. But, as in most cases in my line of work, I was wrong. The husband left work at about 6 p.m. His wife told me he had been coming home no earlier than 10, though. So clearly, he was up to something during those four extra hours, and I was going to find out what that something was. He got into his car, and I tailed him. We drove for quite a while. We left the city area and headed out into the suburbs. I thought to myself he might have met a woman in the city who lived on the outskirts, and to avoid their affair being discovered, he'd meet her out here and never in the city. My theory immediately went out the window, though, when we drove right through the suburbs as well and out into the countryside. Now, this wasn't what I was expecting at all. I was quite surprised at this point. There wasn't really anything out there where we were heading. Nothing but a few houses and a couple of abandoned buildings. He led me to the most unexpected place, an abandoned love hotel. He parked up and I turned off my car as to not raise his suspicions. I planned on looping back around to covertly see what he was getting up to. While doing this, I did a search on this abandoned love hotel. Apparently, it went under due to poor management quite a long time ago. I found online that it had closed more than 10 years ago, so what the hell was he doing out there if the hotel was no longer open? If it was still operating, that would be fine. I guess love hotels are kind of self-explanatory. You know, you rent a room for a certain period of time and you get intimate in that room. It's a pretty straightforward thing. A lot of love hotels are so out there and unusual, though. They offer all kinds of fulfillments of fantasies. If you want to do it in a themed room, like a medieval Game of Thrones kind of scenario, there's definitely a hotel for that. This particular one was catered to all kinds of fantasies. I could just tell by some of the reviews that it really seemed as if nothing was off the table. That said, this place was abandoned, so what exactly was he doing here? I had to pull in and see for myself. I still had a job to do no matter how strange this was. I had to observe and report what was going on. 
I quietly headed into the abandoned hotel and cautiously walked into the lobby, trying my best to avoid all the debris on the floor. It didn't take long for me to locate which room he was in. I heard strange noises coming from upstairs. A male voice was murmuring, so I followed the sound of those murmurs and I arrived at the room. I could see and hear what was going on through a gap in the door. The man had left it slightly ajar. I peeked inside, and what I saw rendered me speechless. Oh, look at you. You're so beautiful and lovely, and quiet, nice and quiet. The husband was speaking to a naked woman, who was lying on the dusty bedspread. The husband began to take off his suit jacket and started loosening his tie. I was almost certain about what was to come next, and I couldn't bear watching that. I was very confused and conflicted. I had to report this to my client, and I knew it was going to be very difficult and likely distressing for the wife. Her reaction and her feelings towards what happened will remain confidential. All I'll say is that my predictions were correct. It was incredibly distressing. I don't know anything about how he explained himself or what motive was behind him doing that. I've thought about it a lot. When I told one of my friends this story, well, she's into creepy online stuff, so you can thank her for me sharing this with you. This happened when I was a student. I had a part-time job in a restaurant. The restaurant closed each night at 3 a.m., I was living in a student city, and by that I mean there was no shortage of students looking for part-time work. I guess you could say I was lucky to have a job at all. One thing about living in such a city is that when it's Oban, everyone heads home. I'm not sure if you're familiar with Oban, so let me explain it quickly. Oban is an annual Buddhist event for commemorating one's ancestors. It's believed that each year during Oban, the ancestors' spirits return to this world in order to visit their relatives. It's mainly observed from August 13th to 16th. The Oban week in mid-August is one of Japan's three major holiday seasons. Pretty much all of the student workers were eager to either head home and see their families or simply have some time off for the Oban holidays. I was happy to keep working, though. I needed that money. The working rotation would go like this. One full-time worker and two part-time workers would work most of the night shifts at the restaurant, and that was the same during Oban. The restaurant was in the middle of a row of houses. It was renovated property. That means the houses were detached and not next to the restaurant. That would have been pretty annoying for the residents if that was the case. The second floor of the restaurant wasn't used for customers. It was used as a storage room where we kept equipment and supplies. There were some odd things up there. I don't know if this stuff belonged to the owner of the store, but there were family photos and a Buddhist altar as well. I never liked going up there at night. When I was sent to get supplies, it really creeped me out. The following incident happened on the 13th of August last year. It was the night before Oban officially began, just into the early hours of the actual day. I'll never forget it. It had been a busy night. I was just about to finish my shift. I left the building to turn off the outdoor lighting in front of the restaurant. There was a motion sensor light above the door, so when a customer walked through, it made a ping-pong sound that alerted us workers. When I came back inside, I started to clean the floor in the kitchen, hoping we were done for the night. The other employees were back there in the kitchen with me, and they were cleaning down too. I heard the door sensor go off. I wondered if a customer had just walked through those doors, even though we were about to close. I called out a welcome as a kind of knee-jerk reaction. It was what we had to do every time a customer came through those doors. I went to look and see who was coming through. I was surprised to see that there was no one there. All the lights at the front of the store were off, and it was 3 a.m. now. We didn't usually have customers at that time of night. It was odd. The full-time employee came out from the back, and I looked over to him. He said, Customer? I walked back towards him in the kitchen and said, No. Actually, I could tell he was thinking the same thoughts I was, and why had we just heard the entrance chime? 
We looked at one another in silence for a few moments. Then we heard a loud noise coming from the back of the store. It sounded as if something very heavy had just dropped or slammed. Naturally, the last couple of events had creeped us out a bit. Someone was out there, messing with us. We went to look out back, but we didn't see anything out there either. There was no one at all. I guessed it might have been a stray cat knocking something off a high place outside. It had happened before, but this was Oban, and my head slowly started to fill itself with legends and ghost stories, the kind of stuff I had heard from a young age. The dead spirits returning. The logical part of my brain told me it was nothing but a coincidence, and I needed to hurry up and finish my shift. I was thinking a lot of things I can't really remember. It's been a year since this happened. We got fully cleaned down and got everything we needed to do done. Last year, I hadn't worked around this time because I went home to see my family. One of the part-time employees told me something like this happened the year before, too. I wondered if he was trying to purposely scare me or prank me. As we were chatting, I felt as if they were just about to tell me last year what happened, but they were interrupted by the sound of the sensor under the door ping-ponging again. This couldn't be real. This time I didn't say a welcome, I just looked over at the dark entrance. Once again, there was no one there. It was starting to get scary at this point. It was as if something was there, but we just couldn't see it. It almost made me feel like something was watching me, right out of the darkness outside. I didn't think my colleagues were pranking me anymore. I just wanted to leave and go home. Thankfully, I did, without any further spooky happenings going on. I worked the night shift a few times after that, and nothing similar ever happened again. Well, the sensor at the entrance did malfunction a couple of times, but I feel like what happened on Oban was a bit different. I guess it probably doesn't sound as creepy as it was, but in those moments in the dark, with something close by that we couldn't see, I was absolutely terrified. The story I'm going to share took place a little over 11 years ago. At the time, I was a nurse at one of our local hospitals and working primarily in the cardiology floor. I was a relatively new employee at this facility, so I was taking pretty much any shift I could get. A lot of my shifts were overnight shifts, or shifts that started in the late afternoon and went through the middle of the night because of this. At the time, I didn't really mind, but looking back on it now, I have no idea how I wasn't in bed by 10pm every night like I am nowadays. There are probably a thousand experiences I've had throughout my career that would make for an interesting story, but there's one that sticks out more than any of the others and still bothers me to this day. On the cardiac floors, we allowed different visitation rules than some of our other floors, Due to the sometimes unexpected and catastrophic nature of the illnesses, it wouldn't be uncommon to have visitors get approved to stay a majority of the day or night. If a spouse had just experienced a heart attack, it was natural to have someone stay the entire night, even if they had been stabilized and moved to another floor. There was one particular patient who had their spouse with them for two or three days as they recovered and worked to get discharged and released home. They were both very nice people, especially my patient, who still remains one of the sweetest people I'd ever met. Her husband, who was nice enough even from the beginning, seemed to have something a little bit off. I remember the wide smile he would have when talking to me or my co-workers. At first, it seemed kind and inviting, but after holding a few minutes of conversation, it got kind of uncomfortable. Anyway, the first occurrence happened on the second night of the stay. I was working an overnight shift, and it was later in the evening. I was at the nurse's station when I saw the light flashing outside the patient's room. That alerted me that they had used the call button to request something. I made my way to the room and went in to check and see what was going on. When I got there, all the lights were off, but the TV was still on. The patient looked to be deep asleep. I was kind of confused. Maybe the patient had accidentally hit it in their sleep. Then I heard someone whisper, Smells good, right into my ear. I jumped and kind of shrieked. 
I saw it was the patient's husband. He said, oh, it was just me playing a little joke and hiding in the bathroom. He stammered on further. Yeah, sorry, your hair smells really good. I just kind of stood there in silence for a second and replied, uh, please let me know if there's anything else then. If either of you need anything, just use the call button. If you guys actually need assistance though, not for any random thing. I left the room and went back to the nurse's station, which sat directly across from the bank of elevators. The location was very annoying, because the old elevators made a loud noise when they went up or down. A few hours had passed, and the elevator was making its oh-so-lovely sounds again. It dinged open to the doors on our floor. I looked around the desk, but no one was there. The doors closed, and the elevator went right back down. That was weird. Well, this happened five more times in a row. I decided finally to see who was messing around and calling or sending the elevator back and forth. I got into the elevator and went down to the second floor where the doors opened again. There was no one there. Being annoyed, tired, and confused at this point, I went back up to my floor to head back to my desk. When it got back up, the elevator had thankfully stopped its constant noise and movement. However, when I reached for my cup of water, I noticed a folded up piece of paper. I thought maybe it was something I had left there. Maybe something I wrote down that I didn't want to forget to do or something. When I unfolded it though, it said, For my favorite nurse. It was a small drawing of a rose or something. I set it down and looked around to see if anyone was there. I didn't see anyone outside of another nurse though who was all the way at the other end of the hallway, coming out of a different room. Thankfully, I was able to keep myself busy for the rest of the night, and it was almost time for me to hand off my patience to the next shift. As I was finishing some paperwork, I felt a feeling like someone was behind me, or I was being watched very closely. I sat up in my chair and kind of looked around. I saw a head barely poking out of the doorway of a patient's room. Yeah, it was the smells good person from earlier in the night. As soon as he saw my gaze going that way, he popped his head back inside the doorway. I angled my chair so I could see that room, but it still looked like my head was facing my computer. Every so often, I would see a head pop out of the doorway, then dart back into the room. I tried to ignore it as best I could so I could finish my shift and go home and get some much needed sleep. I did just that and returned to work the next day to find that patient from that room had indeed been discharged. I was getting my new assignments when one of my colleagues said, I heard you made a new friend last night. I asked what they meant. She said, one of your patients got discharged today. One of their family members were looking for you and asking for you, wanted to see if you were here. We told them you were gone and we didn't know when your next shift was. When we told them you weren't here, his face went from a smile to a frown and he just walked away. We figured he made a good impression or something. I just smiled at my co-worker and went back to reviewing some charts. I will say that things always seem a little more unnerving on the night shift. I've always wondered if that's our subconscious at work or if weird things really do occur more at night. This is the first time I'm trying to share this story, other than with the police the night of the incident. I guess you could technically argue I have no real reason to be as freaked out as I am, since nothing really happened to me, but mentally I'm still scarred. The terror I felt in that moment is something that still shakes me to my very core. I used to work for a service that would go to various businesses and clean, mop, and wax the floors. As you may expect, this type of work may be tough when there are workers or customers walking around. Because of that, the company works in the middle of the night so as to not disturb any of the businesses. I personally only work for this company once a week for some extra money. I was saving for a house with my soon-to-be wife. The business was great, but getting help was not. It got to a point where the owner would send all of us to different business locations to basically work alone. That was unless it was a big business or a hospital or something that you couldn't reasonably be expected to do by yourself. 
This specific night, I was alone, which I really didn't mind all that much. I put my headphones in and got to work on the floors. It was really mindless work, which was great for me because that made it easy money. The town where I lived, there's a small grocery store that's popular amongst the locals. This store is one of our clients. I would usually tackle this entire store by myself about once a month or so. The night started just like every other night. I started with my sweep and then got ready to mop the floors with the machinery. Every so often when doing the floors, you have to go back and empty the machine which is filled with water. While I was draining the hose, I thought I saw something out of the corner of my eye moving around on the sales floor. I knew nobody was supposed to be in the store right now, so I figured my mind must just be playing tricks on me. Maybe my boss had showed up or something. Neither of those were that unlikely. I paused my music and took my headphones out for a minute. I set my phone and headphones on the counter next to where I was disposing of the water. I slowly walked back out there and walked around for a minute to see if I could see anything. I walked to the front end of the store and just as I was getting ready to head back to the floor machine, I heard voices. I froze in place for a moment, trying to process what was going on here. Then, seconds later, I realized that these were not voices I was supposed to be hearing. Without thinking, I jumped into one of those little cashier's nooks and stayed hidden. There were at least two men that I could hear. They were arguing about something, just bickering back and forth. One of the voices sounded like an older, perhaps middle-aged man. The other voice I heard was definitely that of a younger man, maybe in his twenties or so. I stayed in that cashier's nook, laying in a fetal position, just hoping that whatever was happening was not that serious. The men sounded like they were standing nearby to the cash register I was hiding behind. The older man said to the younger man, Okay, you got the information? Let's get it and get out of here. I heard them walking away, and that's when I grabbed my first glimpse of the intruders. I was able to confirm it was indeed just two men. One of them was freakishly large, and the other man was what you probably may consider to be average size. They were at the customer desk, trying to open what I assumed was a safe or small vault of some kind. At least from where I was, it looked like a safe of some sort. The younger guy was trying to crack it open, while the older guy was harassing him, saying things like, Hurry up or I'll knock you out! Even crazier and equally disturbing threats... That's when I noticed the most scary thing. Both these men had loaded weapons, like real actual guns. They both had several weapons in their waistband, in fact. I didn't dare test these men to see if they knew how to use them. My first instinct was to call the police, but my phone was still in the back with the floor machine. I decided the best and most efficient course of action was to stay hidden. If I hid, hopefully this horrifying event would be over soon. I didn't have my phone or watch, so I didn't know how long I was hiding there. It felt like I had to have been there for more than 10 minutes. That's when I heard the bigger guy yell out, You idiot! I heard both men running out of the building. I slowly peeked over the ledge and didn't see anybody. I stayed hidden for a few minutes until I was sure I was alone. I finally got up and ran towards the back, where I'd left my phone. I immediately called the authorities and my boss. Before I knew it, a middle-aged man was standing in the doorway with a police officer. A brief mix-up ensued as the middle-aged man assumed I was the one trying to rob the store. This middle-aged man was the owner, who got a call from the security company who monitors it. Somehow, the intruders had tripped the alarm when leaving, but not when entering. When the police and owners showed up, I guess I looked pretty guilty. Thankfully, it only took a few moments to clear my name, and I was able to give my side of the story. As far as I know, they never caught those guys. At least, I've never heard so from my boss, or anybody else that the robbers were caught. If I google the incident, it doesn't even really come up, leading me to believe that the investigation just kind of ended or never really got solved. This was a horrible night for me. I assume those men had some familiarity with the store, since they knew exactly what they were doing. 
If you ever find yourself in a situation like this, sometimes the best thing to do is just stay quiet and stay hidden. Your life is way more important than being a hero. This happened pretty recently, and because of it, I'll be quitting my job at the end of this month. My current job is to deliver papers to homes in the mountains, basically in the middle of nowhere. It's pretty tough because I start work at midnight in order to get all of my deliveries done, and it doesn't exactly pay well either. Still though, it's good to be having any work, especially when you're young. You have your own money, and it's nice. Right. Anyway, like I said, I start at midnight, and I don't finish until the sun starts coming up. Sometimes, in the darker months, the sun doesn't come up at all. Being out in the mountains alone at night can be pretty spooky, as I'm sure you might imagine. I want to share this recent scary experience with you. This happened in winter. I had gotten used to the rhythm of deliveries by that point. It was around winter that the newspaper company I worked for was trying to expand their business. This would mean there would be more work for me. I was excited to earn a bit more money, but over time it became more and more time-consuming. Basically, a subscription would come in and then it would be down to me to deliver it to the customer. So, I'm usually riding my bike around with a big map because signal is a no-go in the mountains. I don't mean a pushback, by the way. I mean a really low-quality motorbike, low CCs. The people who buy these subscriptions have the amazing ability to be unfindable somehow. It was never a straightforward task to find their homes. I had one of those subscription jobs on that winter night. I knew the address, and I knew it wasn't going to be easy. There were a few roads through forest areas, and even worse was the fact that some of the roads were very narrow. I could barely even fit my bike along them. I set off and rode my bike right up to the point where the narrow roads began. Since it was winter, I figured it would be safer to just park my bike and deliver the subscription on foot. There was a footpath, after all. There was a post box at the end of the customer's driveway. It was a short distance away from the house. I started down the sloped road towards the post box, and then I froze in my tracks. I could hear the sound of a dog barking. No, not just one dog. It sounded like there were at least two. I thought not much of it, and approached the post box with the subscription in hand. It was still pretty much pitch black out, despite it being early morning. As I approached, I noticed the light go on at the front door. There was an old lady stood outside on the porch. Seeing her gave me a real fright. I thought to myself, wow, someone's super eager for the morning paper. I figured that since she was out, I could literally just put the subscription in her hand. So I approached her. I stopped when she started yelling at me. It's right here. I'm delivering the newspaper and your subscription. The boss made us wear a uniform and we had to wear an ID card around our neck as well. Some customers, especially ones like this who live in remote areas, can be real skeptical of people they don't know. You know, stranger danger and all that. I raised my ID badge, as I assumed she could see me pretty well. You expect me to believe that's proof? She screamed at me. I could see the dogs now, especially the whites of their teeth, as they bared them at me and snarled. The old woman then pulled out a pair of long gardening shears from behind her back, and pointed them at me. I instinctively backed away. I just tried to remain as calm as possible. I was wondering if this woman was suffering some kind of disease, maybe something like dementia. If she came at me with those long scissors, I planned on kicking her in the abdomen. I practiced full contact karate. However, she was an old lady, and I didn't know if that would really hurt her badly. I hoped it really wouldn't come to that. I just told her, well, okay then, I'll just leave this here and be on my way. With that, I turned to leave. I didn't get paid enough to deal with this bullshit. I upped my pace. The old lady was still shouting at me from behind. It sounded as if she was getting really riled up. The dogs were really barking at me now. I turned around to look over my shoulder, and I saw her let go of their leashes. 
She was walking towards me, slashing at the air with her scissors. She wasn't making any sense at all. I couldn't make out a single word she was shouting at me. It was time to run now. I raced up the hill as I heard the dogs chasing behind me. I couldn't believe it. She'd literally released the hounds on me. I ran up the hill as fast as I could. I needed to get back to my motorbike. I got back on my bike, kicked out the stand, and hopped on. I started the engine and had a quick look behind me. I saw the tips of the dogs' heads coming up the slope. I pulled away without looking back again. It was really scary to be honest. I think myself incredibly lucky to get out of there without any injuries at all. I mean, it would be a much different story if I had a push bike. Those dogs wanting to bite me. I could tell the old woman looked as if she would have joined in too. I imagined her plunging those large gardening scissors into my gut. I shudder at the thought now. After I delivered the rest of my newspapers and subscriptions, I spoke with my boss and told him about my close call. He decided he would make contact with the customer and see what was going on. I could already imagine him taking the side of the customer immediately. That was just the kind of guy he was. When he checked, however, he found the customer's phone number was no longer in use. He decided to go out there himself and speak to the customer in person. I told him to watch out for the dogs. He said he would let me know how it went when I came back to work the next time. I spoke to him the next day, and he told me he did go out there to meet the customer. He found nothing but an abandoned house, though. He then made contact with the subscription company to find out why someone would want to send a subscription to an empty home. It was at this point we learned the subscription company had fudged the numbers to make our company take their business. They wanted it to look like they had more customers than they actually did. That meant they gave out a couple of random addresses for abandoned homes. That's stupid. So who the hell was that woman with the dogs then? I have no idea. When I think back to how hate-filled her face was, it just gives me the shivers, hence my resignation from the newspaper company. Anyway, I'm still working till the end of the month, so I hope I don't get sent anywhere near the scissor woman's house. I only have a couple of days left of work. I'm sure it will be fine. Back when I was a student at college, I used to work part-time. I picked up a night shift at a local bar, and I really enjoyed working there. On the night that this took place, an older gentleman was already drinking in the bar when I came in to start my night shift. As soon as he saw me stood behind the counter, he got up from his seat and came over to the bar with a smile on his face. When he approached the bar, he struck up a conversation with me. I knew this guy quite well. He was a regular and very quiet. He was usually very nice. We had spoken a few times before and he was alright in my books. Now, I have to say that the content from here on in is somewhat incoherent. If you don't understand what this guy said, then you'll be feeling the exact same as I did at the time. The old man approached me and randomly said the following, From now on, it's China's time. You'll see to whatever's left, won't you? He reached out his hands, both of them, and I in return offered my hands out to him as we joined hands in a sort of strange double handshake. He was smiling so hard it was hard to refuse. To be honest, I don't really like hand touching. I don't know why, it just kind of makes me feel all clammy. I let him know because he seemed to be really enjoying himself. My manager would always say, if they go home smiling, then you've done a really good job. The old man had a big old smile on his face. It looked like he'd probably bought more than a couple of drinks, so for the sake of my job, I endured this. I smiled along and thought to myself, Oh great, this guy's so drunk. I glanced over at the table he had come from and noticed something. He had a beer there and some kind of side snack dish. That wasn't unusual to be honest. What was slightly unusual was the fact that neither of them looked touched or opened. I guess that he wasn't hungry. To be honest, I couldn't really care less as long as he was buying. I was just starting my shift anyway. Shortly after we spoke, the old man headed out the door, and I thought nothing more of it. 
In the early hours of the morning, my manager at the bar received a call. It was the police calling. Apparently, they had found a body. They had multiple questions. The old man had been found dead. He was lying in a street near an intersection, just a small ways away from our bar. Apparently, he was found quite quickly and taken to the hospital. Unfortunately, there wasn't much they could do for him. He was pronounced dead immediately. His death was apparently somewhat suspicious, and that's why my manager was being contacted. It was evident the man had been struck on the head by something or someone. The old man had receipts in his wallet from our bar. Naturally, the police thought our place would be a good starting point to make their inquiry. The officer asked the manager if he had noticed anything strange about the old man's demeanor, or if he acted differently at all. The manager answered no. I guess he wasn't paying the old man much attention, or didn't speak to him all that much that night. It transpired that the old man had suffered a head injury before he came to the bar. He then interacted with everyone and collapsed soon after he left. That's why he'd been behaving so strangely. I wondered to myself, so when the old man said, you'll see whatever's left, won't you? Did that mean something? The way he smiled will always stay with me. Did he know? Did he know he was going to die? Maybe he knew he had a head injury and was trying to get help in the only way he could. Or maybe he knew there wasn't much time left for him. Maybe he wanted to go to a place that made him happy. Maybe I'm reading too much into this, but those words he said will always stay with me. We were able to notify his next of kin. It's a really good thing we were asked, because he was sort of an enigma in town. Apparently, not that many people knew him. Hopefully, I succeeded with his request in that respect. We toasted his memory on the following night shift, and that was that. This is my sister's friend's story. I found it pretty creepy, so I figured you guys would too. My sister works as a nurse. When she was a student, she was sent to various hospitals to work with other nurses. This was the same for all her other student friends. My sister heard this story when she met up with one of her close friends. She said that even though they were sat in a warm coffee shop when she heard this, she still had chills race up her spine. So, the hospital that my sister's close friend worked at was in a rural location. It wasn't your typical busy hospital. It didn't have that many patients. She was working the night shift on the night this took place, doing her rounds and checking on the patients as usual. There were only a few patients in her ward. They say those long, dark hospital hallways can be quite eerie in the dead of night. My sister and her friend tell me you get used to that kind of thing after a while, though. I don't know if I ever could. I'm a bit of a scaredy cat. After doing her rounds, she headed back to the nurse's station to see how her colleagues on the night shift were hanging. She was there updating some of her paperwork and chatting. When she heard an alert, when a nurse call button is pressed, it sends an alert to the nurse's station. A patient needed some attention. There was one problem, though. The room in which the nurse call had come from was apparently a vacant room that had been empty ever since the patient had passed away in it last week. Is this a prank? One of her colleagues asked. Well, someone pressed the call button, so I guess I better go check it, she replied. She was a little bit scared, of course, but since she was a student nurse, she thought she would show some initiative rather than just be told to do it. She was the youngest and got bossed around the most, so off she went to investigate this call from the empty room. Her heart was pounding in her chest as she walked down that hallway. She had always been terrified by the thought of the paranormal. She went down to the corner room in which the call had come from. She opened the door and stepped inside that dark, unused hospital room. There was no one in there. It was just an empty room as far as she could see. Maybe it was just a malfunction. A ghost in the machine, so to say. It was hard to say what it was. She guessed it could have been a prank, too. Maybe some bored patient started scampering around the ward, then quickly ran back to bed. Maybe the button was broken. It could have been a large number of things. 
she turned to leave the room and put her hand against the door to push it open, only it wouldn't budge. It was now locked. How on earth? She began to panic. She started beating her hands against that door with all her strength. Her logical thoughts had gone out the window. Now she was thinking of the paranormal. She knew the call could only come when a button was directly pressed. Something called her into that hospital room, and now that same something didn't want her to leave. One of her colleagues came rushing over to the room she was trapped in and opened it from the outside. My sister's friend was an absolute mess. She was completely petrified. She said she didn't feel alone in that room, like something was hiding in the shadows with her. Hospitals can be pretty scary places when you think about all that goes on in there. I mean, there must be some residual energy trapped in some of the rooms. She requested a transfer to a different hospital after that frightening experience. I wonder what it must have felt like to be trapped in that dark room and unable to get out. 